Does everyone come on to our seats? Madam Clerk, if you could please call the roll. Mr. Starr? Here. Mr. Gutierrez? Here. Ms. Gray Jackson? Honored to be here. Mr. Birch? Okay. Here. Mr. Clayman? Here. Dr. Selkraig? Here. Ms. Drummond? Here. Ms. Osiander? Here. Mr. Flynn? Present. Ms. Johnston? Here. Mr. Coffey? Yes, here. Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. Thank you, and uh, Ms. Drummond, if you could lead us in the pledge. All right, first thing on our agenda is approval of previous minutes. We have before us the minutes of April 29. And uh, I'm going to try something new this time with our computer system. Those that are moving, click in, and I will announce who got first and who got second. Uh, is there a motion to approve these minutes? Mr. Coffey has moved. Ms. Johnston has seconded. Any any corrections or modifications to the April 29 minutes. Any opposition to approval of these minutes? Hearing none, those minutes are approved. Next, we have the mayor's report. Uh, and I see Mr. Abbott is just stepping out. Mr. The mayor is not here. We'll take that up in a little bit. Or do uh, yes, no mayor's report at this time. Thanks. Okay, well, when he arrives, we'll be happy to take it up. Uh, chair's report, uh, I would note briefly on the dinner hour, I, I have received some positive response from the public that they like the later dinner hour, so we're going to stay with it. But if we get done with some of our stuff, we don't have to wait till 8 to eat. The only other thing on the chair's report, I, I know that everyone in the community who goes to the gas pump is aware of the, the increasing price of gas. Gas is a big component of our city budget. Uh, people ask, is it going to impact our budget? I always say, I hope not, but I'm not optimistic. The, in, in December of uh, 2007, we passed a, wait, is this the right one? Yes, a, a resolution regarding budget process. And I have asked the chair of the budget committee to to take this particular resolution, it's AR 2007-283S. I've asked her to review that with the committee, uh, review it also with the Budget Advisory Commission, and bring back a resolution for for this body to consider, hopefully in July or August at the latest, so that we can have a resolution that gives some direction to the administration when we discuss budget issues in the fall. So uh, I think I've spoken with Ms. Gray Jackson, and that's. That process will be going forward, but if you have comments about that, members of the body, you should certainly refer that to any member of the Budget, uh, budget and uh, Finance Committee, which I believe are Gray Jackson, Johnston, and Clayman. That's all I have for the Chair's report. Committee reports will start with Mr. Coffey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to note the passing of two longtime Alaskans, um, Elodine Hayes Bittner. Uh, Judy Bittner, Kathy Bittner, and uh, Bill Bittner's mother passed away within the last few hours. And uh, last night, uh, LaRue Hellenthal, Mark Hellenthal's mother, likewise passed away. And they were both ladies of accomplishment and distinction and certainly longevity in Alaska. And I mean of, in the order of magnitude of 50 and 60 years. Uh, so I just wanted to note that for the record, Mr. Chairman. And I have spoke with both Mark and Bill. and. 
uh, my condolences, and I'm sure we would all forward them on to them both when we have the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Johnston. As far as the, um, the work that's been done as far as the recycling ordinance that will be coming up, and um, I hope that we have a successful evening. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Chairman, I'd echo the comments of the previous two speakers. Uh, the Legislative Committee met last week. Uh, under consideration were some methods, or sorry, the week before last, to discuss some methods for uh, energy conservation in our community vis-a-vis -vis the upcoming special session on energy for the, for the legislature. Uh, we, it resulted in the resolution we have before you and the consent agenda tonight. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Osiander. The Title 21 Committee will um, meet this Thursday from 9.30 to 11.30 in the Planning Department Conference Room off Elmore Road. We're continuing work on Chapter 5. Uh, the committee would also like to express a, a real thank you to the administration for the very successful public meeting that was held this past week at the museum. Uh, it was a synopsis for the community on the Title 21 and has a, a way to make complex uh, ideas readily transparent. So thank you to all the folks who worked on that. Ms. Drummond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I was present at that public meeting for Title 21, and uh, I was very pleased at the turnout and the good questions that were asked, and I hope those folks will continue to come forward and testify to us when we bring up these chapters for approval. I'm also happy to see the resolution on the energy issues, and uh, I will ask to be added as a co-sponsor. Dr. Selkraig. Actually, this is actually the purpose of this is not is is for everybody that's on committees to report about your committees. It's not. It's, this is not general assembly comment. This is actually committee reports. And you're next. I, I just wanted to make sure she was had completed. Um, I'm just reporting in on the Community and Economic Development Committee. Uh, we have met once, and um, we're beginning to look at three key areas: um, energy, economic development, and housing and neighborhood. And um, Joe Griffith and Tom uh, and um, Tom is no, um, I'm forgetting is the first name. Um, w Tony Izzo, I'm sorry. Tony Izzo will be chairing the Energy Committee. Um, Bill Pop will be chairing the Economic Development Committee, and Carol Gora will be chairing the Housing Committee. And the intention of the of the Community and Economic Development Committee is not to go out and generate a whole lot of new information, but to really tap into those groups in the community. There's a lot of active groups working in a variety of areas who have come up with recommendations, and what we hope to do is find those recommendations in key areas that have to do with community and economic development and areas that there's already a general consensus in the community about and bring them forward for discussion um, at the assembly level and potentially developing some policy and action items around them. Um, we'll be meeting the third Wednesday of every week from 12.30 to 2, and it'll be publicly noticed so the public will be invited. And I'd like to invite any assembly members who'd like to attend to please show up. I'd love to have you be involved. Thank you. Mr. Birch, committee reports. Mr. Gray Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You've taken care of my committee report. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Mr. Gutierrez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Very briefly, the Public Safety Committee will be meeting tomorrow from noon to 1, <clears throat> excuse me, room 240 in City Hall. We will be having a presentation from the Anchorage Police Department's Cyber Crimes Unit uh, about crimes against children and cyber bullying, and also from the Anchorage School District. We will have a presentation on their policy towards cyberbullying. That's 12 to 1, room 240 in City Hall. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Starr? Uh, nothing from the Audit Committee. Thank you. Uh, next is the addendum to the agenda. Second. Any? Oh, actually, punch in, please. Been moved by Ms. Osiander, seconded by Ms. Selkraig, and we need a third. Ms. Drummond is third. Okay, uh, any opposition to incorporating the addendum? Hearing none, I also note that there's a late on the table item that was submitted by the Office of Management and Budget. Any other late on the table items? All right. 
Mr. Chairman, there is an S version for the recycling ordinance that was laid on the table. Right. I don't think it needs to be introduced no, because we. I to announce that. Right. All right. The addendum to the agenda number 9B6, resolution number AR 2008 127, a resolution of the municipality of Anchorage appropriating. $60,210 from within the Girdwood Fire Apparatus Capital Improvement Fund 406 for the purchase of new fire apparatus Anchorage Fire Department accompanied by Assembly Memorandum AM 394-2008. Move to include. Number 9C1, Assembly Memorandum AM 395-2008, recommendation of award to Securitas Security Services USA Incorporated to provide security guard services at various municipal facilities for the municipality of Anchorage Maintenance and Operations Department, ITB 28-B025, $1,402,325.44 from purchasing. Item 9C2, Assembly Memorandum AM 396-2008, Recommendation of Award to Hamilton Construction LLC for the Chester Creek Aquatic Ecosystem Restoration for the Municipality of Anchorage Project Manage Management and Engineering Department, ITB 28-C021, $5,849,267.08 from purchasing. Item 9C3, Assembly Memorandum 397-2008, Recommendation of Award to Roger Hickel Contracting Incorporated for 58th Avenue Street Reconstruction, RID, Arctic Boulevard to Silverado Way for the Municipality of Anchorage Project Management and Engineering Department, ITB 28-C031, $1,236,658.80 from purchasing. Item 9C4, Assembly Memorandum 398-2008, Recommendation of Award to Construction Machinery Industrial LLC to furnish an articulating six-wheel drive dump truck and an, art and an articulating front-end wheel loader to the Municipality of Anchorage Solid Waste Services, ITB 28-B027, one million twenty-seven thousand seven hundred dollars from purchasing. Item nine, Delta twenty-five, Assembly Memorandum three ninety-nine two thousand eight, Contract Amendment number six to Vendor Contract twenty-three MLP one forty-four with Kempel Huffman and Ellis PC for providing professional legal services for the Municipality of Anchorage Municipal Light and Power one hundred thousand dollars from purchasing. Item nine, Delta twenty-six, Assembly Memorandum. 400-2008, Recommendation for Committee Community Development Block Grant Award to Covenant House, Alaska, Incorporated for the from the Municipality of Anchorage Department of Neighborhoods, 700000 purchasing. Item 9, Delta 27, Assembly Memorandum 404-2008, Change Order Number 1 to Purchase Order Number 280014, with Speak Tech for Phase Two services or e-government implementations for the Municipality of Anchorage Information Technology Department, five hundred and twenty-four thousand dollars from purchasing. Item nine, F sixteen, Assembly Memorandum four four hundred and one two thousand eight, Platting Board appointment, Kathleen Plunkett, Mayor's Office. A ten-day public comment period is required pursuant to AMC twenty-one point ten point zero one zero B. Item 9, F17, Assembly Memorandum 402-2008, Zoning Board of Examiners and Appeals Appointment, Jeff Ron, Mayor's Office. A 10-day public comment period is required pursuant to AMC 21.10.010B. And then last, laid on the table item, which is Item 9, B as in Bravo 7, a, a red AR 2008-128, a resolution of the Municipality of Anchorage accepting and appropriating 2008 State of Alaska Legislative Grants per Senate Bills 221 and 256. Any opposition to incorporating all those items? Mr. Chairman, I believe the, uh, legis uh, uh, the legislative grant uh, resolution, I believe that should be under uh, items for introduction. That will require a public hearing. All right, that, so we should renumber that as 9F something. That'll be 9F18 as in 9 Frank 18. Thank you, Mr. Abbott. And Mr. Abbott, you were out of the room when I called on the mayor's report. You want to wait for the mayor to arrive? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Drummond, I see you're in the queue. Okay, no problem. 
All right, next that brings us to There was no objection. I, there was no objection to accepting the addendum and the laid on the table items, item singular. Uh, that brings us next to the consent agenda, and we will go down to see if anyone wants to pull anything starting. Oh. Uh, start with Mr. Coffey. Any items to pull? Yes. And uh, do Judge? 9D7 for disclosure. Is that Delta? Delta 7. Okay, anything else? Anything else, Mr. Coffey? Ms. Johnston? Mr. Flynn? None, thank you. Ms. Osiander? Uh, 9 Delta 5. 9 Delta 15. Nine F eleven, just a quick question. Nine F eleven, okay. Yes, sir. And then on the addendum, um, nine C two. Anything else? No, sir. Thank you, Ms. Drummond. Nine B one, Mr. Chair. Nine Bravo or Delta? Nine Bravo. Nine B one, okay. Thank you. Anything else? Not at this time. Don't get another chance. <laughs> Dr. Selkraig. Um, 9D21. 9 Delta 21. Um, Is that Delta or Bravo? Uh, that was Delta. Thank you. And that's it. Thank you. Uh, chair is pulling 9 Delta 23. Mr. Birch. C9. Nine F thirteen for uh, purpose of disclosure. I just happen to live in that service area. Anything else? Uh, nine F fifteen. Nine Frank fifteen. Anything else? <laughs> Ms. Gray Jackson. Nothing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gutierrez. No items. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Starr. No items. All right, as, as to the items that were not pulled, uh, is there any opposition to approval of the consent agenda? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Abbott. The administration needs to poll 9D9. Delta or Bravo? Delta. 9 Delta 9. Thank you. Anything else? And I apologize for not seeing. Ms. Handyside, you were in the queue to, for that purpose? My item's already been pulled. Thank you. Anything else from the administration? Nothing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. As to the, once again, as to the consent agenda other than the pulled items, any opposition to approval of all these items? No. Hearing and seeing no objection, those items are all approved. That brings us to the first First pulled item, 9B1, Ms. Drummond, and we need a motion. Move to approve. Click in, please. Go ahead. Somebody move. Move to approve. It's been moved by Dr. Selkraig and seconded by Mr. Gutierrez. Ms. Drummond, you pulled the item. Go ahead and speak. Thank you. I'm just pulling it. Uh, I'm pleased that this has uh, appeared, and I'd like to be added as a co-sponsor. I'd like to ask the committee how they came up with $7 million for the request for the people mover expansion of the bus, uh, bus fleet. And uh, Mr. Flynn, you're acting as chair of the commission, I, or the committee. I see you're in the queue. Are you in the queue to speak or to respond to the question? Respond to the question. All right. I'll take you out of the queue, but go ahead and respond. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Drummond, the uh, number of $7 million was reached as a two-year capital request reflecting both the 2008, which was not funded by the legislature in the last session, and 2009, which is anticipated for next year uh, for the buses they need to continue and expand service. 
Is that seven? Yeah, come to your mic a little bit more because you're not coming in loudly. That was reflecting the people movers request for a capital re replacement and expansion of their bus fleet in 2008 and 9. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Yep. Is So that $7 million, uh, Mr. Chair, would that be for the first year and there will be an additional request for the second year? No, we roll the two years together. Okay. I, I attended um, a public transit board meeting a few weeks ago, and uh, they I learned there that they need $18 million to do a creditable improvement to the people mover system. So I'm curious as to how that number was uh, arrived at. I can add to that if you wish, Mr. Chairman. I, Mr. And I would note there's also others on the committee, so I'm letting Mr. Flynn respond, but if others want to respond, uh, there's a bunch of people in the queue. <laughs> So I'm going to let Mr. Flynn respond, and, and then Ms. Dr. Selkirk is not. Go, go ahead, Mr. Flynn. Sure. The, the, I believe the $18 million figure deals with a uh, increase in service for beyond what was initially contemplated with the $7 million. That would increase frequency on particular routes at particular times to 15 minutes, uh, as opposed to the current goal of 30 on their he more heavily traveled routes. I wouldn't disagree that a larger amount would be needed to dr more dramatically expand service um, we were taking a somewhat conservative approach. Okay. All right, Dr. So is that does that answer your question, Ms. Drummond? Okay, Dr. Selkraig, you're next. Um, I'd also like to be added as a co-sponsor on this. And um, I've had an opportunity to sit down with uh, Jody Carr from Transit, and I also spoke with the administration. And I know there's, I think we're, everybody on this body is aware of the impact that the increase and gasoline means to people's ability um, to move around, particularly people who are dependent on the buses and how expensive the buses are getting. And it's my understanding that the administration is going to be developing a more comprehensive approach to the issue of transit in the community. And so what I'd like to do is um, invite the administration to maybe hold a work session with us when you have that shaped. It's my understanding that you're beginning to talk about a more comprehensive approach, and I'd, I'm looking forward to hearing from you, and um, I think that this body is going to be happy to work with you to, to begin to address these new issues in light of the um, cost of gasoline. So I'm hoping we can get a scheduled work session once that information is available. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coffey. Thank you. Did I understand, Mr. Flynn, if I might, Mr. Chairman, direct it to him, that the $18 million was an operational cost? And this seven million is a capital request. Is that correct? Because it talks about fleet replacement and expansion, mm -hmm. which I understand to be capital, whereas operational, I don't see we're asking for operational funding here. No, the only operational funding request you see in there is for the trust fund that would benefit all public transit yeah. um, throughout the state, not just in Anchorage. And the 18 million, I believe, uh, refers to a more dramatic fleet expansion, and it is in fact capital in nature. Okay. And have we spoken with anyone in the legislature about this request? I communicated with the co-chairs of the legislative caucus, or the Anchorage caucus, uh, Rep representatives Furclaw and Holmes, and let them know we were working this issue and be coming their way. And their response was, "Bring it on," or that will never fly, or what? The response was that they'd be at the AGEA hearings and couldn't join us that day. Oh, great. And the movie will start Don't ask shortly. Another question. <laughs> <You're done. laughs> they're leaning against the lights, is what they're doing out there. Let's pause for just a minute while we get the lights back up. Mr. Clayman, at this point, you say, "Let there be light." Oh, there you go. There you go. You've got your power back. <laughs> All right. Does that answer the question, Mr. Coffee? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Drummond, you're in the queue. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Gray-Jackson. Thank you. Mr. Birch. I, I basically think the idea of handing out checks to everybody in the state is a bad idea, and I'm trying to understand. This is a resolution basically supporting the proposal uh, on high energy costs, and I guess I just want a clarification from the, 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 the sponsors and the, uh, of this, of this uh, resolution. Is, is this to, in lieu of, uh, handing out a billion two, we actually put something in infrastructure and something material that will actually have a fundamental difference on energy costs in the state? Thank you for the question, Mr. Birch. Yes, the, the philosophical, the, the, the committee found themselves in philosophical alignment of the state administration in that as we have increased energy costs and we are reaping additional money from 
the development of our oil resources, that we should use that money to ameliorate the effects of those increased costs, but that it would be better to do it in a way that has a permanent effect on our cost of living. Great. In that case, I will be supporting the resolution. Thank you. No one else is in the queue. I'll ask if there's any opposition to this uh, resolution. Hearing and seeing none, that is approved unanimously. Next pulled item is number nine, Delta five. Uh, what I would ask, I'll remind, rather than speaking out loud to moving the people, if they'll just click in on the computer screen, I will, I will say who's, <laughs> who got first to the queue. We're on nine Delta five. Will somebody please move. Mr. Flynn has moved. Mr. Coffey has seconded. Uh, Ms. Osiander, go ahead and speak to 9 Delta 5. This caught my eye because, as you may recall, at our last meeting, we basically decided to meet on Veterans Day, and this changes us back, and so I wanted to talk about it. Thank you, and I appreciate that. appreciate your pulling that. Um, I had raised this because I was in the clerk's office about a week after we moved it to Veterans Day and the question was raised, is this going to have overtime implications both for the administration and for the assembly's budget? And the answer I received both from the administration and to a lesser extent from the assembly budget is that there will be overtime implications. And so I raised this with Mr. Coffey who had moved for the, moved for the, to be the 11th and uh, my impression from that conversation is Mr. Coffey wasn't so sure he wanted it on the 11th anymore. So I, I brought this back so that we could reconsider whether we should be doing meeting on the 11th or the 18th. And I believe the effect of the AM is that we're actually proposing that we go back to the 18th. So I'm not sure a motion is in order because I think we're moving it back to the 18th. And so if there's a motion to put it back on the 11th, I think that would be the motion. That's how I'm reading what's been presented, although if somebody wants to dispute that, I'm happy to hear. Uh, let me check the queue. I see Ms. Osiander with her hand up, and for some reason the queue isn't showing. Uh, Mr. Coffey, you're in the queue. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I think you slightly mischaracterized yeah. my response. I said <laughs> there's no point in spending more money just to make it a little more convenient for ourselves. If we would have known, I believe, on the evening that we would be paying overtime from both budgets, I don't think we would have changed the date. I support going back to the date that was originally presented because of the costs of overtime. Thank you. Ms. Osiander. Several things. First off, I believe that we do need to move this since we've already approved the meeting on the 11th. And if we want to change that, the, they'll need to be a motion. Okay. Um, I had two concerns. S certainly there's the convenience for us of having a huge agenda after a break, but there's also an impact on the city because work can't get done and things have to be piled up so they can get through to us. So my question is, um, do we have even a rudimentary idea of what kind of costs we're talking about. Um, and secondarily, has this body ever met on a day besides Tuesday? Uh, Mr. Abbott looks ready to respond. I'll let him speak. I, I can speak to the cost issue. I, I can't speak to the traditions of the assembly beyond what we've done in the last five or six years. Um, Cost-wise, there would be additional cost for some employees' participation here on a holiday. Um, it, it depends on the issues that you work that evening, and it's a little early to predict what those would be in terms of the volume of those types of employees and uh, what costs would be associated with their attendance or participation at the meeting. So it's likely that there would be more cost on a holiday uh, assembly meeting than there would on a non-holiday assembly meeting, but I really can't quantify that until we have a sense of what the agenda looks like. Um, but it could easily be, you know, upwards of more than $1,000 in additional cost, depending on the, you know, if we had half a dozen uh, non-represented employees here for six hours. Okay. And is there a major difficulty with having an assembly meeting on a day besides Tuesday? Um, probably not. Uh, the, the clerk has reminded me that that, that, that actually is a que proper question for either the municipal attorney or assembly council, that okay. the belief is the charter may require two Tuesday meetings a month. 
whoever's appropriate could answer them? Mr. Reeves or Ms. Tucker. If you want to take a moment while we go to the next next speaker, I'm happy to do that. Uh, any other questions, Ms. Osiander? Dr. Selkraig. Um, I think that one of the things we discussed earlier this week when we were talking with the mayor about this was the potential that if we had to, in light of the fact that things were backing up, we could meet on election day for an hour and a half. We could have a short meeting on election day if, in fact, we found ourselves in a bind. The other thing I know we want to consider at this time is that we're in budget. So it becomes, these meetings become pretty valuable. So I'm just um, putting that on the table along with the idea of maybe meeting on a different day is that possibly we could go ahead, meet on the 4th, and get our business done and get out of here. I'd rather. All right. I'll, I will just make a couple of comments. No one, no one else is in the queue, and I know our attorneys are looking the question up about whether we're required to meet on Tuesdays. The, the challenge for November is that we're already meeting on the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, and so there is, I would say, certainty that that meeting will be a relatively short meeting. And if we were to meet at this point on Labor Day, or not Labor Day, Veterans Day or Election Day, that meeting too will be a short meeting. And based on history, I think we're going to end up needing to have at least one long meeting in, in November because we're likely to be addressing budget issues. And I think that by default, we end up looking at the 18th as the day to do that unless we want to push on the 11th or push on Election Day, we could have short meetings on either of those days, but I don't think it would clear the agenda of the major major items we're likely to need to discuss and need time to take up. Uh, any comment yet from Council? Mr. Reed. Yes, Mr. Chair. The Charter Section 4.04B requires meetings twice a month, minimum of twice a month. Does it require it on Tuesdays? We're looking now to see. The Charter doesn't, but we're looking to see whether your code provisions do. Ms. Tucker. There is a, a, a code provision, and uh, it does say Tuesdays, but um, you can say notwithstanding 2.30030A, you're going to have a regular meeting given this on a day other than Tuesday, in my opinion, since the Charter does not require that the meetings be held on Tuesdays and leaves it up to the Assembly to, by ordinance, create their schedule. Thank you. Dr. Selkraig. Um, I move that we, um, schedule, we, we schedule a meeting on Tuesday the 4th and allow that as schedule. And then if we find ourselves in the, in the position where that meeting doesn't meet our needs, we can also meet the 18th and the 25th. But um, that way we don't have a great big gap. It's on Tuesday. It's a familiar time for the public. And we can get in, in, in here and out of here around the critical things that need to be addressed that are time sensitive in terms of Ms., what Ms. Osiander was talking about. Second. Uh, it's been moved and seconded that we meet now on the 4th and the 18th. I would say the 4th and the 25th, and then if on the 4th we determine that we need to meet on the 18th, we could add it so that there's a perhaps we could be efficient on the 4th and get our business done on the 25th. But if we're not, we have that option. Considering the fact that we've got budget around that period of time, we may value the opportunity to meet three times that month, even though it's hard. Ms. Drummond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I didn't uh, bring the uh, 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 the meeting, that, excuse me, the meeting schedule that we approved at the last meeting, but it appears that we have only one meeting in October. Is Two meetings right? on the 14th and the 28th. Okay. Then I missed that. So if we're meeting on the 28th, then we would be meeting again on a week later on the 4th, and that seems a little bit um, too frequent. I, I hear that as speaking against the motion. Mr. Coffey. Um, my question is to the administration or the clerk. If we don't schedule the 18th now, are we going to put ourselves in any kind of a situation where we find ourselves on the 4th having a problem and not being able to adequately address things on the 18th? Uh, question for the – does the administration have a response or the clerk have a response? Start with the administration. I, I don't think – I don't think that poses a, 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 an unnecessary burden on us. Okay. So um, we would be able to take care of matters. We may not be able to introduce them on the 4th and have them on the 18th, but 
Yes, you could. You could. But yeah. we'd have to know by then we're going to have the meeting. I got you. Yes. Okay. But you could, we could do it. Okay. But what about, does the clerk have anything that we Yeah, Ms. Greenstein. What I just said to the chair is we might want to continue this till next week and then just look at, since we changed the schedule a couple of times already, just look at the budget schedule and look at, at um, the other demands and address it at that point. That's a suggestion from the clerk that we postpone action on this until the meeting on the 24th. So moved. There's been, it's been moved by Mr. Coffey. Is there a second to continue this? It's been seconded by Ms. Osiander. Yes, I'm, I, um, Dr. Selkraig, you're in the queue. Uh, that's, I'm, Did you want to speak to this a, motion? I would, I would, I think that's a good idea. I also think that what we might do on this between now and next week is consider scheduling one the 4th, the 18th, and the 25th. And if we want to cancel a meeting, we can. And then we're covered. Uh, thank you. It was moved by Mr. Coffey and seconded by Ms. Osiander. All right. As to, as to moving, con to delaying consideration of this until the 24th, is there any objection to considering this again on the 24th? Seeing and hearing none, we will take this up again on the 24th. Next pulled item is 9 Delta 7. Uh, Mr. Coffey. Mr. Chairman, this is for purposes. Oh, we need motions. Well, this is for purposes of disclosure, and if the finding is I have a conflict, I don't want to be the moving party. Right. So perhaps you can Move. have someone else do that. Move to approve. Somebody, two people, Move. click in, please. Move to introduce. There's no way to do it. I can. What's happening? Who knows? I, I yeah, it's locked up. I can't. Is it? Not for me. For me. <laughs> and not for me. Have you, are we on the next item for you? No. Well, I am, but it doesn't seem to be doing anything. But can we just do it without the... Well, maybe if Sheila and Debbie moved, did they? I, that, yeah. Then it's worked. All right, let's take oral motions. So who are the two moving? Move to approve. Ms. Dr. Selkraig is moved in second from... Debbie. Ms. Osiander, okay. Mr. Coffey, go ahead and speak. Thank you. Um, I've represented uh, in the past and for many, many, many years Inlet Towers. Um, I, I'm not representing them on this matter, although I believe, and I do not believe that the firm that I am of counsel with is representing them either. This is a rather simple matter, restaurant designation permit. I don't have any financial interest, obviously, nor does my, in my opinion, does my personal relationship with the owners of the Inlet Tower I would be able to put the public interest well above it. This is a rather inconsequential matter, Mr. Chairman. And when, to, your, to the best of your memory, when, when was the last time you represented Inlet Tower Hotel and oh. Suites? Uh, I believe I can say safely more than three, two, or, at least more than two years ago. Whether it was no. beyond that, I don't want to say. Well, I'm going to rule that for purposes of acting on this, that, that because you're able to put your personal interest aside and act in the public interest, that I find there's no conflict. Is there any objection to that finding from anyone on the body? Hearing and seeing no objection, Mr. Coffey, you'll participate in this you, matter. Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's been moved and seconded. I don't see anyone else in the queue. Any objection to 9D7? Hearing and seeing none, that matter is approved. Next is number 9D9. And we need uh, somebody to punch approve. in. Ms. Osiander has moved. Ms. Johnston has seconded. Uh, this was pulled by the administration. Uh, Mr. Abbott or Ms. Handyside or Mr. Baggage, if you'd like to speak to this. You can one, one or all three. I'm sorry, was there a motion already? Yes, it's been okay, moved I'd like to uh, ask Diane Engel to add a matter to the record uh, on this uh, item, please. Go ahead, Ms. Engel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just need to note on the record that this con or grant with Providence Hospital does include the laying off of AMEA employees. And to indicate on how the many? record how many employees, one full-time, and I believe one, two, three, four, five on-call nurses, plus one non-represented employee. And we have already signed an agreement with AMEA and negotiated the transition. But if that could just be noted for the record, I'd appreciate it. All right. Any other comments with regard to 9 Delta 9? Mr. Coffey, you're in the queue. Was that for your disclosure? Yes. No. I, I had a question that okay. arose. Go ahead. Uh, the last time we received a federal grant over a, a period of time, and I, I understand that this is still there, we were compelled to then continue the financing ourselves. I'm thinking about the cops and schools thing. Is there anything like that here where we're committing to future expenditures? Ms. Engel or Mr. Abbott? Uh, Ms. Engel. Mr. Chair, Mr. Coffey, uh, we are not 
committed to future expenditures by virtue of the federal grant, but we have made a commitment pending assembly approval, of course, of budgetary um, decisions that the municipality will continue its financial obligation or financial contribution to this program, which is roughly between 300 and 350,000 a year. And then Providence Hospital has agreed to work with us at ways of financing the program, the other needs for the program. All right. I, I don't have any problem with that. I mean, that, that's something each assembly can do at, a, at, at budget time. What I did have a problem with was the idea that as a condition of the grant previously, we had to agree at the time to do it. So it sort of took the options of the assembly away from it. And if that's not here, that's the only question I have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coffey. I don't see any, anyone else in the queue. Is there any objection to 9 Delta 9? Hearing and seeing none, that matter is approved unanimously. The next pulled item is 9 Delta 15. Move to approve. Uh, hold on. Wait till we get there. All right. Ms. Osiander, somebody looks like Ms. Osiander and Ms. Johnston have moved and seconded. Uh, Ms. Osiander, you pulled this. Go ahead. Just a clarifying question. My eye was caught at the funding um, for this. It reads it's from 2006 area-wide CIP funds. I got an email back that said there's a state grant. My question is, does the state grant pay the entire cost, and is any additional funding coming from area-wide? Uh, through the chair, I believe Jeff Dillon can answer that question for us. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, uh, Assemblymember Osiander, uh, the and property and facility maintenance is here as well. If there's additional questions, but property and facility maintenance receives about 1.4 million dollars area-wide funding for all municipal facilities, and so much of the funds for this project are from that area wide. In addition, uh, we do have uh, state funds that we have uh, designated to PF&M that were directed to the Fairview Rec Center. So it's a combination of the two. I would like clarification from legal, if I could. Since the um, Eagle River area, Chugiak Eagle River area has its own park district and uses its own tax revenues to support its own rec center, and since this rec center is from um, the Anchorage Park Service area, I, my question is to the appropriateness of using area-wide funding, which uh, I guess implicitly I would assume Chugiak Eagle River residents pay too, to pay for the upgrade to an Anchorage Park Service facility. Mr. Reeves. Ms. Osiander, through the chair. The short answer is that I believe this is permissible, but I am not personally familiar with the funding mechanics of this, so I can't give you a certain answer tonight. Well, my concern is the McDonald Center is paid for entirely by the residents of Chugiak Eagle River. Uh, it comes from the taxes that we collect for our park district. And it seems a little bit unfair that we'd also have to contribute towards the Anchorage Park Service facilities. So I, I would, I guess, I don't know what the appropriate thing to do here um, would be potentially postpone this so that we can investigate it a little further, Mr. Abbott? M Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Gander, I was just conferring with uh, John Husey. We do use area-wide funds in the Chugiak Eagle River Park service area. We use, in fact, we're planning a project for the Chugiak Pool right now that will use area-wide funds. The Beach Lake, the new Beach Lake Chalet will be supported with uh, area-wide facility maintenance funds as well. Okay, I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. All right, I so think I, I think that's there. treated the same way as park facilities uh, in um, uh, park facilities in uh, the Anchorage Park and Rec Service area. So you're telling me it's not a bright line the way I thought it was? No. It, it, in other words, the uh, public facilities, regardless of the service area that may support their operations, can call on area-wide public facility money 
for facility-related uh, repairs, not the operations of those. And, and there's, there can be uh, a challenge to distinguish between what routine maintenance is that would be associated with operations and major maintenance, which is what the, this $1.2 million of annual funds that we allocate from area-wide taxes for major facility maintenance projects. Well, it sounds like I'm going to have to educate myself a little bit further. My question then would be, since Chugiak Eagle residents tax themselves specifically for capital projects, park capital projects, you're not saying that that money could be used for the Anchorage Park Service facilities, are you? Of course not. I'm saying that area-wide funds can be used for park facilities in Chugiak or in Anchorage, but not vice versa. <coughs> Thank you. No one else is in the queue. Is there any opposition to 9 Delta 15? Hearing and seeing none, that is approved unanimously. Uh, and my, with my apologies, actually, I over, because it's on the consent agenda, I overlooked the next item we need to consider is 9 Charlie 2. Again, 9 Charlie 2, which brings us back. And we need a motion. Move to approve. Been moved by Dr. Selkraig, and I thought it was seconded by Mr. Flynn, but for some reason your name dropped down. Mr. Flynn, try again. This doesn't work. All right. Well, we'll note Mr. Flynn is seconded. Okay, we're we're good to go. Ms. Handy, side you have you have uh, clicked in. Do you want to speak to this? Uh, yes, we'd like to add some language to this memorandum, and Bart Walden can uh, include can introduce that language to you if this is the appropriate time to do so. Uh, it would be. I, I know Ms. Ossiander pulled that, but was this for the purpose that we're about to receive? We have a different reason. Okay, well, let, go ahead and bring the additional language, and then Ms. Ossiander can raise her questions as to this. Mr. Malden. Mr. Chairman, um, we need to, we forgot to put in the change order authority on this particular contract with the value. So at line 17, we would like to add the following language. On page one? On page one of the assembly memorandum. Anchorage Municipal Code section 7.15.080 establishes change order authority for contract awards. The authorized amount on contract awards greater than 2.5 million is to be established at the time of award and is subject to approval. Request change order authority for this award to be approved in the amount of $450,000. That is approximately 8% of the contract award and is fairly consistent with the authorities that we need on our unit price contracting. And I have that. Move to approve the amendment. It's been moved. Is there a second to approve I the amendment? I accept it as a friendly amendment. Well, we need a second first. Second. It's moved and seconded. Okay. We're, they're doing it verbally. I can't. Get the system. I can't. The system. We're, the, the, motion, the original motion was made by Dr. Selkraig and seconded by Mr. Flynn. That was as to the, that was to the underlying AM. And then as to, the, as to this motion, it was moved by Mr. Coffey and seconded by Ms. Osiander. And I accept it as a friendly amendment. And it has been accepted as a friendly amendment. Well, we, were the amendments incorporated, uh, Chairman? Actually, I think... I think procedurally I ask for if there's objection. Any objection for for the amendment? I don't hear and see any, so that amendment is accepted. Uh, so the question now is, Ms. Osiander had questions on this, so go ahead. Just one. We've been seeing um, this project regularly on agendas. There's been pieces that keep coming to us, and I am hoping to kind of get a big picture of how much this whole effort is costing. It, do we have that? Question for the administration. Can you hear us, David? I mean, I remember the people lined up in front on this. I just, I mean, it's got to be bigger than this. Well, the, um, through the chair, uh, Ms. Osiander, as you recall, phase one um, w has been completed, and that was the utility relocates on the um, inlet side of the uh, railroad tracks. And that was, I think, approximately $2.8 million 
I think it might have been about closer to three, but I think it was about 2.8. And this is the final phase for the uh, for the project to do the work on the inside of the um, the lagoon. And um, just uh, by way of uh, introduction, last night Conoco Phillips actually contributed $100,000 toward uh, interpretive signage at the lagoon for this project. So we're very excited about that, and you'll be seeing that coming your way sometime soon here. So about eight and a half mil. Yeah, approximately. Thank you. Mr. Coffey, don't leave yet. He may have a question for you. Well, thank you. I, I've been, I was on the Board of Fisheries from 96 to 2002, and we used to talk about you had to be a gymnastic coho to get through the fish weir into Chester Creek. It took leaps, you know, Nadia Komich and all that stuff. This, and when I first heard about this, I forget how long ago David brought it to us, and it, it's a great thing. It will allow the coho to return and and it'll just it'll just enhance all of this urban fishery stuff we have and I know it's, it seems to be an awful lot of money eight seven and a half eight million bucks but if you're gonna do it and protect and and provide for this kind of thing in, in Anchorage which I think is a very good thing then this is a completion of a very good project and I support it hundred percent thank you and through the chair the uh, as as you re may recall, the original environmental document, I think, was published in 2004, 2003 time frame. The estimated budget at that time was about $6.5 million. So I think with issues related to increased fuel costs and other issues like that, I think we're fairly consistent with really the original issues. And um, the other thing about the project, it will have improved uh, flood hazard benefits and flood control and issues like that that um, uh, Mr. Hansen could speak more to than than I can, if you'd like. But it, it will have other benefits than just than just fish. So, thank you very much, Ms. Osiander. You're back in the queue. Is there going to be any funding for any more of our creek? Yes, as a matter of fact, we uh, were very fortunate in uh, now that most of the funding is no longer earmarked. Um, we have to be in the competitive cycle, and just recently, Fishing Game has awarded us another uh, funding to to uh, uh, allow us to commit to a project that uh, Ms. Johnston and I and a constituent spoke to about about um, four or five months ago on Little Campbell Creek, and so you'll be seeing that coming your way. The other thing is Fish and Game is out ready to send out another call for proposals, and you'll be happy to know, Ms. Osiander, that this call for proposals is not restricted to Chester Ship or Campbell Creeks, and so there could be an opportunity for work in the Eagle River area as well. Peters Creek. Peters Creek. What I would suggest is that it, whatever constituent groups you have or, or, or individuals that have, a, have an issue out there, that they could certainly get in touch with me and we could vet it with our task force and other folks as well. Um, there are people in the community with various community councils that are doing that right now. There's a project on Campbell Creek again that I know that Taku and Sand Lake community councils are very interested in as well. So, Thank you very much. No one else is in the okay. queue. Is there any opposition to, I guess it's a memorandum, so it's accepting. Any opposition to accepting this memorandum? I hear and see none, so that is accepted unanimously. Next item is number 9, Delta 21. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. I believe that's an appropriation. It's not accepted. I think it's not, it was item C something, and we need to approve it, not accept it. All right. You're, see us. Yes. Okay. I, you, you, I stand corrected. I appreciate that, Mr. Coffey. Yet, you. Any objection to to uh, approving this expenditure. Hearing and seeing none, that is approved unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Coffey. Uh, next is number nine, Delta 21. Move to approve. Has been, uh, there need a second. Mr. Gutierrez has seconded. In the, in the world, I'll just remind, in words of the computer, because sometimes people are faster, if you just hit the button, I'll announce who got there first and who got there second. You don't need to announce it verbally. I think that's well, I think try to work with the computer system. Um, I'm announcing who says it. So I read the computer screen and announce who says it, who, who punches the button. So it is announced who, who moved in second. And Ms. Dr. Selkrig. Um I pulled this um, again because I'm interested in um, what's going on in terms of van pooling in light of the issues that we have before us in terms of the the cost of it costs people to drive back and forth from Palmer, and I just would love to have uh, a little update along with the reference that I made earlier in terms of the transit issues uh, from the administration. I just wonder if the administration has any comments right now in terms of how we're addressing the van pool issues. I know that they're 
they're, they're really in demand, and I'm glad to see these replacements, but I thought I'd give you an opportunity to give us a little update. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Selkirk. It's my understanding that we have 45 current van pools. 42 of those travel between Anchorage and the Valley. Three of those travel to Girdwood. 650 plus or minus um, travel in those van pools every day. And we have a waiting list for an additional 600 people who are interested in joining a van pool. Has that, has that list been a constant thing, or is that new in relation to the gas increases? Um, we're definitely seeing increased interest. It's, it's grown a bit over the last year, but we've traditionally had a fairly large waiting list. Okay, and I'm just wondering, program. so what we're going to do right now is these will be to, to maintain our current capacity, or will this increase our capacity? I believe that a few of these seven are going to be new van pools, but I don't have a number how many are new and how many are replacement. Okay. Well, I would just be looking forward to hearing from the administration. I know you're working on some strategies, and if you could fold this into a work session when we talk about these issues in general, it would be helpful. And I would like to say that Jody did recently have a conversation with the Matsu Borough, mm -hmm. and they were uh, positive that they, were, would, they would help us by purchasing some additional vans. Okay. Thanks. Mr. Starr. Well, I did try to communicate with Jody on that clarification on the services we provide to the Matsu residents under this program. So I would hope maybe we can follow up on how they prioritize perhaps to incentivize the municipal employees. Uh, some other hierarchy, I guess, is what I had asked her to provide is how does she actually choose who gets on this waiting list and how do they prioritize that. So um, it, it's helpful, I think, to send traffic uh, in van such as this to Matsu. But I think we start to see a competitive nature on who actually rides them. Um, and I, I would want some clarification on the policy of selection so Maybe we, we know what we're, what we're getting. So mm -hmm. we'll wait that news, and I don't care if there's a transportation committee can bring that to us or however you'd like to do that. Thank you, Mr. Flynn. I think we've got an answer oh. here. Well, it was a question to Jody Cars from some time back, so if you know updated information on how she's talking about prioritizing the use of these vehicles. Generally, when you have a waiting list for the van pool, we're looking at the origin and destination of who is interested in, in filling that van. Um, and the priority is going to be given, A, to who signed up first, but B, how can we best fill that van? And most of the people on the waiting list are wanting to travel from the valley into Anchorage, so those vans fill faster. And again, it was just sort of the contribution of the Matsu borough as well to sort of facilitate that, not burden the Anchorage folks with the full cost of, of that service as it becomes, you know, increasingly competitive to get on the van. So we're, we may need to look at how we're allowing, you know, certain, certain folks that may have a better justification for being on that van either due to income or due to other levels than just, you know, my neighbor was able to get one and I want to be on it. So it, it was very unclear to me as to how the policy is decided who actually gets to get on it. And if you're saying it's just a first come first serve basis, is that, I, is that the best way to do business? Okay. And, and just to clarify, there's no muni dollars that go with this. These are, it's either federal funds or the user's funds. I so um, I don't know that we're really in a position to impose a preference beyond uh, the ones that we're using now, basically, in terms of first come, first served and the uh, um, the, the clustering of both the uh, de starting points and the destinations here in town. And I guess just through the chair, it is, it is all that, as you say, it's just the municipal employees and, and our department chairs and heads and employees that sort of manage that ridership and, and put those levels of investments in the technology upgrades that we have at our maintenance facilities. So it may not be direct dollars, but I think, you know, we're, we're using municipal resources to maintain them, study the route structures and put people forth. So. I just, you know, as it becomes more, more competitive, I see all the rider lots are full. Uh, the vans are all full, and I know it's coming down the pike. So if we don't have a formal policy or, or an understandable outlet on how to get on these vans, we may want to do that. So that's all. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Flynn. You were next in the queue. Yeah, just to briefly speak to Mr. Starr's concern, um, <clears throat> one of the things that we're making some forward progress on is that the Matsu Borough is making a parallel request for capital funds for these share ride vans, um, granted those aren't, aren't necessarily those dollars, they're state dollars, but they're getting some skin in the game from a political capital's point of view 
as we move forward with this project and, and your, your points about how we determine who gets ridership are legitimate. We'll take those up in time. And just to follow up through that, I appreciate the comment. In return, it's some of it to follow up to give my resident bases an alternative. We're, we're having actually three bus routes cut due to low ridership. The suggestion was check, check with anchor rides or van pooling. And so, you know, we need to provide the resources as they're best needed. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I'll just comment, um, you know, one of the growing and challenging issues we're going to continue to have, and I know we talked briefly at our meeting yesterday, is this um, Matsu Anchorage kind of South Central issue of transportation, the Glen Highway. And we are working uh, now with the Mayor Menard in the Valley. We're, we're talking about an idea of a transportation authority to deal with commuter rail and some other issues, which as we progress on that, we're going to work with the Assembly to, to uh, bring you up to speed. We're going to have a discussion, I think, Friday with the Mayor, and we'll see where that goes. But the issues are growing as prices of fuel are now 4 four fifteen a gallon here. It's having huge impact. It doesn't matter if you live in the Valley or Eagle River and, and, uh, or in the um, Bowl. But the issue with the Mad Valley is they recognize that they see they have a role now to participate in a broader perspective. And the fact is when those 11 or 12 or 13,000 commuters come in every day, they're impacting us in one way or another. So we're trying to figure out um, the, the challenge that's ahead of us <clears throat> with transportation in the South Central area. It's much different than it was three years ago, let alone uh, two years ago. Uh, so we're going to be probably doing some joint efforts with Matsu as these van pools are a first example of as they bring up van pools, we'll bring up van pools, and we're going to try to figure out how to deal with the ever-growing need of people wanting to have commuter transportation systems. Thank you, Mr. Starr. You're next in the queue, but I wasn't sure if that was a pr from your prior comments or it's a new comment. No, but as long as I'm in the queue, I can, and through the mayor, just to encourage also dialogue with the military bases as well. They're, they're under some challenges to I increase ridership. We don't have the transportation structure of our, of our transportation network, such as bus service. We don't provide that on or near the bases, and um, I know they're increasingly challenged. And with that service, the opportunity for being in my district, they've, they've contacted me on several occasions. And I just don't quite frankly know what to tell that resident population on the basis on how we're best going to serve them. So as we expand, um, you know, that, that user group needs to be accommodated. So thank you. Dr. Selkraig. Well, I'm really pleased that we're looking at this comprehensively. And this conversation brings to mind, of course, the issues in Eagle River and also in Girdwood. So I, I know you've got your, your agenda before you, and I look forward to the report back as you begin to shape this together. And that whole kind of regional strategy. It'll be wonderful. Thanks. All right. No one else is in the queue. Is there any objection to approval of this memorandum? Hearing and seeing none, that is approved unanimously. The next is item 9, Delta 23, which was pulled at my request. Is there a motion and a second? Move to approve. Mr. Flynn has moved and Ms. Osiander has seconded. Um, I pulled this just because I if we get a quick comment from the administration about it appeared that uh, we had one policy drop, it, the premium dropped on employee dishonesty, and I was looking to, they say it, insurance rates never drop, and just a question, how did we do this? Mr. Chairman, I'm going to ask Glenn Smith to come down and uh, give you a, a brief explanation of the process that we went through to identify the, um, and, and price the, the insurance that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Chairman, point of order for a personal disclosure, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, actually, I do risk uh, assessment and management consulting on the side, per se, as it is. And my job is first and foremost to the assembly. But I do risk assessment survey work for a company that uh, has provided consulting service work. Um, and I have actually engaged in the dialogues that have reviewed these policies. And I didn't catch it earlier. Um, so I just want to put that out there. I don't, I don't get much. It's a, it's a secondary risk assessment survey that provides direct support to these uh, these companies listed, such as Colony and Art Specialty. So let me ask you uh, just a couple of questions on the disclosure, and I appreciate the disclosure. Uh, do you actually receive any, any financial compensation for your service that relates to these? Not directly from these folks, but they're liable to have reviewed reports that I provide. So, so these, as to these policies, you actually, you're not getting any financial benefit from these? No, not from these directly. All right, and to the extent that you have some personal interest, and it seems somewhat amorphous what the personal interest would be other than you can set your personal interest aside and 
and address the public interest in voting on this matter. I can. And I guess the question was why did the rates go down? Some of the rates are, in fact, the risk assessment survey work that I provide. It wouldn't be in a priority arrangement from this one, but uh, I actually passed, but I sent a colleague over to um, this gentleman to review the risk assessment. I reviewed the report, but uh, I made no corrections to it. So just just point of correction on that. So and and I, I will find that based on that, that you don't have a conflict and you'll participate. And any objection to that finding? Hearing and seeing none, go ahead. Uh, to the chair, um, the only way to reduce insurance premiums, uh, even, as we all know, it's the law of large numbers throughout the country for these type of exposures. In this case, this renewal is for both property insurance and our excess general liability and auto liability coverage. Property insurance was reduced primarily because we, we team with the school district, and by doing that, we have a larger base and a more attractive premium base. Um, we've been successful in holding down our losses, primarily due to the uh, cooperation from our facility maintenance department in doing the recommendations that our insurance company recommends through their engineering department, through seismic bracing, sprinklers, um, uh, seismic gas valve shutoffs. And this year, uh, as noted, we received a $287,000 credit. We went to three other markets. They couldn't compete based on that, both on premium and on services, uh, i.e. the engineering services. On the excess insurance, um, I can't comment on the um, fine arts because it's the cheapest and most inexpensive and comprehensive coverage I've ever encountered. In my 32 years, we're taking advantage of it. We got six million extra coverage for the same premium as expiring. Uh, and then we added $5 million excess to our general liability and auto liability, primarily because the school district wanted higher coverages. And I agree in today's market that we, if we can get it that cheap, we should go for it. So okay. good loss ratio and good cooperation, basically. All right, Ms. Osiander is in the queue. If you want to stay put, you may have questions. Actually, it's not a uh, question as much as a commendation. I um, note that in my four plus years on this body, this department consistently is working hard to save us money, and I thank you. Well, I appreciate that, and uh, it's a group effort on the entire department. Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much. No one else is in the queue. I'll ask if there's any any opposition to approval of this memorandum. Hearing and seeing no opposition, that matter is approved. The next hold item uh, is 9F11, pulled at the request of Ms. Osiander, and because these are actually being brought for introduction and we're not voting on them tonight, I think we actually need a first, second, and I'll take an oral third, but if Mr. Second. Looks like Mr. Flynn has already clicked in, Ms. Selkraig. Dr. Se Selkraig second, and Mr. Coffey third. 9F11, Ms. Osiander. I sent in a question that didn't get an answer. When uh, my concern is when we will be approving the 2008 work plan and the five-year plan on HLB. Administration, Mr. Maynard. I'll answer the question, uh, uh, Ms. Osiander, through the chair. The uh, work plan has been submitted to the. Uh, Heritage Land Bank Commission for review, and we have a scheduled workshop tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock with the Commission members. The plan would be to bring uh, the recommendation to the Assembly uh, probably in the July or August time frame. The reason I ask the question, it seems appropriate to me that we would approve the plan before we approve the expenditures from the 2008 work plan. And so I'd like to have this public hearing date either on the same day or immediately after we approve the plan. Um, so I'm wondering if we can have a specific date. July, I don't know what's the meeting date in July. Well, this, this uh, is July 15 and July 29. I note that this, this matter has been put on, this, this capital project has been put on for public hearing on the 24th. I, all, my only concern here is the timing. Okay, so you, is your request that we actually move the approval of the Heritage Land Bank plan up to the 24th? So we can take this up, or you're asking can the administration move this item 
for the public hearing can remove that public hearing date back so you, we look well, at the plan. Well, either way would work. I just want to approve the plan before I approve expenditures sure. of the plan. Mm -hmm. Administration, uh, two questions. Can we take the plan up at the next meeting? And the second question is uh, if we couldn't take the plan up at the next meeting, is there a problem if we defer this until July 15? Mr. Maynard. There is no problem for delaying the um, – I would prefer to – continue with the schedule in front of the commission so that they have an opportunity to weigh in on on the uh, work schedule prior to bringing it to the assembly. So, But so that's, that's, that is scheduled for tomorrow morning. So the next uh, assembly meeting would be appropriate. Mr. Chairman, can I – excuse me. Go ahead, Mr. Begich. Uh, let me just confirm one thing, if I can. Uh, Bill, I'm looking at the list. Uh, on the AM. Mike, Mike, Mike. It's 369, 2008. Um, 69 or 360? No, What do you When I look at this list of the 10 items or 12 items, aren't these all in the 2007 plan? We're looking at 369, 2008, the yeah, AM. the backup for this 580. Isn't, I mean, all, if I'm looking at this list right, Okay, am, I, am I wrong there, Bill? Are almost all those in the 07 plan? Uh, that's correct. This is, uh, these are all from the 07 work right. plan, and uh, uh, these are the capital improvement projects that are ongoing. Right. There's I, nothing new on this list. Right. That's what I guess I want to get back to. This is not new items for 08. I mean, they'll show up in the 08 because they're part of the 07 plan, so they'll show up kind of as a continuation. All these projects were approved last year, and now they're here. So I guess I wanted to make sure that, that clarification is that these aren't new. These aren't – they will just be included in the OA plan because they're continuing to flow through. That's just the process we go through. And, again, I want to echo that. There's nothing new here from what you've approved last year or what you approved in the five-year plan last year. I stand corrected, though, Mayor. The, the, there is one item on this list that is in the – in addition to our work plan, and that is line 34, site remediation. We have um, – we had a disposal – Well, that's that one knockdown, right? And, no, this was a disposal in Mountain View that uh, was auctioned, uh, and in the soil testing, we discovered uh, that remedi remediation was required. Okay. I Thank stand you. corrected, but generally all these are ongoing stuff. Uh, Mr. Coffey. Point of, uh, no, go ahead. You're, you're after – you're after – you want to go first, Ms. Oceana? Well, it appears then that we have an incorrect title and needs to be resubmitted. No, because we're, we're – Mr. Chairman? Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. There if, – if you read the line, it says, to the 2008 operating budget, because it's – these have to be expended in the 08 cycle. We're, we're in the 08 cycle. And, and that's where we're in. And correct me, Bill, if I'm wrong here, but you have to approve it as it is in the 08 plan because this is we're expending it in 08, even though they were approved as projects in 07. And, and, and that's why the phrase on their contributions that for new and continuing, and the new is that one item it looks like. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Mr. Coffey, you, you're back in the queue. Which Go ahead. Well, I just had a point of order, and, and how is – Ms. Ostander could tell us how the title to 2008-122 is incorrect so that it would require resubmittal. I didn't get that. My – I thought that I heard the mayor say that this is $2,007. No, I think I, – I understood that as saying that it was in the 2007 plan, and right. now it's $2,008 to be spent on the plan that we approved in 2007. Okay, well – And I, I understood the mayor to be speaking – um, to the topic of do we really need to approve the plan before we approve this if we already approved the plan? Okay. Correct. Well, my strong preference is we approve the plan first. A lot of these projects are in the draft plan that we received. Uh, I, will, I will just speak briefly from a standpoint of scheduling in my role as chair, and, and then we'll let the other two in the queue go. I, my inclination, because I don't hear an urgency from the administration, and I'm, I'm pleased to let the Heritage Land Bank Advisory Commission look at the plan and make recommendations to us. My, my thought is that they probably need to introduce that at the next meeting for us to approve it at the following meeting because it's not been introduced today. And if it needs to be introduced 
before we can have a hearing on it, before we can consider it, it makes sense to me to put both of these on for July 15. Um, and I'm comfortable doing that for all the reasons stated. Dr. Selkraig. Um I'm not going to be supporting this um, a motion because, as I understand it, these projects were reviewed and approved last year. They're appearing in the plan this year because we're actually implementing them this year. So the plan, I assume, is referencing them happening this year? Uh, or are they or they're ongoing and some are ongoing some are and, and so it seems to me if there's one project in here that's new and there's some reluctance about that one project I'm happy to pull that one project out but if we've already reviewed these um, it seems kind of uh, redundant to slow them up and kind of have to go through this in a work session or something it seems to me it's pretty straightforward they were in the plan last year they're funded for this year um, all but one has been reviewed for the plan, so I guess um, it, I, I, it just, do you have a comment, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, and, and to add this list, and again, Bill, correct me if I'm wrong here, that the Heritage Land Bank Commission has reviewed this list and approved this to come forward as part of their whole process of, you know, they do the plan, but as these documents come forward for then your action, they have come through their process also again. So I just for clarification, the Assembly has already re uh, reviewed and approved all but one of these projects um, in when we reviewed and approved the 2007 Heritage Land Bank Plan. Is Bill, that correct? It's, it's one or two. I, I don't – you look at – It's only one. One. Okay. So all but one have been reviewed and approved by the Assembly when we reviewed the – In November two, of 07. Seven. So it, it just I, – I mean, I was, I was um, sympathetic to Ms. Sosiander's concern until I realized that they had already been reviewed and approved, and it just seems redundant. So I urge a no vote on this. Thank you. Actually, there's no motion on the floor at this point. It's just been introduced. Mr. Coffey. No. Okay. Well, just for clarification, it's coming before us right. for public hearing on the 24th. Right. We're debating the merits today. Right. I would note one other thing so we don't maybe waste more time next two weeks hence. If you've got a site remediation issue, it's like – really no choice. You, you, you're going to have to clean it up. That's the law. Mm -hmm. And I would only note this. My understanding is this is a site that we purchased in Mountain View from a dry cleaner without so much as a phase one, which is foolish, in the, to say the least. And now we've got probably one of the toughest cleanups, which is dry cleaning fluid, which requires us to dig up dirt and ship it to Oregon. Not Portland, mind you, but Oregon. <laughs> So I, I, I uh, think we should have the public hearing on the 24th. All right. I'm, I'm hearing the suggestion that we should keep with the public hearing. And Ms. Osiander. I wanted to move to change the public hearing to July 15th on this. All right. There's a mo motion to change the public hearing to the July 15th. Is there a second to change the public hearing date? It's been seconded by Mr. Birch. Any discussion on that topic? Mr. Uh, hearing no discussion. Oh. I just wanted to note that initially I heard no objection from the HLB and at, at this point I'm still unclear if this causes a problem or not. Um, question for Heritage Land Bank. Is it a problem to continue public hearing on this till the 15th? Ms. Osiander, through the chair, uh, we would like to proceed because these, some of these projects are ongoing and have capital expenditures and obligations, surveys, platting expenses, and so forth that are ongoing. Uh, one in particular, uh, as an example, Section 36 uh, is um, being surveyed and uh, platted for uh, final approval, and uh, the conditional has been done. We have expenses that would we would like to pay, and our capital budget needs to uh, have this approved. I would like to not have a delay on all of these items and uh, including the uh, the one item of the remediation. That work has already been contracted so we are ready to go. Uh, as in light of in light of Mr. Maynard's comments, Dr. Selkai goes to the pending motion to move the public hearing date. Do you need to be heard? Um, I won't be supporting this for reasons I indicated earlier. It just seems to me that we've already reviewed these. 
there's, it doesn't seem to me that there's a lot to be gained. There's a, that gives us this week to sort things out. It gives us some time between now and the next meeting if there's any questions. And it seems a, sh a shame to hold all these projects up. It's summer, and there are, some of them need to get going, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coffey. Very briefly, Mr. Chairman, line 17, they use the word follow-up planning. Line 24, continuing. Line 28, final planning expenses. Line 33, continued. Uh, phase design, line 37, continued project. Half of these projects are already underway. Why delay them? We're, we're going to support this when they come. Let's not put it off for a month and a half. I Thank you. I think you're saying what Mr. Maynard said. Mr. Ms. Osiander. Going to request to withdraw my motion, but I didn't have a chance. Well, thank you. I, I will treat the motion as withdrawn. Is there, and with the motion withdrawn, uh, any further comments? I see no one else in the queue. This will be taken up on the 24th of June. Next item is item 9 F13. Mr. Birch, is we need a motion to two Move people to, click in. Mr. Move to introduce. Point of uh, order. Point of order. Then, did okay. you ever ask us if this was introduced? It was introduced. This Sorry, I didn't catch the third. I'm 9F11? Okay. Didn't we get it introduced? Did we? I thought we did. Third. We, we, we got it first, second, and third. We don't need to. We, there's okay. no action Thank after you. it's been introduced. Thank you very much. Okay. As to 9F13, it's been moved by Dr. Selkraig, seconded by Mr. Flynn. Is third. there a third? Third by Mr. Coffey. Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Birch. I just uh, want to disclose that I am a resident of this uh, service area. And uh, obviously you pay money to the service fund. Do you have, beyond, beyond what everybody else in the service area pays, do you have any other financial interest? No. And are you able to put your uh, public interest ahead of your personal interest? Absolutely. I will find that you have no conflict and that you should participate. Any objection to that finding? Hearing and seeing none. Any other discussion as to 9F13? All right. Well, that has been moved, in, moved seconded, and third, for, thirded for introduction. We'll take that up uh, on whatever date it's scheduled for. Next item, uh, 9F15. Mr. Birch pulled this as well. Let's uh, move for, hold on. We need, to, need introductions and all that stuff. Dr. Selkraig has moved. Ms. Johnston has seconded. We need a third. Third. Who was that? Birch? Birch is thirded. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Birch. Just, uh, I just noted that uh, it was a $600,000 expenditure to assess whether the $1.9 million appropriation was going to be sufficient to do the work. And I, I guess I just wanted a clarification maybe from the administration as to, uh, I mean, it seems like there's a lot of money being expended toward a project that has a, uh, a, a finite budget limit. I, I just looking for a little more. Maybe background. Anyone? Jerry Hansen, Project Management and Engineering. Uh, the 600000 we'll be appropriating from the uh, grant will be used for the preliminary engineering and the design um, to, to do, determine what kind of work we're going to do up there on, in, uh, uh, on those uh, roads. Um, there seems to be a difference of a opinion with some of the uh, uh, people on Canyon and Toilsome Hill, what type of improvements they want. So uh, we're, this is the amount of money we're going to get for right now, and then uh, we'll determine what type of improvements will be needed and, and uh, then go further into design on that. Okay. Uh, I guess just as a follow-up, I, I guess my question relates to the, uh, the justification for the $1.9 million appropriation, which came from the state legislature. I mean, I, my assumption was that that was going to accomplish a certain amount of construction work, and it sounds like we're putting about a third of it into the kind of into the front end. Um, Mr. Birch, I do not have any idea where that number came from. It may have just been a... Jerry, I can, I, I can help with that okay. a little bit. This was a grant that the municipality actually did not request initially. It was funded actually in 2006. Um, Representative Hawker and then Governor Murkowski reached this arrangement for two and a half million bucks. Um, approximately, it must have been 600,000 of which has been spent on the parking lot at the end of Toilsome Hill Road. So um, that much of it has already been expended or has been allocated for that purpose. The remainder was set aside for the road, but it was never expected that this would, this would accomplish significant construction. Um, this is a road that is 
um, dramatically outside of its right of way um, consistently along its route. And so there's a major either replatting exercise or reconstruction exercise associated with this. And I know Ms. Johnston's aware of some of the specifics on this uh, uh, through her Chugach State Park access interests. So Canyon Road could well be a 10 to, uh, Canyon and Tolson Hill could well be 10 to 20 million dollars in total. Um, depending on the outcome of this initial process. Uh, we will not fully expend the grant during this design and uh, basically public scoping phase. And hopefully at the end of this five or $600,000 process, we'll have a pretty good idea of what the neighbors want, which is yet to be determined. There's still quite a bit of energy there, and what the state, both the park system and the municipality can support. Great. Thank you. Thank you. No one else is in the queue. That matter has been properly introduced and it will come up as appropriate. That finishes everything on the consent agenda. That brings us to item 11A. Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just before you start your old business, can I just pass out one item that I wanted to do under Mayor's report? Actually, why don't you go ahead and give your Mayor's report now? We had, okay. we had gone past because you weren't here, but now you're here and we'll be happy to hear that report. Thank you very much. This is the uh, second quarter report. As you know, I try each quarter to pass out um, updates on just kind of one paragraphs on several projects and activities within the city. Um, this will have on there, you'll see several things from the uh, downtown improvements to um, the MLP CEA issues, Lake Otis and Tudor, Port of Anchorage, uh, Hillside District Plan, investment policy, a variety of things that, again, the, the goal here is to make sure um, you get these updates on a regular basis. What I try to do also on these, if projects are being completed um, or they're no longer necessary to report on because we've done all the work or they're no longer valid, we'll note that also on here. But again, this is for your reference on several projects. I'm happy to um, respond to any or you can hang on to it and just check in with me later if you'd like. That's all I need to really report at this point, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. That brings us now to item 11A. Uh, it's item AO number 2008-62, an ordinance amending Anchorage Municipal Code, Chapter 28.80, to add a new section for a surcharge to support community recycling initiatives amending, and amending Section 28.70.040 to add the surcharge fees. The public hearing in this matter was closed uh, on was closed on uh, May 6th. So, what is the wish of the body? I uh, move to substitute. To, I move to introduce 2008-62 S version. It's been laid on the table. All right, that's been moved by Ms. Johnston and seconded by Mr. Flynn. Any opposition to considering the S version? We're not voting on it, we're just considering it. Hearing and seeing none, that is before us, okay. Mr. Chairman, I would recommend that you also put the Associated Assembly Memorandum on the table at this time as well, since I'm sure that's gonna be a subject of some of this discussion. That's fine, that is, I think it's attached, it's attached and I think it is considered laid on the table at the same time. All right. Um, in order, isn't it a motion to approve, sir? Well, it's first introduced, and then there's a motion to approve what's before us. Is there a motion to approve the S version? It's just an S version. So okay. We'll treat it as, you, I think, Ms. Osiander, you are correct. We will treat that as a motion to approve the S version. Thank you, sir. It's been moved by Ms. Johnston and seconded by Mr. Flynn. With the accompanying? With the accompanying assembly memorandum. Thank you. Uh, and Ms. Osiander, you were first in the queue. Did you have anything more to speak, or Ms. Johnston is next? Do you want to let her speak first? I'd actually prefer if Ms. Johnston would go first. All right, Ms. Johnston, as chair of the Recycling Committee, if you could speak to the S version. Yes, we've, um, I'm sorry for having this come to assembly late. Um, we've been working on this right up until this morning. Um, I'd like to thank the committee, and I'd also like to thank the administration for um, all the long hours that have been put into this. Uh, we have made a number of changes. If you can remember, the first um, ordinance started out with a tipping fee of $8. And that included um, um, the municipality getting into composting and recycling. Um, the first issue that we have addressed is composting, and I would like everybody to um, um, appreciate that we had the private sector jump up 
to the table for this summer and have uh, Evergreen Nursery who has provided some composting for us. Um, the, um, this S version, first of all, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be charging a $3 tipping fee beginning August 1st to commercial users. And this will go into a fund, a recycling fund, we will, which we will bring to the um, organization later on, we'll introduce. But it will be a, actually not a fund, an account for recycling. And if you look in your memorandum, um, we, have, we have stated our, our interest in how that fund is spent. And we have also um, discussed having this, um, this account sunsetted. Uh, we've made a lot of changes as far as um, we've had great um, participation by both the public and the private sector. Um, Alaska Waste, as you know, has come out with uh, curbside recycling. And they have also worked uh, well with the school district and will be doing the recycling at no net cost for the school district. This has dropped the uh, tipping fee down considerably. Um, we've also, in this memorandum, um, we are, are encouraging the administration to, to have micro-grants for the school district because there's a number of volunteer organizations within the school district that we want to, to empower. And um, we are hoping that, that they will apply for these micro-grants and there will be up to $1,000 for the eight major high schools and some of the elementary and junior school, uh, middle high schools, middle schools, I mean. Um, I, I urge your support. I feel very good about this, this ordinance. I think one thing that we have to take in mind and we've addressed also in the memorandum is, is when you address something like recycling, first of all, it's an economy of scale and um, we have to to work with it as an economy of scale. That doesn't mean that we need to go out and consume so we have more recyclables. <laughs> and I would like all of us, and I, by the way, Mayor, I was very happy to have your report, black and white, two-sided. <laughs> We're making progress here. Um, and, I, and I think as a community and as a public, we need, to, we need to think about that. We need to think about what our consumption is as opposed to feel at times virtuous that we're recycling. And I hope um, that the administration takes these recycling funds not only to, to improve the recycling programs, but to look into efficiencies. I think we need to discuss efficiencies just in our waste management and how um, if, if we have a recycling bin that's out in, at the Highland Landfill, where everybody is lined up and running their cars waiting for their turn, then we haven't, we haven't um, addressed the situation. I think we need to have very efficient operations as far as our trash and our recycling, and I, I look forward to having proposals. Um, thank you. Next in the queue, Dr. Selkright. Um, I had a few questions. I, I'm, first, I want to appreciate the immense amount of work that both the assembly and the staff has done in brokering this agreement this evening, and I've been on the phone several times today with the administration, and I found them wonderfully responsive. One of the things that I was concerned about is clarifying um, the, the long-term commitment to the school district in terms of the recycling program. Um, the school district met yesterday, and they indicated that they welcome this program and that there are some initial upfront costs, and then there's some long-term costs that they um, feel are really important that need to be met. And um, I guess, is there somebody here to represent the school district? So we, we could just clarify. Ms. Como, can you come forward? I just want to make sure that we get on the record um, clearly what our... Mr. Mr. Friedman is here also on behalf Thank of the you, school board. Uh, who's, I, the, uh, who's the first speaker? Mr. Jeff Friedman, Friedman president the of the Anchorage School Board. Thank you, uh, Mr. Friedman. I just want to clarify for the record um, what your understanding is of this relationship in terms of economic commitment and how this program um, needs to work for you in terms of resources. Sure. Well, first of all, um, it was very well received last night. It was certainly uh, a unanimous vote in support of participating in this. It's something I know our students have been pressing for for a long time, and, and all the board, I think, fully supports it. 
Um, as you know, there are some initial charges, and we we just do not have money in the budget to to outfit our schools with all the recycling containers necessary. In addition, there will be ongoing costs um, after we net out the savings. We're calculating that the initial ongoing costs will be about eighty-five thousand per year. Um, that will go up with inflation, but that's basically the the management of the of the hundred different locations and the recycling efforts there. And I understand you'll be hiring a recycle coordinator, at least part time or full time, to manage this. Would be one one full time position and um, a, a vehicle to use. So the cost of operating the vehicle. Okay, I just wanted to clarify with the administration. Today when I checked, it's my understanding that that this, the current proposed $3 surcharge is adequate to cover that cost. Is that correct, Mr. Virgin? Through the chair, members of the assembly, that is correct. Okay. Um, is there anything else that you'd like us to be aware of um, regarding this? Well, Mr. Vakalis and Mr. Sutter are also here, and they've worked extensively with it. We're very enthusiastic about this. Our students, I see Jose and a lot of our students, uh, he spoke very eloquently last night at the school board meeting about his meeting with Mr. Clayman. Our students have been asking us for a long time to have some kind of a system-wide recycling program, and when we met with Ms. Osiander and Ms. Johnston recently, we reiterated that. Um, we agree we need to be as efficient as we can, and the goal is to get started and then hopefully it will be more efficient and we can add other products if you will to the recycling effort and to keep building on that and that's really our hope over time okay and I just want to clarify the reason that I wanted to get this on the record is because I don't want the school district to find itself in a position where you come to us with a budget request and we look at you and say well why don't you cut something and you're really in a position where you have to begin to cut your resources around the recycling program. I think that what we're doing here this evening is making a citywide commitment. And with that, I think we carry the responsibility of making those funds available to you over time. So I just wanted to kind of get it on record, and I appreciate you taking the time to come out this evening. I have a couple other comments, uh, Mr. Go ahead. Chairman. Go ahead. Um, we'd, we'd, the preference is that everyone click in once and get their stuff uh, said and don't come back. Um, the, the, the other time. thing, and I know this is something that we've all worked on hard, and that is the issue of composting and really what to do with um, refuge, refuse from, the, from, hor from horses and from animals. And um, we received a letter this evening, it's been laid on the table, from a person who runs an organization that um, takes care of horses. On, and she indicates that her, her charges for, um, uh, for refuse costs associated with uh, horse manure and grass clippings has gone up 250 percent. And I think that um, I've heard some discussions where th that people who have horses are wealthy people and they should just be able to swallow these costs. But I think that when um, we look at all of our community, I think we make an effort to make people have fair costs associated with what they do. And we've worked to support pools. We've worked to support a variety of things. So I am happy um, to support this this evening, but I I want to work, and I know Ms. Osiander has had a real concerns about this. I look forward to working immediately with Ms. Osiander and with the administration to try to come up with a strategy to address um, the problem. Currently, the Evergreen site, which is a commercial site, and it's great to partner with um, the private enterprise, is $30 um, a yard, and um, and it turns out that at that cost, it, it is, it's, it's an increase of cost of 250 percent. So um, although it's great to have Evergreen there and we've got some other options, I don't think we've solved it. And I don't want to forget that this evening. And then I've got to, I'm going to just march through my list. Um, my next concern is that um, what we're approving tonight does not include um, a recycle, an additional recycle center drop-offs. And um, the initial proposal by the assembly, I mean by the administration, did include, I believe, three additional drop-off sites. And one of the, and I know we're going to be addressing some improvements in, at the Highland site, and I'm happy to support that this evening. I'm glad it's in there. But I want to point out that the area that I represent in East Anchorage has the highest uh, level of high density housing in, in the city, and those people living in those homes 
um, used dumpsters. And the way that this rate increase works is that it's going to be on commercial uses and it's going to be on fourplexes and high density houses because those are dumpsters. So those people living in those high density houses, many of in whom in my district are lower income people are going to be paying more for their trash and there's not an additional option for them. They are not going to get a curbside recycle program. They're, they're not getting anything for this extra amount of money. And so I'm, and I understand that a lot of this was done to meet the uh, needs of uh, Alaska Waste, and I think that the, they're a good partner, and I'm glad to do that. But I really want to call upon this assembly to, in January, come back and um, work to get a, an additional drop-off center at East in the East Anchorage area, ideally next to the hospital and the university, uh, who are great users of of materials and who are very interested to partner in us. I'm, I'm concerned that we've left out um, those people who are going to be paying this extra money tonight. And um, finally, I just have a little bit of a comment, and that is, is that um, this has been a hard work process for the community and for the assembly and for the administration. And what I would say is that we have an aspiration tonight that was really politically brokered over the last couple weeks, and we've done our work, but it's, it, I do have concerns, I guess, about um, us as a body and, and how hard it is for us to be transparent in terms of what um, we bring forward. And I think tonight that we've got an S version before the public that they've never seen before. So ideally, um, we'll work to, to, do, to have these documents available sooner and actually have these kind of negotiations when there's still an opportunity for public comment. That's all I have to say. I'd like my name added to this as a co-sponsor. I will support it. I think it's a great step forward, and I'm looking forward to further work on it. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief, and I know, um, Ms. Selkirk, thank you for your comments and kind of knowing that this is a great first step. Um, first, I want to say I know a couple weeks ago we had a very um, – passionate debate, I want to say, about the issue. And I want to thank the Assembly. Thank you, uh, Ms. Johnston, for your work and uh, others who have put their effort into making sure that this is a well-rounded proposal and recognizing that you grow into elements of the program. And this really does lay out, I think, a great step for us as a community in recycling. Along with this, uh, Randy Virgin and, and Mark Madden of our staff uh, really did a, a great job, and I, and I appreciate your comments as Assemblyman Johnston in regards to their work, because I know they spent a lot of time trying to answer the questions, do the financial modeling, as well as trying to figure out the utilization that might might occur or might not occur, and I think that is a, a, a great effort on their part, and I want to thank them publicly. But I do believe this, uh, for all the reasons that both Ms. Johnston and, and Ms. Selkraig have talked about already, that this is a, a great proposal and a step of recycling that gets us further down the road. and. A lot of this discussion has moved the private contractor uh, that's out there also in, in a much aggressive role, and I think that's a, a great statement on behalf of this community and for Alaska Waste, who uh, really has stepped up to the plate as a private uh, entity out there to really uh, bring recycling, what I would call full circle, for the whole city, almost the whole city. There's little pieces that are going to be difficult, but, but I think when we complement it with what we're doing here, what, what they're doing, I think Anchorage will no longer be one of those the last of the top 100 cities not to have curbside recycling and a very aggressive recycling program. So thank you to the Assembly for your work, um, particularly uh, Assembly Warman Johnston for your work and really pushing us to the mat to make sure we do the right thing here and making sure that when we crank the numbers out as we have done here that they're the numbers that, that work, are conservative in our first approach and see where it goes from here. So thank you very much for that. Mr. Chairman, I'm looking forward to seeing this pass. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Starr. Yeah, I'm, I'm optimistic and ever-present cautious, and we had the, the debate. So I, I have some, some questions, and perhaps generally they're just maybe issues raised, and, you know, I want to qualify. I, I do appreciate the need to do this. We, we need to go beyond just being a, a reverse logistics or a collection uh, model, however, which is essentially we're, we're collecting recyclable material and we're shipping it south and that that to me still doesn't address the the overall uh, use and reuse and responsibility we have as a society for all the stuff we ship up here 
uh, we need to be recognized uh, on what that also uh, means that now we ship it to the south. Uh, general questions, um, what we have in, in front of us is, is also um, a statement that says that a solid waste service disposal facility with no operational scales can charge. Are we anticipating charging for dropping off recyclable materials? Uh, through the chair, Mr. Starr, um, that piece is in all of our, our different rate schedules and it's simply in there in case our scales fail. I understand that you can do that in, in other places that do that, but does, if you bring a pickup truckload of recyclable material to the Rosewood facility and you don't scale it, um, are you taking recyclable materials for free and you intend to uh, under this? The Rosewood facility isn't our facility. It does Closer to your mic, please, so we can hear you. I, I said the, uh, the Rosewood facility isn't our facility, so we can't do anything about that. Okay. But as I said, it, the only reason it's in there is so that we can collect money at our facilities when our scales aren't operating. Okay. The direct question is, are we going to charge people no. to drop off recyclable no. materials? The answer is no. Thank you. <laughs> Any, anything else, Mr. Starr? I do have a couple Go ahead. points. We're going to turn our waste stream collectants over to, to uh, private companies, uh, Smurfit and uh, Alaska Waste, then have access to the recyclable programs. The municipality is not getting compensation for that. We're giving the revenue or the uh, waste streams to these, these providers. Is that kind of what's happening? At this time, that is correct. So they're going to just basically get what we give them. Some of it will be a separated waste stream. The, the products and containers we pick up out at Eagle River, for example, are broken down by the various commodities. but. Other programs will just have a mixed waste stream and we're just turning it over to these guys with no revenue back to the municipality. That, that is correct. They, okay. they are, on some of the wastes, they will be covering all the hauling costs from the collection point on. So well, I raised the issue on the freight. I raised it last time. I talked with the LPAR director today and, and we've got a sort of an in-kind arrangement on the outbound freight, which again, this product's initially collected, won't have much of a of a use locally. We're not grinding materials, we're not doing it more than sticking it back on the ships that brought us the packaged goods and now we're sending the packaging material back, if you will. The, the LPAR relationship spoke to about a thousand containers, if you will, that, that were compensated through the good natures of the service providers, Tote, Horizon, the others. We're out of that goodwill. Now, where does the freight get paid for, for the additional tonnage that we hope to generate here? Who pays for that? Hi, Mr. Chair, Mr. Starr. Essentially, the, the way the recycling material, when it goes into the private sector stream, when Smurfit Stone accepts that material, then that the freight charge above and beyond the donated barges becomes their responsibility. Have they said that to us? Yes. In writing? Yes. So we have a we have a, 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 an agreement, if you will, that says they're going to pay all the freight to the south. I can tell you that there's nothing on paper that commits the municipality to paying that freight. It's Murphy Stone's material to get south to their rent facility. Um, and it's just part of their, their economic model that, that that freight is part of the cost for that commodity, which has an eventual value in the marketplace. Even now, the goal, I mean, the long-term goal of, of this program is to bring the materials volume to, you know, to a greater number so that Murphy Stone can justify investment in okay. a sorting facility and, and, and here I'm in town. good with the next part, and okay. I don't want to cut you off, but I'm, I'm concerned that we're raising the rates for some local uh, needs, the commercial haulers per se. We're giving the revenue stream, uh, a, a potential revenue stream of selling the materials. I guess I just don't want to incur interim costs until we can get to that next model that you speak right. to. I think that's a noble goal, but I don't want to have, you know, essentially in the freight business, you transfer title to the goods and and the freight obligations become their responsibility. So we're formally transferring the, the waste product stream, if you will, to this group, and they're going to take over and pay the freight. That's right. Okay, thanks. I have a, a question about the model on the financials, um, and, and perhaps Sharon can speak to that. It wouldn't look like from the revenue models that you project for both for the collection of the solid waste services uh, model on the increased revenues that we're going to collect that we're going to win the recycling thing here. It would. Would it not make sense to you that the revenue stream would go down as the tonnage to the landfill goes down? And right now you forecast direct models of 990,000 for the next, beyond this will be a partial year, but for the next four years, we don't show a decrease in revenue collections 
as it relates to that. Now, if we're reducing the waste stream and the tonnage and, and, the, and the per ton drop-offs, why doesn't our revenue stream forecast to go down? Um, through the chair, my understanding of the model is that the increase in the tipping fee due to recycling has been calibrated mm -hmm. to include the impact of the offsetting tonnage that will be diverted as a result of recycling. But so in other words, in other words, it required an estimate of the amount of tonnage to be diverted, and after a year or so, it would be prudent to go back and look and see how close our estimate was to actual tons diverted. I guess, and that, you know, I see the economic forecast modeling here, and it doesn't reflect that, but I guess the measure of a program success is that, in fact, we're trying to encourage less products to go to our landfills. We make money based on the tonnage that gets dropped off the landfills, but yet our own program success modeling doesn't tell us that we're anticipating a reduction in costs either on the collection side or the other, so, or a reduction in the revenue. So how are we actually going to measure that, that we're winning on this one? If it's not going to be a financial reduction that we can measure because we're not collecting as much trash, if you will, what are we going to measure to win by? Through the chair, um, after approximately one year has passed, um, we could review the actual results and calculate two things. The first thing we could calculate is um, changes in tons deposited at the landfill adjusted for the impact of population growth, and additionally, separately, uh, evaluate um, the financial performance of the utility to make sure that the profits of the utility are neither too high nor too low. And so in speaking to that, in, in a sort of a benchmark or baseline, we don't know how much we're recycling now then, do we? Because do, do we know? Because, I mean, the here. landfill at, at uh, Eagle Mr. River, those have been Virgin, full Mr. all Virgin? the time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, Mr. Starr, I mean, the simplest way to measure the, the amount of recycling material that's going into that particular stream is simply the tonnage going through Smurfit Stone. Um, because there, again, that, that, that point of collection from all the drop-off sites in town end up there. Um, and it's about 2,000 tons a month. So really, we could work with them closely to know what, how their tonnage grows over time um, over the next year. In, in that capacity, we, we would just make the assumption then that because their tonnage grows, what, what I guess I'm wanting to make sure we have the implementation in place to know if we're getting anywhere on this. Because if the goal is to reduce the landfill, burden and do the social responsibility of, of recycling and reusing, how do we know through this model that we're going to win? If I saw a reduction in revenues at the landfill, whether that's a good thing or not, it would be an right. indicator that less tonnage is going to the landfill. That's certainly one but measure. You also, we're going to know, you know, the, the number of, of dumpster hauls from the school district and, and what that relates to in terms of, of material amount. And we're going to know what numbers of materials are hauled from the drop-off facility to Highland and any others that could get constructed in the future. Uh, you know, we're going to know all of those volumes, and so we can, we can easily track that over time. And, and then I guess the next is when, we, when do we know an economic break-even is reached to where we look at some of the other things, such as encouraging reuse or alternate uh, technologies here in our own state so we can benefit from that? How do, how do you I, know when I think we're getting our, there? I think our program needs to be working on development of new, you know, new markets for materials in state on an ongoing basis. I don't think we're we ever reach a point where we start doing that, I think we're, we need to do that now and keep doing that, absolutely. Well, just because I, I, don't, I don't like to spend a lot of time at the, at the landfill, I, I try to call it a dump, but that's essentially what people do is they just dump stuff off, and, and right. there's, there's all kinds of stuff out there. And I've, I've gone there, and it's, and it's well operated, well run, but we, we charge, for example, a tire disposal fee to any consumer here that buys tires, but yet we're filling them in our landfill, people are throwing them in our trash. Are we, are we looking at programs that penalize such, such as that in, in, in the use or to, trying to discourage? You look at Seattle markets, they're putting surcharges on uh, paper or uh, styrofoam cups, for example, plastic bags are being outlawed. I mean, are we looking to, to, to do selective, and I hate to call them taxes, but, you know, you look at the electronics industry that ships products up here in those monitors and their packaging requirements and all that. Are we, are we going after other revenue streams here as well because what I see right now is we're, we're hitting the commercials, we're hitting the individual dumpsters, and, and that's where we're, we're stopping. Where else are we going to get some more money to encourage? That's a great question. All I can say is my mind is wide open to suggestions like that. I mean, we're not proposing any particular, you know, item-specific or material-specific tax at this time, um, but I'd be happy to, to entertain 
Well, why, to talk about the additional revenue opportunities, why are we not looking at selling our revenue stream right now? I mean, our, our waste streams. We don't no. find that to be a value, or we find it equal trade in the freight. They answered that. It's a little of both. Mark? Smurfit, yeah. yeah, Mr. Starr, I'd, I'd just reiterate what Randy said. It's, right now, it's, it's not a, a, a very large pro margin, uh, margin of profit uh, as it is. I don't think that um, uh, there's much money that Smurf Smurfit Stone has got to end up available to share with us, if you will. Yeah, you know, I just want to make sure we're, we're keeping that available so that alternative users, we've got, we had some insulation folks that spoke to us a couple of weeks ago. I mean, are, are they going to be fighting to get commodities locally here? Or are they going to have to turn around and buy it back from Smurfit? You know, so I, I, I'm just speaking out loud. I appreciate the, the thing, but if we're going to truly promote and get into limited uh, relationships here with Smurfit, I want to make sure we continue to remember the other goals, which is to focus on, on that. So, you know, to answer the specific question, this gentleman that, that, that already has a viable industry making insulation out of recycled newspapers and that kind of product, does he have to now go buy that back from Smurfit? How does he get it from the city? He buys it from Smurfit. Uh, the best source for him are the drop-off sites like the Rosewood facility where it's a newspaper-only bin. <clears throat> and he'll continue to have that source as well as you know, newspaper Highland and any other drop-offs. And, um, you know, so while the curbside program is a commingled stream and it's not able to supply thermocool, I, there's going to continue to be those drop-off sites that supply him with the newspaper-only bins. Okay. Great. Thanks. That's all I have. Um, Ms. O. Sanders, next, I, I would note we have nine or ten people in the queue. So if everyone can try to keep their comments brief, I think everyone would appreciate it. This was a very hardworking committee. When I went to my first committee meeting and I first read the information on this, I was confounded by the things that were unknown. And I looked for some concrete forecasts on economics and plans. I um, have learned a whole lot, have talked a whole lot about this. So a particular thank you to Ms. Johnston and Mr. Virgin on that. The S version that you see before you is a lot closer, I believe, to dealing with um, forecasts that, that are concrete. There are still some educated guesses in there. One of the big ones, of course, is this impact on diversion that Mr. Starr was talking about. How do we really know what's going to happen as we move towards area-wide recycling? What is the tonnage that goes into the landfill going to be? So one of the things the committee talked a lot about was doing approaching this in a graduated fashion, dealing with it one part at a time and then looking back at it in a few months to be sure that those diversion costs were accurate and that we were capturing um, what the impact would truly be. There will be coming very soon another proposal that increases residential to the same um, level of commercial and my hope actually had been that that would be in April. I hear now it's going to be sooner than that. My hope it would be in April is because I thought by that time we would have more accurate forecasts on what the diversion would be and we'd know more truly what our cost would be. But the administration is, I think, somewhat justifiably concerned about not seeing any liability in solid waste services and that all revenue streams are adequately covered. One of I do have two pieces to this that I'd like to change a little bit. Um, one of them is on Let me just, just make sure. In terms of your comments, you're finished with your comments, so now you're going to make Well, then I'll make the comments, and then I'll make the That's Because I would, I'd like that you to finish your Thank comments, you. and then let's look at the Thank proposed you. changes. Thank you. Um, Ms. Duck, Ms. Sokrig talked about how this isn't available to the public. And it's my apologies to you, too, that you don't see the S version that we've been working on. But I have to tell you, um, we had a draft S version written a week or so ago, and it's been back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And I truly saw the final S version when I arrived here um, this afternoon. And one of the pieces that we were working with today, a matter of an hour or two ago, was about, again, Ms. Selkraig's point on the composting. And one of the other amendments I want to make is on that. 
The other thing that Ms. Selkrig talked about was the fact that this now calls for, um, in essence, one uh, transfer station and then potentially another later on if warranted. I want to bring to everybody's attention what Alaska Waste has proposed. They did put out a, a, press con a press release this last week, but I don't know if everybody's seen it. They're really, and the mayor alluded to this, they're really moving forward aggressively to citywide curbside. And I particularly wanted to show Ms. Selkraig the Muldoon area. <laughs> this, this whole yellow section there um, is now going to have curbside as a, a viable alternative for folks. This is going to, I think, really make a substantial difference. We don't know quite yet what that's going to do to the tonnage that goes to the landfill, but I want to applaud them and thank them uh, very much for the efforts that they've made in moving us forward in a positive fashion. Let's see, timeliness, area wine, okay. That's it. I just have the two little amendments, and I'll okay, hold on. Okay, go ahead that. and may propose those amendments. Okay, thank we'll you. Take them up. Um, if you look at the AM, there's a document that. And just so we're hold on, just so we're all on the same. There were two things handed out. One is 408-2008. One is 405-2008. 405-2008 is double-sided, and it is attached to the S version of 2008-62S. Are we working on 4005-2008? Well, I'm confused. The one I have says 408. Okay. Wait. Uh, Ms. Handy side. The same, aren't they? What are you Ms. Handy side, if you could clarify. I will defer to Mr. Virgin to explain the difference between those two. Thank you. They're the same. That's what I thought. Uh, right. Thank the you. So they're identical. The Even though there's different numbers at the first page, they're the, Cla the same thing. My clerical error. So we should be looking at 405, or I guess it doesn't matter. So when does it Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Can we have? Is the number we're working with 405 or 408? Let's work I know with, they're the same, but let's pick Let's a work with 405 because it's double-sided in the spirit of good recycling behavior, and it's attached, and it's attached to the AOS version. All right, but they are both 405. The typo right. is corrected. Isn't now it? they're both 405. That's right. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Coffey. Thank you. Go ahead, All Ms. Right. Oceander. Page two of three, number four. This is the section about composting. And this is the section where I swear we've had eight different drafts of this sentence swirling back and forth between various committee members and Mr. Virgin. My concern with the current language, if you read it, is that it appears that the staff is going to work with the nonprofits and businesses to identify municipal land. And I don't believe that that the intent is to have businesses help identify municipal land. So I believe that it would be more accurate to say municipal staff will identify municipal land that could be used as compost and woodlot sites run by nonprofits and commercially viable business. It just basically switches the, sentences, the sentence around a little bit. And I'd, I'd like to make that amendment. As I, I'll read it as I, I'll read the paragraph as it would stand amended just for clarification. Paragraph four would now read, municipal staff will work to identify municipal land that could be used as compost and woodlot sites run by nonprofits and commercially viable businesses, period. As appropriate. As appropriate. We don't object. No objection on behalf of the administration. All right. It's been moved. Is there a second to this amendment? It's been seconded by Ms. Johnston. Oh, it's, I'm sorry. It has been seconded by Dr. Selkraig. Uh, any objection to this amendment? Hearing and seeing no amend, objection to that amendment, that amendment is approved as to paragraph 4. Okay. Go to the next amendment, Thank Ms. Oceana. Um, as I mentioned, we will be seeing fairly shortly another change to uh, solid waste fees. And that will be to look at the residential side um, as to make it more similar to the commercial side. Part of the rationale for delaying that was to avoid a significant financial impact on private waste disposal companies who are covered by the Regulatory Commission of Alaska. They have data they have to present 
and they need time to get their ducks in a row. The other reason that, to my mind, this has been delayed is to get a more accurate sense of what solid waste services needs actually are. I would like to draw your attention to the first page of the ordinance number one, which is lines 25 through 29. This is a section basically that refers to pickup truck loads that go to either the landfill or the central transfer station. And this basically says that a pickup load is going to increase by a buck a visit. But it will kick in after April 1, 2009. My preference would be that we look at pickup truck loads when we look at residential service and we do it in a comprehensive fashion. I'm hoping that we'll know what our needs are and we'll be able to um, figure out what revenue should be generated all at one time and we'll be able to do it better a little later <laughs> than we do now. I also want to point out that just two months ago, we increased um, pickup truck loads by about 50 percent. It went from $10 to $15, and this would be another dollar on top of that. So that's, what, about a 60 percent increase for um, people who drive pickup loads of material to either the transfer station or the landfill. This point, is, point of order, Mr. A, Chairman. Could I? Yeah, I'd, I'd just like to know if there's a motion that's going to yes, proceed. Sir. He's about to make the motion. Thank you. My motion is that item one be deferred to be included in the residential proposal that we'll see, I'm assuming July, I don't know the date, but I've been informed it's coming by the administration. If the administration can, my understanding is the administration will be introducing the residential, the equalization of residential and commercial at the June 24th meeting okay. for action in the first meeting in July. So then I'll I second would, that motion. Thank you. Is that okay, clear it's, enough? It's been moved and seconded. That's, I, it's clear, I believe. Okay. It, it would, no, would, we would be taking item, item A, one. B1 would be basically getting moved for, basically added into when we consider the equalization of residential and commercial fees, which is going to get introduced on the 24th of June. It would be deleting it from the current. That's correct. Um, and limited to this issue, Dr. Sugarik has a question. Uh, I'm just interested in what the administration's comments on this, uh, on this proposal are. Mr. Abbott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Selkraig. The, um, we recommend the inclusion of this in the S version that's before you today. The purpose of the S version is to assess the recycling surcharge on, uh, on garbage rates. And it will set the recycling surcharge at $3 per ton or, and, as we propose, an extra dollar per pickup load. That's the appropriate allocation um, for the $3 per ton associated with pickups. We agree with Ms. Osiander's point that the pickup trucks did see an increase relatively recently. Um, at, at one point, the assembly was considering a 100 percent increase for most of the pickups. Ms. Osiander was supporting that. That has, the assembly did not agree with that and imposed the lesser increase. And so we agree that April is the appropriate time to assess that, to essentially build in a full year uh, at the existing rate structure before even the nominal dollar increase would take effect. But we think it's important that it be enacted now as a part of the recycling surcharges implementation. And that's why we've recommended its inclusion in this S version. And, and it was included in our original version of this ordinance. This isn't the first time we've proposed adding this at this time. And is this, it may, do I understand that this is an integral cost of the program, in other words, it's part of the overall structure that's going to make the recycling work. In other words, is this is this amount of money essential? That what we anticipate for this piece essential to the recycling program that we're yes. proposing tonight? Yes, we the uh, and Mark can correct me if I'm wrong because I've I have a hard time believing this sometimes in my head. But there are we get tens of thousands. Mark, I'm going to say hundreds of thousands of pickup trucks per year 
at the at the multiple facilities. Am I correct in the scale of this, Mark? That is correct, Mr. So yes, the short answer is even a one dollar increase that doesn't take effect until second quarter of 2009 will dramatically affect the cash flows of the for the recycling program. And it's an essential piece for it to pencil out. Is Absolutely. Okay? Thank you. Mr. Coffey, I think on this particular on this issue, issue, we're not using the queue on this particular issue, so if you want to speak to this or ask questions, please get my attention. What, what I don't understand, Mr. Abbott, is if, if we're postponing it till April of 2009, which is eight months from now, whatever, ten months, why is it essential that it be in here as opposed to being considered after this other ordinance is introduced on 24 June, so probably heard in July, in conjunction with the other uh, postponed rate increases until that period of time. I don't, I understand if you needed the revenue now, then you, maybe you might make it the August 1, like you've done with, with 2 and 3. But if it's that far off, why wouldn't you want to consider it with the other thing that's that far off? Well, it, it certainly physically can be incorporated in a subsequent ordinance. And, I mean, I'm not suggesting that procedurally there's any flaw. We're just suggesting that to maintain the continuity of assessing the, the recycling surcharge, that we do so all in one ordinance at what time. And that's the, the benefit of incorporating it in the S version that's before you tonight. Okay. Mr. Chairman, right. that second ordinance that coming is coming then is, is not directly tied to recycling. It is an adjustment associated with that rate increase we did back whenever we did it a year or four months ago, three oh, months ago. Is that correct? That, that's correct. Uh, in February, when the Assembly passed the last rate change right. for solid waste services, you, or you separated rate structures for residential can and bag service and uh, as opposed to commercially collected refuse. The this, proposal will be to equalize those and, uh, and not to assess the surcharge differently. Is that in any way related to this subsidy issue which was raised here a month and a half ago when this first came in of, of uh, one segment of the uh, public supporting or subsidizing a program that uh, – a recycling program? Or is there any relation between those two? No. No, we would not I, – I would not suggest that there's a subsidization issue. It's simply uh, um, uh, an appropriate rationalization of the rate structure um, by doing it in that time frame, you allow for the, um, the, the primary and any other residential collection entities to appropriately incorporate it in their rate structure. Otherwise, we'd be proposing it at this time. Is there any of that in B1? Do they need this? I mean, I wouldn't imagine with pickups. There's no reason to delay this because you don't have to go to a rate structure. There's no haulers. There's no... No, that does, it doesn't require uh, uh, any regulatory oversight or regulatory permission. We're recommending at the Assembly Committee's um, – it was their suggestion, and we've agreed that delaying the imposition of the surcharge on pickups mm -hmm. can take place in April without challenging the economics of the recycling program and to essentially buffer uh, uh, additional rate increases on that segment of the users. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Johnston, as chair of the committee, go ahead. You Actually, have to be um, to I, I don't see a problem as far as um, taking this out of the ordinance because in our April increase that we're looking at uh, for residential, we'll be addressing the recycling tipping fee on that at that time, too. So this could be addressed just like the residential. It's, it's, and we're not addressing the residential in this ordinance. Mr. Starr was next on the list for, as to this issue only. And it is. And I appreciate um, and I would ask support to, to remove it so we can ad adequately debate it again from the punitive nature that it may appear for the users in our area, in particular with the Highland uh, location. You know, mind you, we already have a, a fairly extensive collection recycle program out there with bins and stackings. We're only proposing by this to increase that improvement by $60,000. You know, my user group um, – has has already seen a five dollar uh, a pickup truck load in this last in this last cycle. Those rates just got posted, and that's probably the number one thing that I've seen on my emails in the last month, on the increased cost with that. So, to to just arbitrarily say another dollar is required for these folks that typically hit the recyclable facility, pay their fifteen bucks and dump their their non recyclable trash, 
it seems like you're market segmenting a, a company. We already have a recycle bin program out there. We're not getting anything more. We're just paying more. All right. So I, I would urge that, that you support that. Let us debate it again when we come back with a more appropriate residential rate. So if we can take it out, I think it'd be I think it'd be appropriate, regardless if it's in there as April first. I'd like to debate it on the merits of the increased cost for a reason, and not just because we can tonight. All right. Thank you, Mr. Starr. Anyone else on this particular topic? Not the whole, not the whole shooting match. Just this particular topic. Um, all right. I will. I will, we, we're going to put this up for a vote. I will. Um, I will just add my comment because I can see this is not one that we will have a unanimous vote on, and I'll tell you why I'm voting and how I'm voting. Um, as part of the discussions with the administration about the dollar increase for pickup trucks, it was originally proposed, and it was in both the original version of this ordinance and the S version, that there would be this increase that would be immediately effective. Ms. Osiander noticed it last night, and we, d we discussed it, and I talked with the administration. Her request was that we not have any pick increase for pickup trucks. I spoke with the administration. The administration explained that uh, having the dollar increase for pickup trucks was re reasonable in light of the fact that all other people taking to the dump were going to be paying. And there was a discussion about could they hold off until April 1st for the dollar increase, and they, were agree they agreed to that. We're going to be seeing the increase that brings the residential and the commercial fees equal that's going to get introduced at the next meeting, and we're going to be acting on it in July. This dollar is going to be there, and it's going to be part of the package. I see no reason to put off discussion of it, so I will be, I will be voting against the motion to delete this um, because I think it's going to get approved now or it's going to get approved in July, and so let's limit our discussion in July to the other items. So that's all on this. We'll go ahead and vote. State the motion, please, Mr. Chairman. The motion is to delete paragraph B1 from the S version of the ordinance, and that would make it feasible for that particular dollar increase to be incorporated into what will be introduced on, July, on June 24th. A vote yes removes it, and a vote no keeps it in the S version of 2008-S. So if you vote no, then you're going to vote on the dollar increase tonight. If you vote yes, you want to put it off till July. Mr. Birch? Mr. Coffey? Fails. It fails uh, six, six to five. Okay. Any other amendments? Ms. Osiander? No, sir. Okay. Next in the queue is Ms. Drummond. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I wanted to recall that uh, during the public hearing on this topic um, several weeks ago, the Smurfett Stone representative told us that when once our recycling stream was large enough, it would remain in the state for sorting and possible reuse. Um, but the objective here is to increase the recycling stream, so that's why we're doing this. Um, I have a concern regarding the amount of funds that will be directed to the school district. On page two of three of the Assembly Memorandum 405-2008, hmm. line 49, it says year one cost of the school district recycling is $151,000. The school district's memo that the school board approved last night details their first year cost is $246,591. I want to know if the committee took that into consideration. Um, and I need to know where the $151,000 came from, as it has no relationship to any of the previous numbers we've seen. I'll ask Mr. Virgin to speak to that first, and then if he hasn't answered the questions adequately, then we can ask Ms. Johnston on behalf of the committee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, Ms. Drummond. Um, it's a good question. I, I you know, it, I saw it myself when I reread this. The 151 originally came from our original budget for the schools, less the hauling costs that Alaska Waste has indicated can be wrapped into the garbage contract. <clears throat> However, in building our total budget for the first year of revenue, um, I realized that you know when we become effective on August 1st, we're only going to collect five months worth of revenue at the end of the year, and then we're going to start over again with the new fiscal year. The school district ever works on a school year budget, and so I basically went right to their chart. Or, um, that 
clearly details their first year costs and their ongoing costs. Uh, and George and I just talked about this tonight as well. And I'm, I know that we can do all of the material investments, the bins and the roll carts and a prorated amount for their staff person to get up and running right away with our $2,008. And then in 09, we can finish out that year one need with the 09 budget and continue forward from there. So it's really just a matter of calendar year, fiscal year, school year. Um, but absolutely, I've looked really closely at their chart of costs, and I know that we can, we can meet that need with this budget. Okay, so you're telling me that the school district and the school district is comfortable with these numbers? Because yeah. I, don't, I don't want them to think that they're going to get $246,000 for the uh, school year that's going to begin on July 1st and they're only going to get 151,000 and they won't be able to do uh, right again it's a matter of, of, of disbursement course. disbursement in August and disbursement after the first of the year so that for their first year we can meet their first year costs you know over that 12 month period but it's going to be broken into our 2008 and our 2009 okay. Mr. Chair I'd like to hear from the school district that that is acceptable That's fine uh, Mr. Vicalis Ms. Como Mr. Friedman looks like Mr. Vicalis is the guy that gets the short straw well, thank you very much. Uh, George Vicalis, Assistant Superintendent uh, for the Anchorage School District. Uh, if you, in, in talking uh, to the folks uh, when we first saw that number, I was a little alarmed. But basically, if you look at the phasing, um, and by the time we start getting someone hired, and by the time we place orders and everything else for the, the equipment to come in, uh, the phasing should pretty much um, be in line with the money source and then when the next fiscal year starts for the city and we get the rest of the uh, the uh, the monies to bring us whole then we'll be okay because it will take us some time for startup hiring and ordering anything else Ms. Drummond no thank you thank you Mr. Gutierrez thank you Mr. Chairman I am um I want to echo a few things I think that were said earlier, although I, I, I do want to disagree um, with, with some things that have been said here tonight. Politics, many folks have said, is, is the art of compromise, and, and I think rather than characterizing this as a great step forward, I'd call it a, an acceptable compromise. This is about as, as good, I think, as, as we're going to be able to achieve. But in any compromise, there are winners and there are losers, and there are some very clear losers in this plan and many of those losers happen to reside in the East Anchorage district um, if and I certainly do want to applaud Alaska waste for starting a curbside recycling program and we want to encourage that as best we can I think that's tremendous but if you happen to live in high density housing if you are an institution a business a nonprofit of some sort that uses a dumpster you're going to be paying higher fees and you're not going to get any benefit for that. Um, many times the, the folks in the high density housing are the ones who can least afford, one, to pay higher fees. Well, their landlords are going to pay higher fees, but certainly they're going to pass those along to their tenants. And can least afford the, what is it today, $4.20 a gallon for gasoline to drive to a drop-off site on the other side of town. What we have lost in this proposal is a drop-off site um, at a, at a yet-to-be-determined site somewhere in East Anchorage. And so I think clearly um, we're, the, we're the losers here. If you happen to live in a single-family home, uh, either in solid waste services area or uh, with Alaska waste, then, you know, you're going to have curbside, and that's great. And, and again, I want to encourage, encourage that as strongly as we possibly can. But I think it is important to acknowledge tonight that there are some real losers in this, but that is unfortunately the nature of compromise. Uh, I will be ultimately supporting this because I think it is at least a first step, if not a great first step, it is at least a first step. Uh, I have um, had some assurances from the administration that additional drop-off sites are a priority at some point in the future, and I certainly hope that's the case and uh, intend to Hold your feet to the fire on that and make sure that we revisit this in the future. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Coffey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, I'd like to just thank uh, the committee. Uh, you guys have been working, well, it's been for several months now on this and other issues related to this. And, and 
for me, it, the, the work that they've brought, and I've questioned particularly Ms. Johnston closely, you know, there's things here I say, well, what about, what about, what about? And I've had answers. They've been considered. Whether I necessarily agree with the answer or not, I don't know. But so much of the heavy lifting has been done by this committee, and, it, and it's very, very helpful to me. And given that, I'm, I'm really strongly inclined to support the work of the committee. Uh, that's one of the reasons I voted yes. Uh, I voted that we keep B1 in here because it was included as a result of that. So I think that's important. That's number one. Number two, I was a, a, a critic of the proposal that the mayor brought forth, I don't know, a month ago, because I didn't think it had been properly vetted, and, and, and I supported the continuation of this process through the amend, through the, uh, the postponements that we did. And I was most concerned with, with, with that we dealt with the school district. I was most concerned that we got drop-off sites in Eagle River and perhaps East Anchorage to come, and they're notified, and I agree with Mr. Gutierrez that, that it would be nice to be able to do that. It is in here, Mike. They're supposed to do it. It says so right in line 29. But the, the main thing here is, is we are the regulatory commission of Alaska insofar as solid waste is concerned. And, and to that extent, I think we have a duty and responsibility to do much more than we might do in other circumstances. We are somewhat ill-equipped to make these rate decisions, and in particularly in something new like recycling, it's very difficult to do it. One of the things I particularly like about this is the flexibility to allow this recycling to grow and develop. And as we learn things, we can make determinations of, yes, this is a, the way to go, or, or no, it is not. Uh, we can add, subtract, multiply, and divide. I think we'll be seeing much of this again, which is okay. It's a new program. I'm particularly concerned about what happens with shipping. I'm particularly concerned that we, as Mr. Starr said, we are shipping all of it out. It would be nice to use it here, the paper in particular. The glass is another thing. I'd like to see the school district move from just simply paper recycling to recycling other products and so on. But I believe this will grow and, and, and progress over time. So I think we fulfilled our duty as the Regulatory Commission of Anchorage for solid waste. Uh, and I think that I can fully support this in ways that I could never support what was previously proposed. I would note that basically we've reduced the cost and the scope of this program from $8 per ton to $3 a ton. That's a big reduction. That's five-eighths and whatever percentage that is, is a, is a significant matter. And for me, when we, when, we, when we work hard to keep costs down and set in place a program that has a good chance of success and a good chance to give us information and data that will allow us to increase our recycling, then that's good. I, I answered many emails on this, and one of the things I said is sometimes we say recycling is good, and, and that's a judgment that it is a good thing to do, and I don't disagree with that judgment, but recycling with a program that was not completely vetted and completely thought out is, is not good in and of itself. Now I think we've got to the point where we can say not only is recycling good, but we've got a program that will probably work at a cost that is probably reasonable given all the considerations that you folks in the committee have spent a lot of time and effort doing. So I'll support it, Mr. Chairman. And again, I want to I thank uh, Ms. Osiander, Ms. Johnston, and yourself for doing all the heavy lifting and the administration for working so cooperatively with you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coffey. Mr. Flynn. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be briefer. <laughs> I, I would also thank the Chair of our Recycling Committee, Mrs. Johnston, yourself, and Mrs. Osiander for your excellent work. Mr. Virgin and the members of the, of the administration, I appreciate that. I want to also take a moment to thank the dozens of community members who have been involved in this process, prodding, in this on, on, prodding us in this process, and who are here tonight. Thank you for that. And with that, I'll shut up. Thank you. Mr. Birch. I would just add that uh, I uh, fully support recycling uh, in our community. I think it uh, needs to be driven, however, by uh, the value and the reusability of the materials that we're recycling. And uh, I think the concern I have is that the, the cost that we're looking to pass on to the community, and this is basically a tax. I mean, we're, we're uh, granted that we're sitting as a utility uh, board here, but uh, it is a tax. Uh, the concern I have is uh, the increase that we have uh, proposed here is going to raise the, the rates on our, our property owners in the Anchorage area. Uh, we just increased the, the, uh, the tipping fee from $15 to $60 a ton. That's a, basically a 30 percent increase that just happened in April. Uh, and we just uh, we were looking originally at an $8 a ton increase here. 
It's been reduced uh, favorably to uh, $3. I still think that's uh, too much. I think, uh, uh, you know, we again, as a utility, I think uh, what we're doing here is we're just raising the tax and the cost of doing business in, in Anchorage. Uh, I think that there's a, a great private sector initiative here. Uh, waste management has done an outstanding job in, in uh, basically picking up the, the curbside initiative. I, I think it should be uh, funded uh, privately. I think that's uh, if there's a demand and support for those materials, then uh, so be it. I had heard today that there was uh, uh, perhaps a uh, 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 no demand for glass in the, and I just want it through the uh, through the chair to the administration to see if there's uh, any. Uh, lack of demand on glass. That glass, in fact, is, uh, I'd heard it might be uh, being shipped to a landfill rather than uh, being recycled. Uh, uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Birch and Mark can, can jump in and correct me where I, I get this wrong, but essentially um, we have a local, you know, glass is heavy and it's a problem for every community, not just Anchorage, but it's certainly a challenge for us because it, it just doesn't make sense to ship south because of its weight. So the extent that we can recycle glass in Anchorage is dependent on local reuse. We have an operator in town, a private sector business, that does have a glass crusher, and they have local markets for that use. My understanding is their machine broke down um, two or three weeks ago. And so during this temporary phase, while their machine is essentially being repaired, we're forced to reroute that gra glass to the landfill. Um, and Mark, I don't know if you have any more updates other than that. No? Okay. So it's, it's, that's, that's my understanding, and it's a matter of getting that machine up and running again. We, are, we have one operator and, um, exploiting those markets right now. So it's a fairly high likelihood that the glass that I dropped off last week is headed to the landfill then? <clears throat> it's possible. Okay. Yeah. Well, and that, that is my, my concern and my point. I think there needs to be a high value placed on those items. And I, I think that this, uh, you know, if, if there was a high value on the glass, it would be stored someplace. And I think that we as a community need to be very attentive to that we're not basically uh, subsidizing a recycling program that is, is trying to market something that doesn't really have value. Uh, with that, uh, I am not going to support uh, the additional surcharge uh, that's uh, represented here. Uh, I would support this if it was a zero surcharge, and uh, uh, with that, I'll uh, hope that we'll have an opportunity to, you know, maybe uh, uh, put this into a, uh, a different structure and uh, fund it through taxes as opposed to uh, this process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Michael is next in the queue. I, I would just note, with regard to the glass recycling, I think, Mr. Birch, you are correct that if you dropped it off last week, it, the glass probably goes to the dump. But my general understanding is that the glass recycler, if the machine isn't up and running today, it's going to be up and running soon. So what you dropped off last week might go to the dump, but what you drop off in about two weeks is most likely going to be get crushed and recycled and used here in the community. We have great faith, Mr. Chairman, in the private sector achieving that goal with their equipment. We're looking forward we to it. We believe in the private sector. Uh, Ms. Michael, you're next in the queue. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't have anything to say. I was just letting Randy use my... Oh, okay. <laughs> so he's clicking in as... as we're just not quite sure who, who's over there. Dr. Selkraig. Um, I have just a few follow-up things. One is that I wanted to check with Mr. Virgin that I understood correctly. So the way the school district budget uh, money will be available is that it was 151000 initially, and then the balance of that 246000 that they've indicated they need will be available in 2009. Is that how it's going to work? That's roughly correct. I mean, I'd like to encourage us to – I mean, we need to be a little bit flexible, and I think we need to work with the school district. I think, as George mentioned, it's phasing. It's getting materials okay. ordered, getting staff up and running. I'm fully committed to working very closely with them to make sure that they've got startup funds in 08 and continuation funds in 09. Okay, I just want to put on the record again, they've told us what they believe they need, and if mm -hmm. it's less, they won't spend it, I assume, and if it's more, we'll work with them. Is that what you're telling me? We'll work with them. Okay, thank you. And then uh, just a couple things that came up in the conversation. Um, there were some questions about um, the the ship back costs associated with if our volumes get too high. And if I remember correctly, Smurfick stood up there and said, when we begin to get our volumes too high, we're actually in a position where we begin to have value associated with the commodity and that they, at that point, anticipated that they would be willing to pay those charges associated with it. And that was, I believe, testimony that we received here. Also, over the many meetings we've had, we've heard from people who in town are, in fact, doing recycling and trying to work with the 
um, recycled materials in creative ways. And one of the things we've been told over and over again, it's an issue of volume, and it's an issue of separated volume, so that that gets back to this recognition of um, the drop-off centers and the value of having separated newspapers, the value of having separated glass. And ultimately, if our population gets large enough, plastics offer an opportunity in terms of recycled building, you know, they can be pressed into building materials. So, and the, the last thing, uh, two more things. One is that um, uh, we approved a, a initiative I brought forward a while back in terms of zero waste. And there are, a, there are numerous examples being used by other cities that would answer um, Mr. Birch's concerns and also um, Mr. Starr's concerns about what are some things we can do. And I'm, I'm glad to work with this body to look for the examples of ways that we can be smarter about not wasting ourselves. For example, the items for introduction that we throw away every week in our in our packets, you know, that we end up looking at in our next our next uh, packets. I mean, there's there's just hundreds of ways that other communities have already pioneered to save um, in terms of resources, and I think that speaks to the larger issue here, and that is that we are the only city of our size that doesn't have an in place. Um, recycling program, and it's really about positioning ourselves for the future and, and instilling within our community a sense of respect for the resources we have, recognizing that resources are increasingly more expensive and we are on an earth that has limited things to offer us. And so I look forward to this program not only as a way to recycle our trash, but for each of us to look at how we are living our lives and how we can position ourselves for a new world that's more respectful of the material things we have. So thank you. I'll be supporting it, of course. Ms. Gray Jackson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I sat here and I wrote a lot of notes because I had a little bit to say this evening, but I think that my colleagues have um, said enough for me and probably 10 other people. So with that said, I simply want to thank the administration, in particular Randy Virgin, for being available and answering all the questions and doing a really good job at it. And I want to thank the committee for all their hard work in, in making this come to fruition this evening. And I also want to thank the people and the public and the people that are here right now for coming out to see that this is finally really going to happen. And with that said, um, let's move on and, and vote on this. Thank you. Thank you. No one else is in the queue, but I will take the time as my practice to have the last word as chair, and I'll try to make it brief. Uh, I received a lot of criticism when I did not vote in favor of this ordinance or supported continuing consideration in May because I believed we needed to look at it more carefully and make sure that this proposal was both sustainable and viable. And I think the biggest plus on waiting was that as by the end of this year, by my calculations, 53% of Anchorage will have re curbside recycling available, and that is a huge win. There's still 47% to go, and there's a lot of different parts of the community that still need access to recycling, but, but compared to where we were two years ago, this is a huge, huge progress, and I applaud everyone that's been involved. Uh, flexibility is key. I think the proposal gives the administration a lot of flexibility to work its recycling program and work with the school district and others. Uh, I th also think this program is provided, allows more empowerment. I, one of the most, Im most interesting meetings I had and meaningful was when I met with a large group of high school students last week to talk about recycling in the schools. I see several of them are here today. Thanks for coming. And what was most noteworthy was realizing that by giving what, from our perspective, with multi-million dollar budgets are very, very small grants it really empowers them to succeed in the schools. And so if in the assembly memorandum, there's specific reference to what we call the small grant program that may well come not through the school district but may come from the administration uh, that will allow small amounts to go to the schools to let groups in the schools direct how that gets spent so that they can actually continue their efforts and get more kids involved and make this more and more of a community opportunity for people to be empowered and to succeed. Um, and I also look forward to taking up equalization about dumping fees uh, in the next two, next two meetings. So again, I'm pleased to support this. I appreciate the community's patience with us for taking time to make sure that we do a good job and get a sustainable and viable program. And I look forward to voting in favor of this and having finished my little 
bit I will ask, because I know that Mr. Birch is apparently going to vote against, ask everyone to vote. A yes vote supports this, a no vote does not. Passed. Passes 10 to 1. Thank you all very much. Uh, dinner is here. We're going to take our dinner break. Had a 31-minute dinner break, which is more than enough time. I never used to, but then I became the chair, and I do things like look at my watch too often. All right, um, we've got enough people to get going. All right, at item 11B, a resolution of the municipality of Anchorage approving the pump station 10 water improvements and providing for assessment of benefited properties. At time of service connection, I note there is also an S version. Second. It's been moved by right. Dr. Selcraig and seconded by Mr. Coffey. I'm sorry. We That's okay. We, as, I, as I announced before, it's the person that clicks in, and I'm announcing the person that gets on the computer. Can I suggest, Mr. Chairman, that we also say something when we click in? It, it's not happening consistently, and that's why I'm announcing who clicks in. It's, so we do, I think it's fine. We're, we're on to be. We're we're going on to be, under the S version 11B. Um, the public hearing on 11B is actually there was a move. Actually, Ms. Osiander, I think as a procedural matter, it would be a move to substitute the S version because on the 20th it was moved in second to approve the. All right. So. Um, any discussion as to the S version of 11B? Ms. Handyside, thank you. Uh, yes, the administration would like to request uh, postponing the public hearing until July 24th uh, due to some pending litigation. Ah. So actually, the, I actually think the public hearing is closed, but you can certainly defer consideration. July 29th would be the, next, the, late, the last date in July. That's the request? I, Mr. Chairman, I don't believe the public hearing was ever opened on this. Well, I'm looking at the old business sheet, and it notes that Pump Station 10 water improvements on 520 Ms. Osiander moved seconded by Mr. Coffey to approve AR 2008-100. Motion to approve is on the floor. Oh, we did. Okay. So do do? I'm just, I don't remember. I'm reading my cheat sheet. It was postponed. Brian, do you, how would you like to move forward? I have no problem continuing deliberation until late oh. July. Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, my name is Brian Boss. I'm with the Anchorage Water Wastewater Utility. Mm -hmm. um, we last, uh, the, the last time this was before the assembly was on May 20th, 2008. There was no public hearing due to uh, um, our receival of affidavits from all the affected property owners uh, affected by this project. Um, we're requesting that we open a public hearing on the 24th because of the pending litigation. 24th of June or 29th of July? June. Um, we would like the uh, participants of the litigation that are affected to be able to comment at that public hearing on the 24th if that's possible. Uh, so I. Mr. Chairman, I think I can clarify a little bit. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Abbott. When this was originally introduced, there was no opposition from property owners. As a result, it did not require a public hearing. And as a result, there was a motion on the floor. 
at that time, we became aware that there was concern from property owners, the litigation and other issues that are out there now, which means it does require a public hearing. So that is the request you have before you, I believe, from the utility, is to set this for public hearing on June 24th. All right. And a question I have is, given the, pen, the, given the fact that there's pending litigation, uh, why are we doing it this rapidly? Why aren't we taking it up after the litigation is concluded? Um, Boss. <clears throat> currently, the, um, there was a ruling on May 24th that has since been appealed. So we anticipate this litigation going on for quite some time. Uh, there's only one possible outcome that would affect the assessments on this project. So really all we need to do now is talk to those parties that are affected with that one possible outcome and give them a chance to comment. Okay, so that's all right. Mr. Birch is in the queue. Go ahead, Mr. Birch. <clears throat> I believe we already had a public hearing. I mean, I remember people coming down and talking to us about this. And did was it was it the issue that somebody neglected to attend the public hearing? Or uh, no, it didn't require a public hearing due to AMC 1990.010B4 uh, because we had received all the affidavits from the property owners affected. There was no need for a public hearing. There was just an action by the assembly. Um, because of the possible, there's there's one lot involved with this that there's question over the ownership of that lot. Uh, although we have the affidavit for the lot that's currently listed from that owner, due to the litigation, there may be another number of possible owners. And uh, because that lawsuit's still unresolved, we've kind of done an analysis and we found out who those possible owners may be um, and we would just like to give them a chance to comment. Oh, so this is something you've initiated? Uh, AWWU has initiated. The lawsuit was initiated by property owners in dispute of the ownership of the property. Okay. But we've decided it's, it's better to, you know, it's better to notify everybody and give everybody a chance to talk. And, and the people that may be affected by the outcome of the lawsuit, we would like to give them a chance to voice their opinion on this. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Gutierrez. You might as well stay you. because you may have some questions. I just wonder if, if the clerk would confirm, do you concur that we didn't have a public hearing on this? Because I distinctly remember testimony on this. And, Mr. Chairman, I remember you declaring a conflict on this issue. Is it possible that it was an appearance request that I'm remembering and not a public hearing? But I do remember hearing testimony on this issue from one of the, the, the litigants. Okay. This is the... This is the answer, which is why you are, your memory is 100% accurate, but I think you're right with the memory, but you're wrong about the date. I declared a conflict as to pump, t pump station 10 issues in April when there, were, there was t testimony about pump station 10 that was declared that I did not have a conflict and that I was ordered to participate. And that, I'm certain, occurred in April. I may have made reference to it in May when this was up, and based on the saying I was going forward. But we have... The short answer on Pump Station 10, because it's in my neighborhood and it's been coming up in front of the Assembly for months ever since before I was on the body, is it's been up many times and it keeps coming up. And so your memory that we had public testimony is accurate. I can't tell you whether you heard that on, on May 20th when it was last moved or whether that was in an earlier date. I think as a procedural matter, the best way we can approach it, because the, the affected utility is interested in having a public hearing rather than trying to resolve did we in fact have one or not. My preference is I would be happy to entertain a motion to to set a public hearing on the 24th, regardless of whether we had one before or not. So moved. Second. I just moved. Second. Point. Okay. This is what I wanted. I just, I just okay. This is what I'm going to ask folks to do about moving and seconding. I had an idea tonight which people don't seem to like. Don't announce what you're doing on moving and seconding until you've managed to get the button pushed because it is hard on the clerk if Smith says move and Jones punches the button first. Make sure you actually show up in the bottom corner as the mover and the seconder before you speak. Who's the mover and then you just deleted me? Point of personal I, privilege. I'm expressing. If I could state my point. Yes, go ahead. Could we fix it then because I'm unable to make any motions with the buttons? Yes. That's all. 
Okay. As to the, as to, hold on, as to the pending motion, there was a motion made to schedule public hearing, and by the buttons, Mr. Coffey moved and Mr. Gutierrez seconded. I, I'm reading the screen. Mr. Co Mr. Co she didn't. She, I was first, but it's okay. It doesn't matter. Okay. It was Mr. initially Chairman, moved. Mr. Coffey. Your suggestion that we don't speak until we push is a problem because we're all trained I to agree. speak. And the problem is, is that perhaps we shouldn't push speak the button. Speak into your mic, Mr. Coffey. But the clerk should push the button for those who speak because there we seem go. to have a race to That's this That's a thing. great idea. Anyway, but on this, Mr. Chairman, can I ask right. a question? Yes, let's go ahead, Mr. It's, Mr. Coffey, make Thank sure your mic is you. on and make sure it's in front of you. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry? No, I'm Michael. talking to my mic. Pull it, pull it over so it's right. more towards Am, us. Is it? <clears throat> That's good. Thank you. No, okay. Thank you. If there is litigation, will the public hearing resolve it? Uh, no, the public hearing won't resolve the litigation. Um, what it is is between the two parties within that litigation, only one of them is there a possible outcome for assessments. So regardless of the outcome, we already know the possibilities of who may be affected by this project. And right now all we need to do is just kind of notify them of the public hearing if that date's set today and allow them that chance to voice their opinion. So, so what you're telling me is this project will go forward regardless, and you'll either assess 10 people or 9 people, depending well, on the results of the – because I'm wondering why adopt it if there's litigation that might change it. Uh, the litigation won't change it. What we're, what we're trying to do is allow the parties that may be affected, based on the litigation, a chance to speak. Uh, Mr. Coffey, you, he's not fully answering the question. I'll, what we, the action that I believe we took in April on this matter was we gave the assembly or the administration taking authority to take the property, recognizing that the court would later decide who we were actually taking it from. And so that's the issue in court is who actually owned the pro owns the property that's being taken. And so to some extent, the project going forward isn't going to be affected by the court now ruling. I understand. It's litigation between those two not litigation over the project itself. Exactly. Do yes. we pay Mr. Smith or do we pay Mrs. Jones? Right. Fine. I understand now why we can have a public <laughs> Okay. Uh, Dr. Selkraig is on the queue. Mr. Starr. Does our action tonight um, influence the, the outcome of the courts? I mean, are we being negotiated into this, for example? No, it does that, not. Well, I guess my point is that is potentially we could be, for examples, that an S version can still be introduced. And so I'm concerned that by our actions tonight on whatever that may be, that you know, we're sort of being brokered into the litigation as an opportunity to kind of mediate the dispute. And I'd, I wouldn't want to go there. I think it's inappropriate. The, the only thing that this resolution is doing is, um, is notifying the, the potential property owner that when they connect to the water or sewer facility, they will have to pay a certain dollar amount for the cost of construction of that facility. So approving this assembly resolution won't affect the outcome of the litigation, but what it will do is notify the potential winners of that litigation, what charges they may be impacted by if they so choose to hook up to our facilities in the future. The next question is through the chair is what, what good will hearing from those litigants at a public hearing do to, to our decision making? I mean, I, I'm unclear as to what they can actually bring to the table after it's been litigated that is going to impact my opportunity and are we opening up a, a debate that is only between a couple people and your broker and an opportunity to address the assembly do you, for us. So what, what's actually going to be solved here? Can you, can you answer that question or do you want some uh, allegedly trained attorney to respond? The, <laughs> the only thing that will be solved is um, you'll be notifying people of the charges that may be occurred. Why don't you do that? I mean, I guess not to be so blatant, but what difference does it make if we weigh in on that action? It puts the burden of the decision onto us as opposed to the litigated outcome. But this so. assembly process is our method for doing that. 
Well, I, we already followed the assembly's procedures up to this point, which was to, to move it to this point now. So to come back and ask us to reopen the public well, hearing based on some future outcome, I'd be more comfortable postponing our action tonight as opposed to weighing in on. And it's my judgment, but I, I'm not uh, trying to beat us to death. I understand Mr. Abbott may have a response to the question. Well, Mr. Abbott, I'll, I'll call you on order to let you respond to this question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Starr. Uh, affected property owners uh, by this type of assessment role have a legal right to a public hearing before the assembly unless they choose to waive that through this uh, release, essentially. All the property owners that AWU knew about prior to the litigation beginning signed such a release. And so a public hearing wasn't required nor held. I'm, I, I think I'm about 99 percent sure you haven't held a public hearing on this matter in the past. Since that uh, it, item was introduced, we became aware that some of the property, one parcel, the ownership of that is not completely resolved. We, there's been a decision by the court, but it's going to be appealed apparently. So there's a risk that one person might be a, end up being a property owner, and that person has not signed that release, which waives the right to a public hearing, and therefore they could challenge this assessment if they ultimately take control of the property and they get levied on an assessment, they could claim at some point later in the future, geez, two, five, ten years from now, and say, wait, you can't levy my assessment because I never released you from the public hearing opportunity, nor did you hold a public hearing. So in an effort I, I, I mean, I think it's a relatively safe assumption that this is going to be a non-event of a public hearing. So the request at this point is simply to schedule it, um, give perhaps this one person a chance to come forward and uh, argue about a, an assessment they may or may not ultimately get, and then move forward from there. That's our recommendation. I think that's the cleanest way to move it at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Birch. Okay, the question's been called. There's also no one in the queue. Uh, the motion on the floor is whether we should have a public hearing on this matter, regardless of whether we had one before, whether we should have a public hearing on this matter on June 24th. Um, I will ask if there's any opposition to public hearing on June 24th, and if there's opposition, we'll put it on the screen. There is opposition. Okay, uh, we'll go ahead and start voting. A vote yes means that we have a public hearing on June 24th. A vote no means we do not hold a public hearing on June 24th. And I would presume that means we go forward to consider this. Please vote. Mr. Birch? Ms. Osiander? That passes. Passes 9 to 2, so that we will have a public hearing on this matter on June 24th. That brings us to matter AR 2008-101, a resolution of the municipality of Anchorage. Alaska, approving the pump station tent upgrade, sanitary sewer extension, and providing for assessment of benefited properties at time of service connection. And I would note that according to the, where we stand presently is that the, the not the 2008-101 has been moved by Mr. Coffey and seconded by Ms. Osiander. Motion to approve is on the floor. Uh, All right, so Ms. Osiander moved to substitute the S version and Mr. Coffey seconded. Is that correct? Okay. Um, and is administration where are, is this the same thing you want a public hearing on the 24th? Yes, we would request that you set this for public hearing on June 24th. All right. Is, that, is there a motion to do that? Mr. Moved. Coffey's moved and a second. Ms. Gray Jackson. Thank you. Uh, any discussion as to the motion to have the public hearing on the 24th? No one's in the queue. Uh, I'll again ask if there's going to be any opposition. I see no one, so that is approved unanimously. We'll take that public hearing up on the 24th. Thank you very much. Thank you. That brings us now to 11D, Assembly Information Memorandum 41-2008, the Aquatic Subcommittee Report. I believe there are uh, two people connected with the Aquatic Subcommittee who are here to answer our questions. And uh, I think there is a motion to ex accept is on the floor, so no, no action yet is needed. But I, if people have questions for these folks, please get in the queue. 
Mr. Starr. And please tell us who you are. Uh, I'm Peter Crosby. I am co-chair of the Aquatics Committee and, like Eric, uh, a, a member of the Parks and Rec Advisory Commission. And, and I'm uh, Eric McCallum, the same status. Okay. Mr. Starr. We, we've actually spoken, emailed, and, and I appreciate the ability to come down and answer some questions. I think trying to keep the momentum on the people for pools and all the things here with the recent bonding and the recent state monies is helpful, but I'm still a little bit confused on, on uh, now that we've sort of garnished the rate increases, we include, increase family passes. This body did last meeting. We've increased revenue streams. We've had agreements with ASD. Now, from the aquatics perspective, what are these folks and user groups actually getting for their money? Uh, what, what are we going to do now? Um, and I'll, I'll start you off with the one concern I have is that your memo that speaks to us, which is dated today, by the way, really good work on getting that to us, but it gives us a summary of the topic and then it tells us about a status report. The body may not have it because I'm not sure that, that they all got it printed from their thing, but you talk about work on the five pools being covered by the bonds is being performed in two or three years uh, time frame, and we heard some of the concerns were sort of immediate structure problems and that. So I'm, I'm leading a question to you is that how, how do you guys see this report? You don't tell us who's going to decide the work plan, and you don't also tell me now we're increase the fees. What are they getting today for increased fees and, and taxpayer bond? I guess I'll have to hold it up. Um, just, just a point of clarification, Mr. Starr made reference to some sort of a written document that was dated today, and I don't have that, and I'm not sure other members on the body have that. Um, I sent it uh, via email on Sunday to all of you. I, don't, I, I have a copy of it. For, so you have extra copies? Yeah, I do. If you could uh, pass them up here and we'll get them distributed. What it is is an updated version of the report that you had before, before you previously. It takes into account events that have occurred uh, since the first report was prepared. It seemed like a wise thing to do because it was quite outdated and we've had a lot of significant events, as Mr. Starr indicated. Um, fee increases largely were driven by uh, an effort to bring charges in line with the fee policy that had been approved by the Parks and Rec Advisory Commission and then subsequently by the Assembly. Uh, in order to have a greater percentage of cost recovery from the users. So in a sense, they're not getting more for necessarily for their increased fee, but they're bearing uh, a greater proportion of the expense, but something that's not unreasonable both in their eyes and in the eyes of, of Parks and Recreation. I've been involved in negotiating the fees. Can you speak to the two to three year time frame on the, re, on the rebuild of some of these facilities? On the rebuilds, that is, I think, what needs to be anticipated given the late date that the money became available. Some work is going forward at service this summer, but it's my understanding that it's using capital fund or capital project funds that were made available previously. It's not bond or state matching money that's being used on the liner and the electrical lighting. That can go forward now before the other money is received. So can I just interrupt you for a minute and ask the administration, is how, how is it going to go forward? Is, does PM&E get involved here now, or, or who's going to facilities maintenance? Or Facility maintenance will be running the project. I believe it will go to bid, if it hasn't already, it has. quite shortly. Um, and if we do expect to do this. It, it uses the, um, the annual allocation of facility maintenance funds uh, that's generated, it's the same source of money, the 101 funds that we were talking about earlier for facility maintenance. Mm -hmm. A piece of that will be used to fund the service high pool uh, repairs that, uh, that uh, you just heard about, the liner and some of the electrical fixes. Um, the larger fixes for those and other pools will require the issuing of the bonds and the receipt of the state grants. I don't believe any of that money will be expended in 08. I believe those projects will be done in 09 and 010, and we'll phase them so that we have, we don't impact all five pools at the same time. 
and that we maintain as much service as possible during those improvements. So do we, would you expect to see that in a capital budget program, or where will those actually appear for us to see the progress made so that when people ask us, we can tell them what's happening? We'll, we'll be glad to provide you with, by the end of the summer, uh, a, a timeline for all the pool repairs that are uh, projected with the $4 million of state and bond funds. Okay. And then without, you know, this wasn't a grilling necessarily, but a question about um, management, and we've seen it at several levels. At the budget, for example, it references a, a funded, several funded positions for aquatics managers. And you talk about in your, in your latest memo, uh, I think it's number, um, uh, talks about a, a personnel restructuring. Um, I think it's number three here, where restructuring the aquatic staff to be more responsive and save money at the same time. How are we saving money and being more responsive? And do we have aquatics managers? When I see management, I look at operational leadership and things that that percept, you know could be an adequate solution. Now, are we funding the aquatics positions? not funding them, or what are we doing with the money? Well, what's gone on, it's a mixture of, of concerns. I know there, there had been a problem with staff vacancies and concern about positions having been funded but left empty. What's happened with the reorganization is that the management structure has been streamlined the number of, as it were, frontline service providers has been increased. Uh, as a matter of fact, the uh, the number of lifeguards, number of lifeguards positions has gone from 36 to 55. Now, in part, that's because there were fewer full-time jobs. More part-time, they'll be filled by college students, high school seniors who are qualified for the position, but they're going to be cheaper for the municipality to employ. Yeah, and through the chair, if I may, Ms. Weddleton, we have PCN numbers assigned to aquatics managers and in, in, in that. Now, have you seen changes to PCN numbers that have said we're, we're, we're doing away with those positions and now we're hiring four or five others? Have you done those changes? Through the chair, um, I learned of this topic today. Mr. Dillon and I have spoke about this topic, and my understanding is that the nature of the changes to the organizational chart are focused primarily on changing the job grade of existing positions. So as an example, you might have a PCN that was previously uh, given a grade of 10, uh, but it is upgraded to a 12, and that person becomes the pool manager, whereas this, another position is downgraded. So you achieve a pyramid-shaped organizational chart in order to achieve operational efficiency. Okay, so the question is, is have, we at, have we actually staffed up then, or are we, we, is this a plan that we're, we're trying to staff up? I mean, we're, we're looking to provide solutions to the public users is that, you know, we've got this under control, we've got the funding, the budget was approved in December, now, are we there yet, or are we getting there? What, what's the observation from you guys as a committee recommendation here? Well, based on what I'm, I know, Mr. Starr, we're in the process of, of getting there. The uh, number of managers has been reduced from four, pool managers has been reduced from four to two. One of those is a working manager who also serves as a as a lifeguard, and this is where some of the savings come into into play, and then the creation of the additional part time positions, and they're in the process of filling those. I believe that the total number of positions that are going to be in the budget is 58, and at this point. That's when they're completed. At this point, 50 positions have been approved or in, or in the process of being established. And 40 of those positions are filled right now, and nine are in the process of being upgraded or undergoing back, or applicants are undergoing background checks. So there's actually, in a sense, only one vacant position at this point. There are additional 
positions that are going to be created. Will that allow us to extend the hours? And I'm speaking freely here rather through the chair, but we're, we're going to gain some of the concerns that we had with the packed house was, was operational days and, and operating time frames and, and sort of Certainly. some of that staffing wasn't in place, so we couldn't keep the pools open because there's the no greater, lifeguard. The greater the number of lifeguards, the, the greater the number of lifeguard hours are available, even utilizing part-time personnel. If you have more lifeguard hours, you can have more open pool hours. It's, uh, there's a direct correlation there. The more pool hours you have, the more hours you have to spread your more or less fixed costs of operation over. Utilities, uh, maintenance, and when that occurs, then your cost per hour goes down. Right. So that you actually, we may be able to hit a point at which the percentage cost recovery on a fee structure is such that fees don't have to go up anymore because we've increased revenue by being open more hours. We've decreased the cost per hour by being open more hours. Well, and building enhancements. So I'll, I'll just close it, but I, I felt, you know, there's no action required from us tonight. It was basically accept the report, but it was such a critical item that I felt that just the status update that you brought us tonight indicates that we're getting there. I'd like to know, again, from you guys maybe in the next three or four months what else we can do from the assembly body. Um, I, I'm a little leery to keep raising revenue sources and raising rates because that's never the right answer always, but the solutions that you put here with the marketing representative, you, you talk about revisiting that. So as, as you can, perhaps maybe just shot it down to give us another report in maybe four months or, or whatever is appropriate. Absolutely. And, and let, let me assure you, the committee is very well aware of the fact that simply raising rates is not a solution to anything. It's a guarantee of failure for the pools. It's, we've been down that road before. So we're very sensitive to that. The real trick is to have reasonable rates that people can afford, good services, and to market the heck out of the pools so that the people are aware of the programs and show up to take advantage of them. Then we're going to be successful. Well, one, one of the clever things that staff did, I, I'd like to just intersect here, is that because we, we have an abundance of hours, so we, we have room to offer more services, like for open swims, which is probably one of the more popular um, a session was what used to be an, an, an hour and a half, and now it's moved to two hours, uh, but still holding the fee the same. So effectively, they actually get a reduction if you look at the time they spend. And so, because that's that's one of the things that we can give up is we can give up some time uh, in the hopes of of. Uh, but we, we don't want to give up any revenue. Yeah, well, we heard the open swim hours though were frustrating to some folks that had to drive past their pool to go to another pool that had different hours. So, you know, I appreciate the extra time to, to swim more for the money, but the operating hours was where I was headed was sort of to get those early morning swim hours for the teams and people that criticized us for not addressing the ability to use the pools more, not just more for their money, but a bigger day, if you yeah. will. Yeah. Well, you know, at 37, I mean, our cost recovery is only 37 cents on the dollar. So it's... I don't. I don't see it so much that they're having to pay more. I see it there. They got a great. They've been getting a great deal all along, and 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 now now we're just making it more well, par. Well, I appreciate the statement we're getting there, and, and I, I'm optimistic. I, I thought appropriate to revisit that. So thanks for the time uh, to, to to come down here, and thanks for the liberty to address this report more formally, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Starm. Is or Dr. Selkrig. Um, I want to uh, thank you for the work you've been doing. Uh, I know you're both volunteers, and this has taken a lot of time. And I'm really impressed with the progress you've made. Um, I'm particularly pleased to see that there's some discussion about making swim classes um, part of the curriculum for the, the high schools. It's something that was just required in seventh grade and eighth grade when I grew up here. And it's the reason I swim, and it's the reason I currently swim at these pools. And the extension of hours, I think what it does is it allows people who are only going to swim for 40 minutes um, a little more time so you get there more often. In other words, it, it works better, and particularly on the weekends, it's wonderful. It gives you a little bit of extra leeway. So I think you may be attracting more people because people can fit it in easier. Um, I, I, I guess uh, oh, one thing I wanted to suggest, it's a thought, I know you're working on many things, is that I know that swimming is a critical issue for the state. And it might be wonderful, and I mentioned this a long time ago, if maybe during AFN, um, we could offer that through the school, the school pools, um, some swimming lessons. There's a youth day 
that you know precedes the regular AFN uh, period, and then then I think those youth kind of break up and they're in and out of AFN, and it would just be wonderful. I mean, there's a chance that we could save some lives because um, there is not an opportunity to, win to learn to swim in rural Alaska. Uh, unless you're swimming in pretty cold water. So that's just an idea. It's not an expectation. The other thing is that I just want to, I guess my patience as a citizen and as an assembly person is wearing in terms of our expectations around parks. Um, I more and more believe it is not an issue of money. It's an issue of priorities. And I always go back in my brain, and I, I actually want to do something about this, that when we, if, when we reviewed fantasies, we found out that we were subsidizing fantasies at $160,000 a year in terms of police um, calls, increased police calls beyond what they paid for in terms of their taxes. You know, so that, and, and, and so we have those kinds of realities in this community. And for some reason, we're vigilant around parks. We're vigilant about people playing cards. We're vigilant about little leaguers that have to have to mow and put. And, and I'm looking at Jeff, and I know this wasn't Jeff's idea. It's the expectation that some, for some reason, the parks are the thing that have to pay for themselves. And I think that you know, as we look at our children and as we look at the health in the community, that this is more of a discussion about what do we want to be as a community. And less and less do I think that these parks have to pay for themselves. I think what they need to be doing, and I think we as a body need to think of them as an asset that really supports community health. And, you know, when they become an issue of agitation where, you know, we've had, we've had one user in here after another just aching at the fact that they have to do so much work to use our parks. And, you know, this issue of reasonable rates, well, when you look at what's going on in the economy, what is a reasonable rate if you can't afford to pay for your gas? What's a reasonable rate? There is no real reasonable rate for parks. They're public parks all over the world. So you're hearing me rant a little bit. Um, but. You know, it would be my goal to see us move away from this expectation that parks pay for themselves and make a commitment that we're actually going to pay for our parks and we're going to recover those expenses um, that are hanging out there elsewhere rather than at parks. Thanks for letting me rant a little bit. All right. No one else is in the queue. Any opposition to acceptance of this assembly information memorandum? I hear and see none, so that's accepted. Thank you. That brings us you. to item 13A. Uh, AO 2008-15, an ordinance amending Anchorage Municipal Code Section 21.10.028, 21.15.015, and 21.15.030 to give the site plan authority over certain developments to the Urban Design Commission. Move to uh, approve. Uh, Mr. Covey has moved and Mr. Flynn has seconded. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Covey, you can speak Thank to the you, motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to move to postpone till. Uh, June 24th, and at the same time, a second motion will be to reopen the public hearing. Actually, the clerk is reminding me that it's that we were on for a public hearing and not for. Oh, we're right. Haven't held the public hearing. These are continued Sorry. public hearings. I'm mistaken. Yeah. Um, Pardon me. But actually, before we before we take that up, uh, what I would entertain is a motion to continue the public hearing until July 15. Okay. I move. Ms. Osiander? Yeah. Mr. Chair, we have actually already amended this, so I'm confused. Okay. I, well, why don't we let me get the motion, and then I, I'll have Mr. Coffey and Ms. Drummond speak to the motion, because I asked both of them to look at this issue uh, because of questions that were raised, and so I want one of them to speak to the reason for, for taking it up on July 15th. I, I don't I. But there are other issues. Well, there's. Fine. Let's. I okay. Want to be clear. So, uh, there's been a motion moved, and is this the motion to continue the public? This is a continued yeah. public hearing per our right. agenda, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Yes, absolutely, Mr. Coffey. Go ahead and speak to the motion. Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I misspoke. What we need to do is, we if we want to continue the public hearing, we need to move it, and I would so move. Right. But if as you know, the practice is if there's someone here who wants to testify, right. we allow them tonight. So my motion is to continue it, and you said until July 15. That's my understanding from speaking with Mr. Nelson that July 15. That's gives. fine. July 15 is the motion. All right, and it's been seconded by Dr. Selkraig. Uh, I will, to the extent there's anyone here in the audience that would like to speak 
to uh, this motion, this issue now, rather than come back on July 15, we will, I will let you speak to us now. I don't see anyone coming down, so, so anyone that wants to speak will certainly have the opportunity on July 15. Mr. Coffey, if you could speak to the reason for the, yes. for continuing the public here. And, and Ms. Drummond and I worked together and we met with staff. And so briefly what we did is we have an S version coming. And the S version changes this to the degree that some of the issues that were brought up in the first debate are resolved. M Mr. Nelson is here if, if anyone wants to know the particulars of that. But we believe we've achieved a better result the goal being to lighten the duties and responsibilities of the Planning and Zoning Commission because of their workload and, in, and, in cre and allow the, you know, the Urban Design Commission to deal with it, but predominantly only with public facilities. That's what the S version will say. And if we have an opportunity to put it off, we could allow that S version to be done. We could allow the staff to talk with the Parks and Rec Commission, which is one, talk with the Urban Design Commission, which is another, and then bring it back before us with more information and a different approach. And so the anticipation will be that those, that both the Parks Commission and the Urban Design Commission will have uh, weighed in and said that they support the proposed changes that yeah, you and Ms. Drummond have agreed as a sensible approach in, com in collaboration with Mr. Nelson. That's correct. Okay, Ms. Osiander, you're next in the queue. We made one amendment last time, Mr. Coffey. Yes, we did. We changed it to 50,000. Is that continuing? No. We'll Not see. in the proposed S version. We'll see a different version. But, but it, it will be proposed, and, and it will have both the this version and the S version in front of us for discussion. Okay. Uh, Dr. Selkright. Um, thank you for touching base with those commissions. That was important to me, and I had a chance to talk to um, uh, Ms. Drummond about it. And another point that's been raised to me from uh, people who are watching this and they're concerned uh, is the issue of whether or not there will be a public hearing. At the Planning and Zoning Commission, there's this issue of that you have an opportunity for public hearing. Will these will, – will the procedures be that there will be a public hearing at the UDC level for public – for example, in public facilities or? Yes. Okay. So the public, I just want to make sure. That's in there. It, it's all, uh, there's but it would seem to me, our, is that true? Is that true as it exists now, Mr. Yes. Nelson? The procedures would be the same. It's just transferring from one body. Okay. So all the procedures that are going on, at the, great. Thanks very much. And, and if I might just anticipate, Ms. Drummond and I and the administration said we think you should reopen the public hearing, our public hearing, Thank you. On the 15th as well, because it's, it is different than what we've got. That would so I would make that motion if we postpone, Mr. Chairman, as well. Well, I, I think because we're continuing the public hearing, we haven't had a public hearing on this yet, because it's a 13th. We, we couldn't have amended it if we hadn't had a public we hearing. A public that's what's frustrating. I don't know uh, why it's well, under continued public hearing. It's, it's under the 13s, and that's why I thought it to be a continued public hearing. So, well, we're going to treat it as one that we can re we'll treat as part of the motion, a motion to reopen the public hearing on the 15th. Uh, any opposition to taking this up again on the 15th, and it will appear under the 13th as a continued public hearing. I see no opposition, so that is approved. That and brings us. Chairman, if I might, just for procedural clarity, sure. I would move to reopen the public hearing on July 15th. I would ask for a second and unanimous second. consent. Second. Then we're clear. Regardless of a procedural error, this clearly occurred. Mr. Coffey has moved, Ms. Osiander has seconded. And so, so I, any opposition, I hear and see none, so that is approved. We will reopen the public hearing on July 15. That brings us to item 13B, AO 2008-44, an ordinance amending Anchorage Municipal Code, section 4.05.155, to provide for an annual update on the composition of Title IV boards and commissions by diversity of members. The public hearing on this matter is now open. Anyone wishing to be heard on this, please come forward. Don't be shy. Come on down. I hear and see no one moving. So the public hearing on this matter is now closed. What is the wish Move of the body? Move. Second. It's been moved by Dr. Selcraig, seconded by Mr. Gutierrez. Any discussion? Ms. Os okay, here we got, we got a queue going. Okay. We're rolling through. Ms. Osiander. My understanding is this is already happening. The reports that we get already show this. 
Is that true? Administration. Don't we already have this information? Mr. Abbott. Oh, Mr. Johnson. Hi. Um, uh, through the chair, Ms. Osander, um, you're partially correct. Actually, um, tell us your name just because I uh, apparently I'm, sorry. I'm not uh, asking routinely, and that's my fault. That, that's fine. Uh, for the record, my name is Michael Johnson, and I assist Mayor Begich with board and commission appointments. Um, uh, briefly, um, what we are proposing to amend via this ordinance um, is that we're required to provide the assembly with an annual update of the membership of boards and commissions. Um, that's public information that's already available. It's posted on our website and is available to you anyway. But this ordinance that we're amending requires that we give it to you just prior to the annual expiration date um, for um, board and commission terms. Um, what um, what is new and unique is that we would be um, required to provide to you the uh, breakdown um, as people voluntarily provide it to us of their uh, by gender and by um, ethnic diversity as they uh, as members of boards and commissions give that to us. So is this an additional report or is this coming with a report that we're already getting? We would, uh, as this reads, we would provide it to you as an additional page to the report that we already give you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Starr, Mr. Jones, you might as well stay up front because you may get asked other questions. Go ahead, Mr. Starr. Not really. Just thank you, Michael, for um, trying to organize this ever-moving target of staff and boards and commissions. I know that's the case. I I'm not going to support this for a couple reasons, and I, I don't particularly think um, that it's necessary to illustrate um, what, what the gender, the makeup, the ethnic diversity necessarily is from the qualifications and the contribution of that. And I wouldn't want to actually do anything that, that, that requires um, additional disclosure about personal I items of their, of their past or if they're disabled and it isn't physically obvious. And I know it's not a forced scenario or a viable one, but it's still going to be a question on a form. And I don't want to scare anybody off. And quite frankly, the information to me is, isn't really helpful. Um, I, I encourage uh, people that I interface with to get involved in their situations uh, that are important to them, encourage them to join up with boards and commissions. And to me, that ought to be it. I shouldn't have to encourage them because they're first Alaskans or because they're disabled and may bring more of a contribution. I think that's their personal choice. And so this action, to me, doesn't really um, help me. It doesn't, I don't believe, provide much of a, of a useful nature to, to us. And if anything, I would like to go uh, much more colorblind and, and less aware that uh, that we have, uh, have perhaps issues in, in society that would would slight folks or or be discriminatory, and I think this doesn't go there. It, it doesn't allow me um, to to that. If the question is there, we're also challenged, and it's a little off topic, but the financial disclosure agreements now that extend into people on planning and zoning commission, for example, um, are, are an aspect of information that quite frankly, isn't relative to me. I think I'm, I'm more involved in, in uh, conflicts of interest than I am in, in that, but I'm surely interested in qualifications uh, of that and, and whether they're uh, one ethnic background or another, if they're qualified, I want to see them volunteer. So I won't be supporting it, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's helpful to have people step up. I just wouldn't want to discourage anything. So. Thank you. Mr. Coffey. I, I sort of want to echo what Mr. Starr said. The, it, it, and my question, I guess, to Ms. Selkrig is, what's the point of this? Is it quotas? No, we've already, actually, Mayor, um, we've, already, we've already discussed this. This isn't quotas. What we passed, was, we passed previously was the intention to, to work towards expanding participation on our boards to populations that currently might not be represented there, and it was clearly not quotas. And what this really is, is that in response to that, um, Mr. Johnson suggested, he said, well, you know, that's, that's great, and it would be helpful for me then to have a sense for um, what we look like in terms of boards and commissions. And therefore, you know, he proposed, and I agreed, that we'd bring this forward so that we would have a sense of actually how do we look. Sometimes you think you're inclusive, but when you begin to look at the numbers, you realize you're not. And this will give us the information to kind of know where we're at in these areas. If I may, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. I, actually, did you, did you actually uh, you'll get a chance to respond to it. Mr. Covey is asking questions. Um, thank you. Mr. And Jill. Well, and I, I think we're in deliberations, are we not? We are. Yeah. And 
I, I, so I agree with Mr. Starr that, that we need, first of all, people volunteer for these. They, they submit their application to you. And on the application, I don't remember, and I did it for P and Z, I think was the last time. Is the application ask my ethnicity? Uh, there is a chance to provide that, and it's clearly marked as voluntary. Yeah, voluntary. So there's an other, if you would, right, that, that's not filled out. And, and people like me, I don't, you know, they ask me that, and I don't put it down. Maybe it's because I'm an old white guy, I don't know if, if it matters. But I, I just worry that that the idea that it becomes, you know, one of one of this whatever, one of this religion or ethnic and whatever, and then, and when we have the right numbers, we get the right decisions. And what I would rather look at is, like Mr. Starr said, I'd rather, I don't care. Are they qualified to serve? Will they do the work? Will they give us reasoned judgment? Are they experienced in the, in the field if, if it's a technical border commission? And I don't really care beyond that. That's the only thing that matters to me. So when I see this, the first thing that comes to mind is I think, well, is this designed to make sure that we have one of each kind of us? Because we better expand our boards and commissions, because I think the biggest one is, is nine members at P&Z, and we've probably got 90 of us. In fact, if we use the languages in the school district, I think it's 96 or something. So it's troublesome. And I worry about things like quotas and making choices based on race or ethnic background or other gender when the real test should be qualifications. And I wish somebody could address that for me. If I'm wrong, I'm, I'm happy to hear it. Thank you. Dr. Selkraig, next in the queue. Um, just a little background. We already voted on a resolution to, to expand our efforts to include new communities. The face of Anchorage is changing, and one of the most effective ways to grow new leadership is to invite people to participate on boards and commissions. There's, I believe, six Korean newspapers in town. There's a Hmong community. There's, there's wonderful new communities emerging. And what this was, and actually it was in partnership with discussions with bridge builders who are doing some training with um, different new communities in town to help people get involved and learn board experiences is to figure out a way to make our process um, more available and do some outreach in areas with new communities that we may not be be connected to. And we've had this discussion, but I'll just, I'd just like to add that it came, this decision actually came from a class I teach and from students who um, did a series of writings about democracy and, and, and they, there was a discussion afterwards, and there was this cynical sense about, you know, what can we do? Because actually, if you look at leadership, it's usually white, um, it's usually middle class, and it, you know, and there was kind of a cynicism. And one of the things we talked about is the great opportunity boards and commissions offer to invite people into training. So that's, it, it's not a, it's, it was, it's clearly not intended, and we're not voting tonight about whether or not we're going to do the outreach. We agreed to do the outreach. All that's before us tonight is, do we want to keep track with where we are and get a sense for how successful we are at expanding participation in new groups of people as those groups of people become part of our community? Um, it's not, it's not designed to be a quota. It's not, you know, and I think colorblind a lot of times results in white males. <laughs> you know, when we're, we say, well, we don't want to look and see if we've got anybody extra. A lot of times, um, if you begin to add up um, who's in positions of power, it's the people who've always been there. And we have a new community. We have new people, and it's just a way of thinking about how do we invite them in. And actually, this got separated from the original. This, these things were supposed to come as partners, and somehow this got separated. So we're at we're what? It was March, but I think, I mean, it's way before that. Um, the original, I think it was October. I mean, I don't remember when we started. but so. This, is, this was recommended by the administration, who's already working at this and saw this as a positive tool for them to keep track, as a tool for us to keep track about how we're doing and inviting in new ethnic groups. And interestingly, um, I spoke with some people who have disabilities. And you know, they're always, people with disabilities are often invited to be on transit things. You know, how do you get on and off a bus when really they may have a great deal to offer in terms of planning and zoning and other areas. So, it's a new way of looking at things and just gives us some insight. Um, I don't think it's a big deal or, or dangerous at all. I think that it'll help us um, make our boards and commissions better. Thank you. Mr. Birch. 
I think the important aspect of this is it is it relevant, and the fact is that this is not relevant. Uh, the 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 fact is that the mayor appoints uh, people to boards and commissions. I think I was I think it was the first year I was on the assembly. I asked to see who else applied. You know, like you do in a hiring decision where you have maybe four or five uh, people competing for a board and commission uh, position. And the fact is, that information is not available to the Assembly, uh, uh, or at least it wasn't at the time I asked. Uh, maybe that's changed. But, uh, you know, so the Assembly basically has a, a, a vote up or a vote down. We don't have a, 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 an engagement, <clears throat> if you will, in reviewing the qualifications, capability, or any other aspect of that person. Other, And I think I can count on, you know, maybe one or two people in, in my uh, three-year tenure in the Assembly that, that have been, you know, even quite Question. So the, the appointment responsibility for boards and commissions uh, rests with the mayor. If there's a dissatisfaction with the representation on that uh, on those boards and commission, that dissatisfaction should be directed to the, the person responsible for the appointment. The, uh, the assembly merely ratifies uh, those positions. And unless something's changed, uh, the assembly is typically not provided the the range of uh, respondents and uh, you know I mean I don't know if there's ten people interested in a, a particular position or or just one so I, I I would speak against this just because I I don't think it really it's not relevant certainly not uh, in a context of anything that I do in a, in reviewing a, a board and commission appointment thank you thank you uh, Mr Flynn is next I would encourage everyone to be as brief as possible with your comments on this. I, I'm not sure we're going to convince anyone. I think people know where they stand. Mr. Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a couple of responses to a couple of the comments tonight. Um, first, Mr. Coffey, you're not that old. And uh, <laughs> secondly, Mr. Starr, regarding the disclosure requirements for P&Z uh, appointees, we are planning to address that at the Ethics and Elections Committee level um, as for a broader look at some of our disclosure requirements. So uh, we'll be delighted to have your input. Thank you, Mr. Flynn. Ms. Gray Jacks. I will be brief. I just want to thank Mayor Begich and Dr. Selkrug for bringing this um, ordinance forward. Because, first off, uh, our community is very diverse and getting even more diverse. And we have an administration and a mayor who personally embraces diversity. And it's, um, it's a positive thing to see uh, boards and commissions and even this body to see. Um, it beginning to, to look like what our community looks like. It's a very positive thing. So I really think approving this ordinance is, is simply a no-brainer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I, you know, I, I do believe this is relevant, and and not necessarily to us. Um, and I do honestly believe that that I, always. And, and Mr. Coffey, I share your concern regarding quotas. Quotas aren't good. They, they it just. It's never good. The first consideration should always be, is this person qualified? Will this person do a good job? And I, I have faith that the administration does that. Having uh, been privileged to serve on what was, I think I'm safe in saying, the most racially and ethnically diverse um, commission that this city has, the Equal Rights Commission, uh, I, I know the administration does a good job, first in finding people who are qualified, who will do a, a good job in, in those positions. Where I think it's valuable, where I think it's relevant, is for the general public. People can look at this body, and, and we're very visible. We're on Channel 10, we're on the news. Some of us have very annoying radio jingles. People know our names. Um, you know, <laughs> we're visible. People can look at the assembly and say, either that body looks like me, or looks like my community, or looks like the city, or it doesn't. Boards and commissions, who have a tremendous impact on people's lives, people don't always get to see that. They don't always get to know, you know, who are the members of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Do they look like Anchorage? Do they really represent me? Can they really represent my interests? Uh, people don't always get to see that. So this, as what will be a public document, will give the public, at least in, in some measure, access to that information. Now, it's up to them to choose. You know, we can provide that. It's up to them to choose whether they're interested or not. And by and large, most people aren't. Uh, but there may be some who out there who are. And that's where I think the relevance of this is. And that's why I'll be supporting this. Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for the moment here. And I, for the reason, Mr. Gutierrez, thank you very much for your, your comments, Ms. Jackson. 
Um, and I want to correct something. You, you do, Mr. Birch, have all the right. You, you do, through the planning zoning and the planning board, they're delayed purposely for 10 days for the process of the public to review them as well as you to determine if they are qualified to sit on those boards as regulatory boards. Or the experience I suffered was suffering through when you selected the ACADA board, and uh, you had great review opportunity there. So you do have, it's not just a rubber stamp and move on down the road. It, it is a process that you have confirmation, and then you determine if those people who are selected to serve on those boards are qualified or not. But the idea of this is to put into code uh, a data point that the public, and Mr. Gutierrez, you said it right on target, the public can review um, how the city is doing, and they can judge as they see fit if they think that's good or bad. But right now, the data points really don't exist. It's something we've strived for because it is one of the biggest questions we get nowadays is kind of, it, what are our boards and commissions made up of in the sense of people, qualifications, all kinds of questions. It's not a quota. It's not a, you know, pick this person because there's certain uh, backgrounds and so forth. We look for the highest qualified. But it's also a great uh, uh, test of how we're doing in the sense of our diversity within our boards and commissions of over, I forget, Michael, if we're at 400 of these, you know, individuals we appointed, maybe more because we have task force and so forth. Um, but it, it's a data point for the public to judge us and judge you by future assembly members, future mayors. And so I think it's, it's something that will help our city continue to grow and recognize the importance of diversity and embrace it as a great opportunity for our city. So I would just encourage you that this is a, a simple ordinance. As someone once told me, keep things simple. This is simple. It's nothing complicated about it. It's something we can do. But it shouldn't be based on who's sitting in the mayor's office to keep this data point. It should be something we should be doing as a city on an ongoing basis. So this creates sustainability of this idea into the future. And that's the idea of it. Thank you. Ms. Johnston. I, I don't know how I feel about this, but I do know that it's not as simple as you say because I've worked with a number of children um, with the school district who, when they have you check off the box what ethnic, um, they never quite decided who they are because they're, they're multi-ethnic. And it really, it's, it's become a, an issue in the school district. Um, and, and I know it's become an issue as far as some of our native population and, and how we can account for them. I know that um, I actually have a grandson who is Peruvian, so he can be Hispanic. Um, and, and we have become a very multi-dimensional society, and, and maybe we should look at it in those terms as opposed to looking at it how we account for it. Thank you. Mr. Starr, I'd encourage those that have been in the queue once to make your comments very brief. And I appreciate the advice on that. I'm just trying to engage in thorough debate and new information that generates or comments from the mayor. So I'm trying to be brief, but there's deliberation responsibilities. That, and so I appreciate that, but it seems like you qualify that every time I go into the queue. And I try not to ramble on, but don't, uh, you know, just all, all point of personal reference here. I'd like to He does it to me I, too, Mr. Starr. I, actually, yeah. Mr. Starr, I, when I see somebody coming up the second time, I try to be consistent well, through the and chair, all of to the you. mayor. When, in, in all seriousness, it's a serious topic for me because I want to make sure I do the right thing. So in that regard, we get a report on our desk. For example, this passes, and we get a report on our desk that says so many Hispanics and so many this and that. What, what do we actually do with that? Or how, how do we not, you know, I, I don't want to review whether or not that's, again, your job. And I, I think what I'm trying to say, and maybe Mr. Birch was as well, is I have all confidence in your ability to lead and direct and appoint those, and I want to continue to entrust that leadership role to you to the point where if I get a report on my desk that shows deficiencies in one aspect or another, um, what, what do you expect us to do with that information? And I don't know how to, to, to address it at this forum. It would be an awkward debate, quite frankly. Uh, actually, Mr. Chairman? Uh, very briefly, Mr. Mayor, you've had your turn. See what I told you, Mr. Starr? He does it for me, too. I went to the chair and direct the question to Mr. To Mr. Begich, so... I well, I, I'm going to let Mr. Begich answer, but I'm going to give him no more than a minute. I just want to respond. Um, Mr. Starr, uh, I, I don't consider it awkward. Matter of fact, I've sat on the body in the chair that you occupy, matter of fact, and uh, 
in the, in the sense of the position, and I have questioned past mayors uh, in uh, their board and commission appointments and talked about diversity because I think it's important. And to strive and reach out to communities that may not be as connected to government as they should be in the sense of the, the, the access points are not there. And how, for example, there are some communities that just putting an ad in the paper is not going to draw them to serve on boards and commissions. Uh, you have to do outreach into the communities. And I know in our office we do a lot of outreach. And sometimes it may be in a church hall or a community meeting. Um, but it, it helps you re-examine uh, your outreach efforts so you're not going to the same pool of people over and over again, to be very frank with you. I, I've, had, I, I've sat here and had that discussion with All right, Mr. Mayor, so, let's wind it up. Uh, Hey, we got well, two hours. Let me ask another direct so, question. I, I'm going to control this because you've had a lot of chance to speak, and I want to move this debate Mr. along. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to, every time someone asks a question, I'm happy to respond. I, I'm going to give you the chance to respond, but I'm not going to give you unlimited time to respond. Mr. Starr, quickly. Well, for this, then, do you expect us to reject your appointments if we if we determine that, that you've put too many women on this board of commissions or, or too I, many I white men? What do you expect I, I would us hope, to do? I would, hope that, I would hope that if you believed uh, that we are not, you know, as diverse as maybe you feel we should be or maybe too much, whatever, that that discussion occurs. And that doesn't necessarily mean about an individual, but I think it's a data point that helps us as a community understand our, our local government and who is making decisions. And it may be, you, you ask, for example, I've had it here where I've been told that I don't have enough people from Eagle River. I've had that from individuals here. So what did I do? HLB is a great example. I went out and recruited. I went to Eagle River and recruited people. So I get it from all ends. It's a smart data point. Okay. Thanks. All right. Mr. Ms. Osiander. <laughs> I don't get to remind you because I don't think you've been in the queue on this one already. <laughs> um, excuse me. I have some side conversations here. Um, Mr. In my tenure on this body, we, I have, do not recall us ever turning down anybody that the mayor has presented to us for appointment on boards and commissions. There have been times when I have wanted to question, but I have gone to his office or called his office privately. I have not wanted to embarrass anyone in public by asking questions about them. I applaud outreach. I urge you to do more outreach. I would suggest part I'm refraining from getting into a conversation with Mr. Begich at this point. And I'm going to assist you in that Thank effort. You. Thank you. What I would, would say is it would be extremely appropriate and I would be highly supportive of the mayor to do outreach and advertisement on diversity for boards and commissions. We have a lot of vacancies. We really have to work to fill these. Super, go for it. I, what will happen here is we'll get a report, it'll be on the consent agenda, and it'll just be another piece of paper that doesn't get pulled, I think. If we have a concern about diversity, then we should talk about it, but I don't think a report to us of a function that I view as largely major, mayoral, and, you know, I buttress that. I've supported every single one. Um, I don't need another piece of paper. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, we have three in the queue, Dr. Selkirk. Let's keep it short. Um, I will remind the body again that this is a partner, a partner document, and that the resolution was all about outreach. It was all about ways of reaching new people in the community, and we agreed that that was important. And the administration said, geez, it would be great to know how we're doing as we do that. The other thing I'd like to point out is that we did talk about geographic um, Issues, you know, are we in, are we including everybody from all, you know, throughout the city? We could add geographic to this list because I think we do want that kind of diversity and that kind of spread. I mean, so I'd be okay. Yeah, if you want to amend, it's fine with me to add geographic, and I think it would be interesting information. What this does is it simply gives us a snapshot of how we're doing. The other thing that I, I Malcolm Roberts came several times to speak to this, and we didn't get to it. It's been postponed and postponed and postponed because we've been so busy. And Malcolm Roberts is working with bridge builders, and they welcome the opportunity to work with the assembly to help identify new um, members of this community that would be great uh, nominees for boards and commissions. And 
they, and Mel, um, uh, Mr. Roberts was going to come to speak to the value of this and also to the value of the original resolution. So, All right, thank Mr. You. Gutierrez, thank you, Mr. Dr. Self. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just very quickly would like to uh, address uh, Mr. Starr's question because I think it was an excellent question. This report comes to us. What do we do with it? I don't think this report is for us. I think we do what any individual assembly member might deem in their heart they need to do or if they want to say something about it. But in my opinion, this is more valuable to the public. So this, this report comes forward, it's, it's more valuable for the public. What did they want to do about it? What did they think about it? What would, what would you say? Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. And I will just, as no one else is in the queue, I'll take my last word as chair. I, I will be voting in favor of this, and it's for actually a different reason than anyone else has articulated. I'm trying, I'm concerned about business development in this community. and. And I love to stay at home, but occasionally I have to go to national conventions. And when I go to national conventions and I meet people from businesses that are looking to maybe relocate somewhere else, one of the big questions a lot of growing businesses, especially in the new economy, look to is what kind of diversity do they find in the communities? And I don't think I'm going to look at this report past when I look at it at the assembly meeting, but I think this is the sort of report that businesses that I don't know about may come and look at when they're thinking about coming to this community and I believe it will make a difference. Will it make a big difference? I have no idea, but I'm going to support it, so please vote. Ms. Johnston, Ms. Oskander. Passes seven to four. That brings us to item 13C, AO 2008-54, an ordinance of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly amending Anchorage Municipal Ethics Code section 1.15.035. Additional provisions for elected officials relating to participation by an elected official after disclosure of a private interest. The public hearing on this matter is now open. Anyone wishing to be heard on this matter Come on down. Seeing no one and hearing no one, the public hearing on this is now closed. What is the wish of the body? Been moved by Dr. Selkrig. Is Mr. Gutierrez second? Ms. Osiander. I have some concerns about the impact of this. The way I read the, this um, ordinance, if I disclose that I have a private interest, then I can decide that I'm not going to vote. And I think that's dangerous because there are times when, for maybe political reasons, people don't want to get on the hot seat and they want to get out of a vote, and this gives them a perfect window and opportunity to do it. Um, we worked pretty hard to try to set a fair standard for being excluded from a vote. We've really pushed disclosure, which I think is very important. But this basically, as I read it, gives the individual the right to be excused from participating. And that goes counter to all my experience with public office and government. In fact, in this chair in the past, we've had a call of the house so that assembly members who wanted to avoid a vote and go back there um, have kind of escaped, and the chair has insisted that they come in. Um, I think this is counterproductive, and I'm not going to be supportive. Thank you. Mr. Gutierrez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have a similar concern um, to assembly member Osiander, and, and I saw it happen um, as a citizen. I saw it happen as a staff to this body where a member or members um, on an issue that was very politically sensitive would have loved to have been excused from voting when they really had no real conflict. Um, and I'm not quite sure how to, how to approach this, but and, and as far as, as, as people leaving, when I was staffed to the, to the state legislature, I, I, I mean, we, they put bars over the windows in the restrooms 
in the state capitol because legislators were going out the window and down the fire escape because they didn't want to vote on something. The Senate president one year actually, and I won't say who that president was, actually pulled a fire alarm during a committee meeting to evacuate the building and never came back from, from the fire drill. Uh, so I've seen people many times try to weasel out of what's going to be a very politically difficult or sensitive vote. Um, so, so I am concerned about giving too much uh, leeway to an individual to just say, oop, I don't have to vote on this. Although I am very sensitive to conflicts of interest, and I think we have uh, a great deal of work to do there and making sure that when there is a legitimate conflict, someone is not permitted to vote. Uh, but I, I do have some concerns with giving an individual a little bit too much power to, to duck out the bathroom window, so to speak. Dr. Selkraig. Well, the, the history of this is that um, I've been on this body and um, disclosed a, the fact that my brother had a contract uh, before us, which meant no, no um, financial gain to me in whatsoever, and that I could vote on without a doubt, up or down, um, whether on the merit of a contract. And we have this, this difficulty with our existing code, which is that you can't say, you know, I think it's inappropriate for me to vote because this is my brother's contract. There's no place for me to do that. And it kind of came up when Patrick um, Flynn made the reference about working at the railroad. I can't remember what, I think was it, maybe it was on the port. And there was no conflict, but Patrick raised the issue of whether or not in the public's eye this was a questionable act. And so I, I'm actually, I'm there, I'm open to this discussion today. I'm, it's not like I have a big plan here. I just think we've got a problem because I think, and, and at times people have long-term partnerships with people that have dissolved um, and that there's no longer a financial relationship. But in the public's eye, I think the public would prefer that I not vote on my brother's contracts. And I think they'd also prefer that people who've had lifetime financial relationships but don't haven't had anything to do with somebody for four years not vote. There are times where when the public looks at us, and we know ourselves when the public's looking at us, that they would prefer that we not, we not vote on that. And I think that we get ourselves into the in a pickle um, with the public when we ourselves are in a position of voting on something that that would appear to be questionable in terms of the public trust. And so I am happy, and I spent quite a time a bit of time with Ms. Tucker on this. Um, I'm happy to address this in a wise and um, careful way, with great concern about the issues that Ms. Osiander and Mr. Gutierrez has raised, and I do think, you know, I, but, but the reality is, is that that behavior already goes on. What I've seen is that people just get up and go to the restroom. I mean, that behavior is already occurring um, when people don't want to vote on something in this body. Whether we have this or not, um, it's possible for somebody to get up and leave the room, and that's what's what's going on. And it seems to me that that's a um, that's kind of a weasel out of it. Um, I suppose I could get up and leave the room. But it seems to me that the better way to do this is to figure out as a body, how do we want to deal with these situations where we know that the public, even though there's not a financial relationship, there's a personal relationship, and the public would prefer that we not participate. How do we deal with that? And I'm glad to, I'm glad to rethink this or take the advice of the body, but I think that we have a glitch in our ethics code right now that leaves um, room for improvement in terms of the public trust. Thank you. Mr. Starr. Well, two points. I think the uh, – I won't be supporting the change to the ethics code. I think there's two things it does. To me, it conflicts with the oath of office that I took, and that speaks to several aspects about, you know, doing the best I can personally and, and setting above all other conflicts. And I think the other issue is that I'm real comfortable with this elected body making that men mention. I'm not as comfortable as an individual saying – well, I appreciate what you guys said, but I still say I'm out of here. I, I like the elected officials that surround me, and I, I would want to put all those topics in front of you, whether they're private or financial, and say, what do you guys think? And I'm comfortable with what you guys decide in, in this capacity, and I don't, I don't want to mesh, mesh with that, and I don't want to take the final authority responsibility on myself. 
um, I may think is a conflict, but uh, what's important is how we regulate our body and the way it's written right now is, as an elected body. We do that. We pass it through to the chair and recommendations, and, and, it's, and it's very appropriate. A full-page disclosure on answering the questions, um, if you do it pragmatically and, and correctly, it works, and I, I'm comfortable with it. So I won't be supporting a change. Thank you, Mr. Coffey. Mike, please. Your mic is way far. Mr. Stout spent, uh, when he was on this body, spent a year and a half working on this. And this was a topic which was discussed at the time. And the, and the answer that we came up with is there is no perfect system because of what Ms. Selkraig says. But this body is the determining factor. Unfortunately, I think once in a while a judge sticks her nose into something that she shouldn't be making judgments about, but that's sort of an aside. I like the idea of you vote and you stand up for it. And this idea that the public doesn't think we should vote, well, maybe our duty when they say that to us is to say these are the rules and this is why they're the rules and explain to them because an ignorant statement to the effect that, well, I don't think you ought to vote, you, you, you can never address that. Because if you're allowed to exclude yourself, then the next thing you're going to get from the public is, well, if you didn't have a financial interest and you said you didn't have a, a private interest, you could put the public interest first, why didn't you vote? That's an equally valid question. I like the way it's written, and I think we ought to stick with it. Thank you. All right. Um, Dr. Selkraig, you're next in the queue, but I'm going to actually ask that because this is something you brought before us, I'm going to actually let you go to the end of the queue. I'm going to make my comments, and I'll give you a chance to respond to everyone's comment, and I'll call next on Mr. Gutierrez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, and I realize my second time around I'll be brief. Uh, I, I do also want to, want to acknowledge on the other side, um, this body has dropped the ball many times, too. I've seen this body allow people to vote if they had, you know, if they were going to be on the side that enough assembly members wanted them to vote on, whether they had a conflict or not, they would be allowed to vote. And, and clearly this body has fumbled on many occasions as well. So the system isn't, isn't perfect. But what I will say, uh, and, and what occurred to me in defense of, of this change, is I have a particular conflict that's going to be coming before this body in the not too distant future where the program that I'm coordinator of will be giving some money to the municipality. I don't have a financial interest. I'm giving the city money. Um, so I, I'm not benefiting from this personally, but I have been told from the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C., that I may not participate in the decision-making process on either end, either with my program or with the Assembly. I don't have a financial conflict. I don't have, um, you know, anything that would allow me or, or, or prevent me from, from voting in the public's best interest, but I have been legally prohibited from participating in that event. This would, this would cover me in, in that event. Um, honestly, I'm still kind of up in the air. The, neither system is perfect. The system in place, I think, nor necessarily this proposal. Um, but clearly some work needs to be done. Um, no one else is in the Cuba, Dr. Selkirk, so I'll make my comments that usually come last. Uh, this, is a, this is an interesting topic because it comes up because of Dr. Selkirk's relationship well, because who her brother is, and that occasionally her brother has contracts before us that typically come on the consent agenda that usually are not hotly debated. Usually they get unanimous approval of the body. Uh, I, was, I was particularly interested because of the comment that the public really wants people in that situation not to participate, but it, in the public hearing, there was no one from the public that came to express any opinion about this at all. I've received no emails, no phone calls about this. I do know very recently, and it's before us again tonight, it's going to continue to be before us in July, pump, ta pump station 10, which is something that is in my neighborhood. I can look out the window I know, and I know the affected property. Uh, and I declared a conflict and it was concluded by this body that I should vote. And I did vote. And even though there's a part of me that in the not in my backyard, I really didn't want these improvements to go on because of how it was going to affect the personal neighborhood in my backyard, I voted in favor of it because I felt from a public standpoint I couldn't come up with any reason other than not in my backyard to vote against it. And I'd like to be able to do that, but I, I can't in good conscience do that. And after I had done that, I have had comments from people 
in my community and on my street and across the street and next door who don't want that pump station upgrade and don't want that development. And they all said they appreciated the fact that even though I wasn't comfortable, I went ahead and voted. Uh, and so I can't come up with a rational reason to support this. I, I understand Dr. Selkert's discomfort. I have a brother, I have a sister, and I can understand there may be times in which if they were in front of the assembly for a contract, I wouldn't be crazy about supporting it. But I, I believe I was elected to make tough decisions and stand up for what, I, what I'm voting on. And if somebody has questions, explain those relationships. And so I will not support this. Uh, I think that these are the kinds of things, if, if we don't want to make these decisions, we shouldn't be running for office. Well, actually, I'm pretty proud that I brought this forward. And I'll tell you why. The fact is, is Mr. Coffey, I guess I was a little offended by I shouldn't be running for office. Um, Mr. Coffey, this, this has a criteria. It, it, it's talking about private interest. And it's talking about relationships. And the, the reality that I know to be true is that there is power in private relationships and there's power in, 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 in long-term relationships that have nothing to do with money. And it seems to me that there should be a structure that the public can rely on that if you've had a 30-year um, relationship with somebody sharing an office and they're before us around a critical issue, um, that you might say, you know, I've known this person. Um, I can work and um, discern the best I can. Um, however, there is a private relationship here that could actually challenge um, the the whole body in terms of whether or not, um, how can I find the words? Um, I mean, I'm not worried about voting on my brother's stuff. My, the point is, is that I think the public wants to know that we're, we're clean and separate from private associations when we're making these decisions. And I think that there are times where all of us um, are in situations where you are, you, you, the relationship is not like all other relationships. It's a more intimate and private relationship. And oftentimes those people have benefits in your deliberation because they've known you. And, you know, we can say, well, I, it doesn't matter um, because I can separate that. But in the public's eye, it does matter. And sometimes it really does matter. Sometimes even though you have, don't have a conflict of interest and this body decides you don't have a conflict of interest, your private interest is big enough over a period of time to make you a questionable person in terms of, of the vote. Now, you know, if it, it, and I, I guess I'm not worried about my integrity or my capacity to make decisions, but I do think that there's something here to think about. And if this is not the way, I'm happy to talk about it. But I, it seems to me that private relationships are as powerful as financial relationships in many settings. And, you know, you can answer all those questions and you don't have a financial connection, but you've got a significant, powerful private relationship. And if you know that that's there, you should have the capacity to say, you know, I think I... Uh, the, you know, this is a very close relationship. I, I don't think it's appropriate for me to vote. And you can't do that right now. Th thank you. No, Mr. you can't. Mr. Mr. Coffey, yeah. I, I, had, like I had told Dr. Sucre if she would get the last word. Well, and so no, I, I, wait, you, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. The, I, I was oh, told sorry, that you couldn't you do that. Finished. Ms. Tucker, question for Assembly Council. You'll have to repeat the question because with the all the questions. The question is, is that right now, if I, have no, if I go through and answer the questions um, that we have regarding financial conflict and, you know, ethical conflict in terms of financial issues, um, can, can any assembly person then say, however, I have a private relationship that I think should result in me not participating in this vote? Because when I asked you that before, sitting at this in this body, I was told no. Is that not true, or what? I guess there's a under, misunderstanding. Okay, I, I can I can try and uh, bring some clarity. Thank you. In your particular situation with your brother, 
uh, at the time that he filed, uh, I'll have to back up. Under this code now, the way it is now, if a person is uh, bidding on a contract with the city and his or her sister is on the assembly, there's a whole process that has to be disclosed. And, and, um, uh, and through Bart Malden's office, they figure out what they're going to do about it, including making sure potentially that you don't vote. But when you came into the assembly, the contract was already in process, and so we had a little glitch in there. And so what would happen in that is that you would have to say under this code that, um, that you don't have a financial interest, but you have a private interest that keeps you from uh, potentially exercising the public interest. And an example of that kind of interest w is actually when the attorneys have to conflict out, or as in with Mr. Gutierrez's example, he has a private interest in that he has a job someplace else. And the requirements of that job tell him that he can't vote. And that is a private interest under the definition here. The problem that I understood that you expressed was that you could you, Sheila Selcray, could, and I understand this, absolutely say with conviction that you could exercise the public interest. Right. And so you wanted to have a change here that would say that, that a person in your position, just as you've explained here, would say, I have a private interest, but it doesn't keep me from... Um, exercising the public interest, except that in my perception, the public interest would be for me not to vote, basically. Based on the public trust. Based on, based on public, public trust. And so, and so did, did you want to go forward with the S version that we prepared for this? Do you have it? I do. I, yeah, I think that's I right. I do. Thank you. But the, the, it's been a while. On the, what's on the floor is that is not the S version. We've been debating not the S version. It's a mistake. Yeah. Uh, Mr. I'm Coffey's. Happy, I'm happy to actually withdraw this until I spend more time with Miss. I mean, I, I, I it's, do you want to, do you want to bring the S version forward? Just well, I, you? I think, hold on. If you're going to take, if you're going to withdraw this, there's no point in bringing the S version forward. It's already 930. We have a lot ahead of us. Um, I'm more than happy if you want to bring this bond at a future point, but at this point, if you're, if you're withdrawing it, there's no point in looking at the S version. Right. And, and Mr. Mr. Chairman, the only point I wanted to make is, is people need to read what it says. It. And what it says is this body determines it. So I could say that I have a long-term private relationship, but I can vote the public interest. And people could say to me, no, even though you think you could do it, we're the arbiters. All right. Because your brother, we don't believe you can get beyond that relationship. So there's the protection right. we have. Dr. Selkeg, are you going to withdraw this, or are we going to go forward and vote on this? Vote on this. All right. So is the, does the second, Mr. Gutierrez, do you concur in the withdrawal? I, I would like the CDS version. And, frankly, am uh, willing to consider substituting that. Well, you know, I'm uh, at this point. Well, it, it may it may not be as difficult as you think. Thank you. It's been it's been so long. This has been it's been floating around for a couple months, and sorry right, that this I'd wasn't. Like to, hold on, I want to take about a two minute stand down. I want people to read the S version without anybody talking. And then if somebody's going to move, move to introduce the S version, well, I want Dr. Selgreg to tell us whether she wants to put all this off and move to postpone indefinitely and bring it back at some future point, or whether she wants to proceed either with the non-S version or the S version. Two minutes.
reviewed the S version and and before us. And so, if the if Dr. Sagar wants us to consider this, I'm going to ask that she move to postpone this to a date certain to to take it up again. I think we've debated debated what appears to be not her preferred ordinance for some time tonight. I don't think we need to spend more time on it tonight. And so. Uh, if we're going to take this up, I would ask her to make a motion to take it up at a, a date certain in the future. Um, I move to take this up at what would be a, let me just look at our meetings. Um, how about a July 15th meeting? That's fine. Is there? Mr. Chairman, if, as the second of the original motion, if that requires my concurrence, you have it. That's fine. Then now the question is whether to take up the S version. I take it you're taking. You're taking. You're going to take. You're going to. You're going to take the non-S version completely off the table, and, and we're going to take this up again. Your motion is that we take this up again on the 15th of July. Um, and I would be happy to consult with my fellow members um, regarding their thoughts for prior to returning. Mr. Gutierrez, were you speaking to this or something else? I realize I was in the queue. All right, that's fine, Mr. Coffey. Mr. Chairman, well, if your ruling is that the S version is substantially different, which it was, then this would have to be reintroduced with not just substituted and postponed. If it's not that and all you wish to do is postpone it until then, then that's a different question. Uh, but your ruling was uh, that it's you're right. substantively different, which requires reintroduction. And I think, Mr. Coffey, you are, I think, Mr. Coffey, you are procedurally correct. I have made a finding that this is substantially different and it does need reintroduction. That would mean that it certainly can be introduced in time for our, it can be introduced on the 24th for a public hearing on the 15th. Uh, based on my, based on my finding, the only question now is to 2008-54, which is before us. Um, I, Dr. Sucker, does he wish to postpone this indefinitely? Yes. His, second. That's been moved and seconded. Any opposition to postponing 2008-54 indefinitely? Hearing and seeing none, that is, that is postponed indefinitely. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing this introduced on the 24th. That brings us now to 14A. AO 2008-49, an ordinance of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly to provisionally adopt a new Chapter 21.05, use regulations amending Anchorage Municipal Code Title 21, subject to concurrent final passage and approval of all provisionally adopted chapters of Title 21. The public hearing on this is now open. Anyone wishing to appear about Title 21, Chapter 5? Come on down. No one coming down. Public hearing on this is now closed. Mr. Chair, move to continue the public hearing until um, August 12th. All right. Um, there's been a motion to continue the public hearing on this until August Second. 12th. That's been seconded. If I could speak to that? Please. The committee, the Title 21 committee is getting close to the end on five. We, however, are not going to meet the beginning of July. This will be, we are anticipating, the committee anticipates we'll have our amendments for you by the end of July, but there's no meeting of the assembly then. So the first meeting close to that time period is August 12th. As such, that's why the date. And I request that the public hearing still be open because the public has not yet seen our amendments. Okay. Uh, first person in the queue is Mr. Mayor. Mr. Chairman, we've had some discussions on the whole issue of Title 21. I want to give you a general comment, and then um, I want to make sure I understand the process that we're about to go through. You know, it seems we never get through these uh, chapters, and it seems like we're going to continue to kind of drag through them slowly here. And I guess the comment I'd have is at the next meeting of the committee that all the amendments to the chapter be ready for our staff to review, because honestly, I'm, I'm at a point now where I'm, I think our staff is getting worn out going to every meeting possible. And what I'd rather do is, if the assembly has amendments, come to one of the committee meetings with all the amendments from all the different members and deal with them one time. Because this constant dragging on, I mean, it's killing our staff. and. You know, this is number five. I think we have number six to go, number seven to go. You know, 
the whole assembly is going to change out by the time this gets passed. You know, it will be a decade from now. So I would encourage that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to direct my staff that they will wait until all amendments are ready, prepare them, give them to us, and then we'll have a committee meeting, or you will have a committee meeting, and we will respond to those. Because otherwise, it seems like every meeting, it, it just drags on. And I know the staff is very polite, very courteous. They spend their time. They don't object. But I'm objecting on their behalf. Um, because we spend a lot of money and resources when really just, you know, the, the Title V, I mean, no one came out. They're happy. Five is, you know, I would say it's 90% there. Let's just pass it and worry about the 10% later. But no one's, the public is worn out. We're killing the public through this process. So that's how we're going to deal with it from the administration side. So as the committee gets your act together on this Chapter 5, if there are any other amendments, pile them up for one meeting. That's what we'll come to, and we'll respond. But we are worn out. The public doesn't even come out anymore on these issues that will form the shape of this city for decades to come. They're worn out. I, I see that Mr. Coffey and Ms. Osiander have both put in on the queue. Um, I'm going to exercise my chair's prerogative before they speak and express my, my view on this. I have seen... We do it every week we meet on the consent agenda where if you don't have objections, we don't pull it, and if we have questions, we talk about it. And my, my recommendation to this committee is that on the Tuesday before a Thursday meeting that anyone that has recommended amendments to the proposal before them, that they submit those amendments to the entire committee and to the planning department so that they have something to talk about. And if there's no proposed amendments, it's fine, and if there are amendments, they discuss the proposed amendments, but they don't discuss what is not proposed as an amendment. The process on this, I believe, has been going too slowly, and so I would, I would like to see a process where people can meaningfully put in their proposed changes and have those known ahead of time. They don't have to go line through line through the document every time they meet, and let's get this thing in front of the assembly on a reasonable time schedule. I'm a little bit concerned. I'd appreciate the, the administration's input on whether they believe August is the right time to take up Chapter 5 or whether that should be taken up possibly at the end of July. But, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll let you briefly respond on that. Then it looks like three of the four people on the Title 21 committee are on the queue, so I'll stop talking. Mr. Mayor. The, the only comment I'd make is, yeah, I think August is way too long. Uh, I would, you know, me, I'd do it tonight. but. You know, <laughs> if you could do it by the end of June or first part of July, that's when you should do it. And I, you know, I'll wait till the debate and I'll make a motion to that effect. Okay. Mr. Coffey. One word. Amen to both you and the mayor. Let's get it up. We're going to spend five years fixing things we can't anticipate anyway. Let's get it up here and then remember that we can't make it perfect, but we'll have time to fix it. Thank you. Ms. Osiander. The date was set after a specific question was asked to staff on what date was best. The committee, I believe, I have admit to having been extremely frustrated with the committee process for the last month or two. Part of that is because we don't have enough people that show up at the committee and we tend to spend time reviewing topics that have already been reviewed. But in our defense, I think that the finished amendments that we have prepared for the body have been thorough and good, and the fact that there hasn't been a lot of concern is because the people who have been following the process believe that the amendments were apropos and were an improvement of the document. There are certain things in the drafts that are still very problematic. For instance, in Chapter 5, we discovered um, some serious problems with a section on educational institutions. Staff acknowledged the problem. We've gotten some additional emails just in the last week that were new information about the amount of parking required for high schools, for instance. The draft needs to be examined thoroughly, but I absolutely support and am prepared to have the amendments laid out in advance, if not by word, 
certainly by topic. I think that's appropriate. But I take some exception to what I'm hearing as, as criticism of a process that I think has generally been productive of a good result and has been the result of a lot of hard work and involvement by a lot of people. So, thank you. Um, I see no one else in the, oh, I, we do have people in Mr. Starr. Well, <laughs> it was empty no, for a moment. Thank you for chicken. I, I'm a little flummoxed now as to, as to how the rest of the body is to perform here because, again, what I'm challenged with is, is the opposite, perhaps, with a, a number of, of, of things. One of them is, am I expected to go to all the committee meetings and kind of stay through that debate time frame? And, and that's not, I wasn't asked to be on the committee, and I, I feel like anybody can go, and yeah, I've heard that answer before, but th that's one challenge as to how to stay sort of abreast of the history of the debate. I put a lot of confidence in the, the talents of those on the committee, and I appreciate the committee being expanded to four to help the process expand into all opinions and all markets. That, that was really helpful to have um, the confidence of four people on the committee. The other problem I have is the night of, of approval, for example, we may see new amendments um, that, that show up and require quite a bit of debate. You can't hurry that process. I was on planning and zoning. I know how significant these are, and I also know how developers in past eras would look for loopholes and look for changes and, oh, by the way, kind of this isn't covered. So I, I'm, I'm sure, and I put it out there because I don't quite know how to handle that if we're going to expedite it. What does our debate look like now as the rest of the body once we get a committee recommendation? How do we best handle it? How do we get best prepared? If we're going to put rules of the game in place, then you know, give it to me two weeks out before the amendments, and so I can have a chance to vet them or call staff or whatever. And is that possible or practical? I, I don't know. So I'm looking for guidance as to what, what to be. So the night of or the, the day of or whatever, I can ask the appropriate questions without saying we discussed that at committee. So thank you. Dr. Selkright. Well, I'm, I've been a member of this committee for a year, and I would acknowledge that there's a great deal of work and that the the, the product is a better product because of the detail and the attention certain things get um, that draw that are kind of drawn out by the committee membership. I think the challenge for me um, throughout this process has been the very nature of the committee in that the committee exists and it reviews um, it reviews these chapters before they go to planning and zoning and we also review them after they've gone to planning and zoning. And my sense is that that the right protocol um, would be to have that deliberation after planning and zoning um, in this body because the public's gone through the public process and planning and zoning is making their recommendations and typically things would come to us and then we deliberate. The problem is, of course, is that this is an immensely complex document. So for us to get Chapter 5 and deliberate on it, um, as a body as a whole in terms of what Mr. Starr says I think is very true. It's, it's tough to do. Um, that said, um, I think that there's, there's some dangers in um, the body actually giving up the responsibility to three people or to four people. Um, it's such an important document. Ideally, we would all wrestle with understanding with what is in Chapter 5 and listen to our constituency regarding their concerns. But it would take us a lot of time. I mean, that's what, what this committee has done is it has been an interface that's allowed us to not do this deliberation here. Um, I'm, I, I think it needs to be stated clearly, and I think Mr. Nelson will agree, is that there are big gaps in this code. Um, and what happens in this process is we do a good job catching some of those gaps, and some of those gaps we know are still there. One of them, my concern, is the high-density housing issue that I don't think is adequately addressed. So we're going to be coming back um, to this. Um, I, I am happy to speed this up. Um, I'm happy to change this structure. But that said, I also um, have seen the outcome of further refinement the issue is, is we probably could spend a long time doing this. Um, so those are just some general thoughts and comments. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Chairman, I, the motion that's on the floor is for what date? August 12. Mr. Chairman, I move to substitute the date of July 15th as the date for the public hearing or continued public hearing. On Chapter 5. On Chapter 5. Is there a second for the Mayor's motion? 
Mr. Coffey is seconded. So the motion on the floor is that we'll take up Chapter 5 on July 15. Uh, Ms. Osiander, quickly. Well, this date was chosen by planning staff as a time that they could prepare the amendments. So basically, my understanding, if this is done on July 15th, is there will be no committee amendments prepared by staff with staff response. Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor, if you want to respond. Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll look the staff, but, you know, given the time, I mean, more time is always great, but I'm going to put some pressure on staff to get this done. You know, we, these are amendments that you are requesting and that not some are, well, let me finish, let me finish. That's not true. That are, let me finish. Hold on. Th that Give also time. are some that we have recognized through the process that need to be modified. You know, that's, it's a month time. If it, you know, if we don't get this one done, we got six coming along, we got seven down the pike. It's a constant moving. I'd rather get one off the table. If it means we've got to slow down a little bit on six, I don't care. I want one more off the table because it seems like we, we are going multiple directions. And, you know, my view is we'll push staff. Staff may not, I don't know where Tom went. He, oh, there he is. Um, you know, if you want to respond, Tom, and, you know, I'm speaking because I think the staff has been very polite and courteous in absorbing the pain and suffering of the length of this process. I'm saying, as the mayor of the city and managing the staff, it's time to cut and move. And that means push the staff to get it done and get and, it done. And as a matter of process, what I'm suggesting by my comments is that by next Tuesday, which is two days in advance of the, not two days from now, but seven days of the, of the nine days from now, Title 21, that anyone that has proposed amendments to Chapter 5 submit those throughout the committee and to the planning department, and that gives the planning department two days to review those and provide comment. And then to the extent no one's proposing amendments, then the PNZ version is what's coming in front of this body. And to the extent they're proposed amendments, they can discuss them as a committee and they can make whatever decision they make. And we'll consider that when we meet. Um, Mr. Covey's raising his hand. He wants Just to put a little. Mr. Sure. Chairman, remember, we're working through a public hearing draft right. that stays constant. So we'll have the PNZ amendment separate. That we will not be a PNZ version. It'll be the public hearing draft with suggested amendments by PNZ separate. Just a process, uh, so you're clear. Well, I, all I know is that when we took up the last chapter, the one exception. That okay. was an anomaly. Okay, then we'll, exactly. We will be taking up whatever is the public hearing draft with proposed amendments and from the PNZ and proposed amendments from the committee, and and then we'll be able. That's but that's that's what I'm looking for. Well, that's what I'm suggesting. Uh, let's see. I see next in the queue is Dr. Selkraig. Wait. Oh, wait. Mr. Nelson. Mr. Nelson, go ahead. Yes. One of the reasons why uh, we'd recommended August, the first meeting in August, is that there's a desire on the part of the committee to basically cancel a couple of the meetings in late, the one, the last meeting in June, the first meeting in July. There are other activities going on and judging by the, by the progress that was being made, um, it, it was our estimate that it would probably take uh, through the remaining portion of July to be able to finish up the committee work and be able to put a package together that basically includes the amendments that were uh, proposed by the committee in conjunction with those from the Planning and Zoning Commission to bring to the Assembly. One of our issues is basically trying to put it in as clear a form as possible for this full body to be able to make it easier and more efficient for you to act on. Um, but having said that, if the desire is to uh, basically take action on the 15th, it essentially means that we have to come very quickly to the resolution or at least identification of the remaining issues in that portion of Chapter 5 that hasn't yet been addressed by the subcommittee. But under, under Mr. Clayman's Mr. process, I just want to make sure you heard what he said, Tom, that if amendments are in your hands by Tuesday of next week, next week, right. that isn't going to work. Does July 15th be a reasonable day? No, sir. You know, no, it, to be honest, right? it, we can no. shoot for that, but it depends upon how many amendments we're going to get. Yeah. It really, really depends on how many amendments we get. 
All right. Dr. Selkrig is next in the queue. I'm assuming that Mr. Nelson, you're showing up as Mary Jane Mike, I'd like to, and I'd I'll like, take you out of the queue. Dr. Selkrig. I'd like to let um, Ms. Osiander speak, and then I'd like to follow her if that's possible. I mean, I'd, I'd, like, I'd she's put, been. Yeah, go ahead and put back, put yourself back in the queue, and I'll. Mr. Coffey's next in the queue, so Mr. Coffey I goes have, next, and then Ms. Osiander. I asked. I actually, oh, you're right. Okay. Ms. Osiander, go ahead. That's fine. Ms. Osiander, you're right. It's interesting I apologize. to me that people who have not attended and don't know the process or have, have such firm opinions. Mr. Coffey has not been in committee for almost a month. The committee has amendments by topic. Several of them we have said, this is what we want. The planning staff has so far offered and I thought wanted to draft the language for the amendments. We are over, I'd say we're seven-eighths through Chapter 5. Yeah. We got stymied by two large areas. One, Ms. Selkrig is going to bring her amendments next week on towers. Educational institutions, planning staff has said they wanted to do more research. They brought up an idea and it had challenges. Mr. Uh, Chairman, the topics for the amendments are 80 percent done. The difficulty is writing the amendments. Planning staff has told us that they're trying to do the issue response on Chapter 7 and as such have limited time to put to writing up the amendments for the committee. The topics are there. We've gone through virtually all the PNZ amendments and said these are yes, these are no. Chapter 6 will go much, much quicker because it's straightforward measurements. Chapter 5 is more general and has caused some concern over areas maybe excessive, maybe not. If the decision is that we need those amendments right now, then what's going to happen is we're going to see individual assembly members trying to craft wording which would be, I think, better done by professional planning staff once they're aware of the topics and they concur. Thank you. Dr. Selkred. I would agree that, um, that there's a recommendation on the table that doesn't reflect a kind of real understanding of how the process works. I mean, for us to submit our, our amendments on Tuesday would only create a lot more work for the administration. There's some value, I believe, in making sure that the amendments that we are putting forth, in fact, um, make sense in the administration's eyes and are crafted in a way that work. And so um, I, I just don't, I don't think that's a very helpful or productive, I don't think that'll save time. What'll happen is we'll end up spending more time on those amendments than less. I do think um, that if we wanted to speed this up, um, there's probably a possibility we could do it. But as Ms. Osiander has stated, part of the challenge has been figuring out how to respect staff's time in terms of the work that's already on the table. So um, I, you know, I'm. We could we could we could do this at this body, and it would probably take us a lot of time, and it might take staff more time if we um, brokered it here. So this is a tough one. Right, Mr. Coffey, you've been in the queue. If, um, you. Do you want to yes, comment? briefly? Go ahead. I, I would move to amend the uh, mayor's motion to July 29th, second, which would allow a little more time. I would also, and, and if I could speak to it, I guess I have a second, so I'd like to speak to it. Yes, please speak okay. to it, Ms. Osiander. I, I'm not going to get into it with you, uh, so we'll just forget your comment about that. I took two weeks with my family, and too bad for your committee, which made two pages in one day. So that took two hours. We've been doing this for six years, folks. Six years. Are there improvements? Sure. Have we missed things? We're going to miss things. Ms. Selkrig, I'm sorry. You want to go back and revisit the towers now. We spent years at Planning and Zoning and then this body on towers. I don't want to revisit towers right now. There's no big issue with towers. You're worried, Ms. Osiander, about high schools? We're not building any high schools right now, so a parking issue for high schools shouldn't delay this Title 21. We can deal with it when a high school comes. Folks, I'd like to get this done before my six years is up. I, I ran on Title 21, and there is nothing about it that is so egregious 
that we need to do and follow the method we've been following week after week after tedious week, one page, one line at a time. I'm going to have my amendments in on whatever deadline the chairman suggests. If it's this Tuesday, great. If it's the next Tuesday, equally great. I'll spend my time finishing five and writing them and typing them and submitting them to the committee and staff. That will get them on the table and get them done. And, and I don't know how else we can do it. We, we need, if we don't do something different, we're going to be into 2009 before we're done with this thing, or maybe even 2010. That's, in, that's just too much, for, in my judgment. So I think the 29th will allow a little more time for everybody, but it'll still get it moving a little quicker. Thank you. All right, I see no one else in the queue. I will just add this one, one note, because I heard one comment or maybe more than one about sometimes everyone can't always make the committee meetings. And I think, I think a lot of people on the body would like to see the process move along at a pretty steady pace. If you are on the committee and you know you're not going to be able to attend on a particular day, please call me as chair and I will randomly pick from those of you on the body who have not been coming to Title 21 and ask you to attend that particular meeting and participate. Um, if, if that's a desire. But, but anyway, okay, I'm not hearing the need for that. But I won't do that. Please vote. That's the question now. If you vote yes, it means we're taking up Title 21, Chapter 5 on July 29. I can tell when people don't like an idea I'm throwing out. And I'm happy to withdraw it quickly. So yes means 29th of July. No means August 12. Ms. Osander. That passes 10 to 1. Uh, now I would entertain a motion. This will be taken up on the 10th of, on the 29th of July. I would entertain a motion, uh, Dr. Selkraig, to re take reorder of the day to take up five items ahead of others. Um, I would like to um, take up, I, I move to, to move forward. Change the order of Change the day, order of the day um, to include 14C, 14E, 14L, four, uh, I'm sorry, and 14M and 14O. M is in Matthew. M is in Matthew. I'll do that again. 14C, 14E, 14L, 14M, and 14O. Second. It's moved and seconded. Any opposition to changing the order of the day? Object. Mr. Chairman, let me briefly. Uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Potter has been sitting here patiently for hours, and her item is next on the agenda. I would appreciate the consideration of the body to take up the change of the order day after this subject. Uh, it, it, so you want to take up 14B, which has to do with the liquor store. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to defer the motion to change the order of the day and we'll take it up at 10.30 in light of your request unless anyone has an objection to that. If we have not finished 14B by 10.30, though, we're going we're gonna to delay things. We're going to put it off and go forward. I also know Mr. Flynn had notified me earlier. This is a downtown matter. He has to leave at 10.30. So I'm also uh, giving us a little extra time. So the public hearing on item, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. Go ahead, Mr. Birch. I, that's my if fault. If we're going to do rushing. an interview, maybe we ought to just see who else is in the audience that has issues on the agenda that uh, that we could move up. That's if very that, reasonable. If that's, if that's a priority. Fourteen F. Okay. Anyone else in the audience? We've got fourteen F and G. Okay. Uh, as to fourteen B. AR 2008-108, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly approving an alcoholic Late beverage. reading. This has to do with Grape Expectations, LLC, at 510 West 6th Avenue. The public hearing on this matter is now open. Anyone wishing to be heard on this, please come forward and be heard. Hearing and seeing no one, the public hearing is closed. What is the wish of the body? Move to approve. Been moved by Mr. Flynn and seconded by Mr. Coffey. If Mr. Flynn, if you would please speak to the what's in front of us. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, um, this license, beverage dispensary license, uh, or package store license for downtown Anchorage would have had a much needed 
uh, upscale um, wine store in Sixth Avenue. Um, Mr. Potter is here. Can answer any questions? I would uh, bring to the body's attention. I believe each of you have on the desk in front of you Assembly Resolution 93-123, which lays out the requirements um, that were imposed when Brown Jug opened a store in, not too far away. Um, and I'd ask Ms. Potter to come forward real briefly to affirm that she has reviewed these requirements, and with the exception of those listed uh, on page 2, B1, lines 4 through 8, or sorry, 6 through 8, she is comfortable with abiding by those requirements at her establishment. Hi. Um, my name is Terry Potter, and I'm going to be the proud owner of Grape Expectations. Uh, the only one I had a um, real concern on was uh, the two employee minimum and the security out front. Um, Right now with the construction, we're actually lucky to have any customers, but we're going to ride, at, ride it out. Uh, so we would like to be, um, as owners and responsible owners, that we could have our staffing uh, this time with one, and we will have extra staffing at night. But we're a very boutique um, and a... Um, you'll have to come see. I can't spell it all out. <laughs> Potter, I would add that the Downtown Community Council was supportive of her application. Yeah. Now, I just have a, a question just for clarification. What is in front of us, in addition to the uh, AR 2008-108, there is also AR 293-123, which had to do with the liquor store across from the Captain Cook Hotel that I right. think is called, um, right. I can't remember the name of the store, Wine, Wine Spirit, or Downtown, Downtown Spirits. Spirits. Mm -hmm. And so... As we're currently looking at 108, 2008, 108, these conditions are not included in the proposal in front of us. But is it the, Mr. Flynn, is it your intent to add, move to add these conditions? With the exception of B1. All right. So, so. And, and, and my reason, Mr. And, Chairman, had, and, the, and the owner has no objection to adding right. those conditions. Uh, I'd happily speak to that if anyone has any questions. Yeah, I think Otherwise, in the interest of time, I'll shut up. It's, it's good. Okay. Uh, I see Mr. Starr in the queue. Go ahead, Mr. Starr. Okay. Well, well <clears throat> I appreciate the applicant for, for that. I, I'm concerned about the restrictions suggested, even though the applicant would like to do that. It, it seems an overreach on this body a little bit to, to try to implement that, especially with wording that was dated in 1993, specific, specific to pricing, mm -hmm. the definition of a cheap wine. Um, it, it's, you know, in, in all respect to the body that put it together, it was probably a specific instance requirement, but I'm concerned that we're going to regulate signage in a matter on a use permit that um, would, would prohibit, um, you know, the advertising of price. And you may inadvertently, you know, put your product listing in the window. It may have the prices on there just to show people walking by what you do, and you may be in violation of a use permit. Videotaping your customers um, in, in today's world is a little bit challenging, I think, from who has access to that, now demanded by your community council. I, I, I see just in that review, I think the spirit of the regulations may be appropriate to level the playing field, as my colleague might have said, but I, I, I think that the, that the regulatory environment, um, the playing field's leveled by you and how you conduct your business around simple things, and for us to, to, to clutter it up with the defin definition of a cheap wine, you're restricting yourself to liquor products that, that uh, are quantities 750 milliliters or greater, and you you may inadvertently take a four-pack of, of the small little wine samplers and, and not be able to market them because your conditional use permit says 750 milliliters or greater. Mm -hmm. um, it allows you to, to do that, um, but I'm not sure I'm comfortable with that. It speaks to six packs of beer, and it doesn't sound like your business model is going to go into the beers. Maybe you want to. And I wouldn't want you to have to come back here through this expensive process and, and do a conditional use change. So I, I'm, I'm happy to have it, but I, I don't support the additional amendments. Uh, Mr. Chair? Uh, did you want to respond? Uh, did be happy did to you want to respond, Mr. Starr? Well, it wasn't really a question there. I'm just trying to speak to the deliberation okay. of the That's debate. And, and I, it doesn't matter. Don't, don't, don't respond down, if you don't have Coming down, but I, I don't want to get into the debate with the applicant. I'm just trying to lay it out that I won't be supporting that, that motion to add that. So if that's on the floor, me, that's what I'm debating. Okay. Let me just say as a procedural matter, I think it would be appropriate because it formally hasn't been moved to add these conditions. I think it would be appropriate now to have a motion to add the conditions so it is on the floor. So moved. 
Okay. okay, so it's been moved to add to add to the resolutions. It would essentially become a section should come in, I assume, as a new section four or a new section. Well, we're going to leave it to the legal department to figure out exactly where it would go in. But somewhere in the AO, there would be inserted the language that comes off of AR 93-123 with the except which would be sections one through one and two with the exception of B1 would not be included. So that's the motion to include that made by Mr. Flynn and seconded by Mr. Coffey. Okay. All right. So that's on the floor. Next in the queue is Dr. Selkrig. Um, I, just looking at these, I had some questions. Um, I'm wondering what low price newspaper advertising is. Is that a special kind of newspaper advertising? Uh, I'm, looks like Mr. Coffey is going to answer this for me. Is that, is that a typical? My own, if I can, Mr. Chairman, my only interest here is I was around in 93 when Brown right. Jug did it, and I represented him back then. And so I just thought I'd bring that That's for you. The problem then was a substantial public inebriate issue downtown, and the concern was if the license was moved out of the Captain Cook Hotel across the street, that the public inebriates would use it because there were no liquor stores downtown other than the one inside the hotels. So they put all of these conditions on it, and they are very onerous, and we, I thought in 93 they were foolish. Here's the problem we have today. Should we give these folks no conditions and then leave their competitor downtown with the same level of conditions? My thought is this. Put the same conditions on them and agree to bring them both up in front of us as quickly as we can and eliminate all the goofy things and leave the reasonable things there. But if these people are ready to open, I don't want to delay them while we fix Brown Jug and vice versa. Okay. So that's my solution to the problem. Thank you. All right. Uh, actually, Mr. Coffey and Dr. Selkirk does work. Actually, work. you answered. I had a question to Mr. Coffey. And actually, I'm, I like that idea. Um, I, I'm, I would recommend that we follow up on that. It seems like some of these are valuable and some of Martin and why broker them here tonight. So I'm happy to work on with you on that. Thank you, Mr. Coffey. Did you have anything further other than nope. your? Okay. Next, Mr. Starr. Well, just for clarification, what actually uh, of the 93-123 are we actually amending, uh, I mean, uh, adding? I mean, are we just I'll, taking the conditions from line 29 I'll, on, or are I'll, we doing I'll, the whole thing? I'll clarify it again, because I, while others were talking, I took a look. What, if we look at the one for this business, under Section 3, the conditional use is approved subject to the following conditions. And then in in 2008-108, there are seven conditions and what we would be doing is we would be adding after number seven we would be adding uh, another sec another sec would be paragraph eight restrictions on products sold and then there'd be those four restrictions on products sold and we'd add another what would be number nine staffing required and there would be two things under under what is staffing required because when item one is removed then we'd go to another sec another paragraph number under section three, which would be advertising restrictions, then another paragraph number, community review requirements, and then the last additional paragraph under section three will be hours of operation. Those will all be put in place uh, if we approve this as amended. And then as Mr. Coffey has explained, we would anticipate in the fairly foreseeable future there'll be a collaborative effort on behalf of the Brown Jug store on Fifth Avenue and this store to come up with a revised restrictions that they're both operating on a level playing field, but it, the playing field will look different than this. It'll be AstroTurf. Okay. Mr. Starr, does that answer your questions? Yeah, I mean, it's not as clean. We speak to the TAMS requirement in, in number five of the original, and then we're adding it again in, in, in that. So I, I appreciate the interest in the business to get up and running with certain restrictions. I can acknowledge that tonight. I just... I don't like to put out work that we have to revisit just because we're kind of in a hurry. So I'm good with that approval. Again, the whereas statements, all that would be stricken because none of that actually occurred. Right. That's right. And so, you know, I'm just, just uh, trying to keep up. So I'm okay with that. All right. No one else is in the queue. So I will ask if there is any opposition to approval of 2008-108 as amended. Hearing and seeing no objection, that is approved. Good luck. Go forth. Okay, what's next? Sell good wine. So we were going to take these. Now we're going to. Oh. 
asking you? Uh, now, well, actually, we will. We actually, the next item is item C, which is part of the reordered, so we don't need to go to the reorder yet. Uh, item number 2008-66, an ordinance authorizing the sale of properties foreclosed by the municipality for delinquent taxes and or special assessments. The public hearing on this matter is now open. Anyone wishing to be heard, please come forward. Seeing no one, the public hearing is now closed. What is the wish of the body? Ms. Uh, Ms. Drummond moved. Is there a okay. second? Second. Dr. Selkraig is seconded. Any discussion as to 2008-66? Mr. Starr. A question for um, HLB, I guess, or just the uh, legal. What we do with this property is we sell it, we pay the tax obligation, and then we have to offer up the remaining balance to the original owner. Is that correct? Uh, the chair through, or Mr. Starr through the chair, th yes, that is correct. If uh, at auction these properties still remain on the list, they will be sold and the excess proceeds over our taxes and administrative cost will be returned to the prior owner and if, if they are claimed. And if they're not claimed, then the money goes to the state, correct? That, that is correct. Is that the right thing to do? I've seen this happen a couple times. To send it now. to the state? Well, or just you, know, you collect a few reasonable fees, but you know I bring this up to the body because we're we're basically acting as a real estate broker and we're not getting a city benefit. Correct? We're getting we, taxes paid. We do have uh, penalties and administrative costs added to the tax base. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gutierrez. Just a quick question. It says the minimum bid for these properties shall be the sum of amount of unpaid taxes. What happens if you don't get a minimum bid, or, or has that ever happened? If there is no bid or a qualifying bid at minimum value, um, then that remains in our inventory and is put on schedule for the next auction. Okay. There's no administrative action that's required at that point. We just would hold that property and real estate services, not HLB, but in real estate services uh, until the next auction has occurred. Thank you. Thank you. No one else is in the queue. I will ask if there's any opposition to the passage of 14C. I hear and see no opposition. 14C is approved unanimously. Now we'll take up a motion to reorder, to reorder the business of the day, starting with 14E. Dr. Selkraig. You want to reorder the business oh, I'm of the day, sorry. I, uh, starting with 14. Um, uh, I move to reorder the business of the day and we to 14E, and then is this 14F and G? 14F, that's 14 right. 14F and 14G, uh, 14L, 14M, and 14O. Okay. Any, there, it's been moved and seconded. Any opposition? Hearing and seeing none, that too is approved. Now it takes us to 14E, item 2008-72AO. An ordinance authorizing acquisition of government lot 12, section 33, township 13. Uh, way range, reading. Range, okay. Uh, the public actually, because I will quickly declare that my firm represents the seller of this property. So I believe under both the legal rules of conflicts of interest and this assembly rules, I have a a personal and financial interest that precludes me from participating. So I'm going to hand over the chair to Dr. Selkraig for, for, for purposes of this item. A, a point of order, Mr. Chairman. You, you, uh, remember, the rule says the body decides. You That's don't true. decide. All right. I would move to, that the chairman has a private conflict of interest as well as a financial conflict of interest, the private conflict of interest being his bar rules, which he doesn't want to get himself disbarred from violating those rules. Second. Um, as, the, as the chair, I rule that he has a conflict of interest. There's, are there any objections? Okay, thank you. What? Use the gas? You don't need the gas. <laughs> uh, no, you got to do it. You got to um, uh, uh, the, chair, uh, the chair will entertain a motion. I believe he's already read this. Open the public. public hearing. I'm sorry. Um, uh, I'd like to open the public hearing on ordinance, uh, an ordinance authorizing the acquisition of a government lot 12, section 33. Thank you. 
Are there any public comments? I see and hear none. I will close the public hearing. Uh, the, it, can, what's the will of the body? Is there a second? Any discourse? It's been moved in a, and, and seconded uh, that we approve this. That was, who was who were the two people? Look at your screen. For it's Miss Johnson. I don't have it. A coffee and Johnson. Coffee Thank and you. Johnson. I'm sorry. Thank you. Um, and is there any discussion? Yes. I, Mr. Coffee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Th this we had the work session on this, and we under I think I came to clearly understand why we're perhaps acquiring larger than we might otherwise do. We could take a partial taking for the road alone, but if we take a partial taking, we leave the other parcels in a in a much less usable position. And I received assurances on at the work session that the intent is to offer this property to the public for development and use uh, after the replatting is done because and the road is built. So that's an acceptable solution to me, rather than leaving, for example, the motel on the east side of, of Lake Otis with no access and the problems attendant on that. So I support this acquisition. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. I might note it's in my district. Mr. Starr? I just have the question about the use of the funds now. With it being a state project, uh, we might have answered the question at the work session, but the state money allocation, can, can somebody answer me as to how do we, are we just using state money for a minute here and paying it back with ARTSA or what, give me the breakdown here on how we're allocating the funds. Madam Chair, that was discussed and I'd be happy to tell Mr. Starr. It would be great. Is that okay, Madam Chair? Yes, please do. Uh, there's, it's a state road at Tudor. It's a city road on Lake Otis. We were advised at the work session that since the money is fungible, we're paying for certain things in total that might be, for example, some of the taking, we're paying for all of it, but they're also paying for things that would be on our obligation on, on uh, Lake Otis Road that we're paying for the, some of their stuff on Tudor Road. But the proportion... I'm advised that the amount being spent proportionally between state and, fed and local is the same as if each were paying for its own. So if you follow me, so in other words, we're not paying for some of the taking on Lake Otis and they pay for some of the taking on Tudor. We're paying for all of the taking, but they're paying for all of this construction. And so it's balanced. That's what we were told on. Okay. Friday. And the concern here through the administration, perhaps, Madam Chair, is, is, you know, three years from now we sell the remaining portion. Is somebody at the administration then going to remember that Oh, those proceeds from that sale go back to the city because they were our investment dollars to begin with? Yes. Or how do you do that? The, yeah. the city is entitled to the property when we take it, so yeah. Correct. And there aren't any state funds associated with this project? Okay. There's, there's federal funds. I get it. Federal highway dollars. And the federal highway program is aware of the, um, the land acquisition program associated with it. The project is reimbursing the city for the portion of the lands that are being used for the project itself. Sure. The remaining lands are owned by the city, paid for with city dollars, uh, and would any uh, change in value of that would accrue to the city. I, I get it. I thought it was a capital grant from the state. I, I'm sorry. Thank you. Mr. Coffey, do you have any other comments? You're in, uh, um, Ms. Gray Jackson. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to say I am really happy to see this because this project is also in my district and um, I'm happy to see any acquisition that's going to move this project along. It's been a long time coming and thank you. Are there any more comments? Are there any objections to the approval of AO 2008-7002? Um, okay. Then it is approved as is before us. I think we can tell Mr. Ms. Our Just move okay. on. I'd like to note for the a record that Mr. Flynn is not in the room, and we're looking forward to our chairman returning. Okay. All right. Um, before us, we have. We are doing number E F. This, just, Madam Chair, yes. just for the record, too. Somehow, you voted and Matt voted on that board. So we noted that they weren't in the room, but we didn't. We didn't actually take a vote. It was. It was. We actually. Oh, that was. Oh, okay. Okay. We <laughs> saw, okay. I'll 
all done? Yeah. Having a bad night. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. That brings us now to item 14F, item 2008-68, an ordinance authorizing a lease for the use and maintenance of advanced wireless network communication facilities on a portion of Section 7, T13N. Thank you. This is about a, uh, this is Anchorage Water and Wastewater. Public hearing on 2008-68 is now open. Anyone wishing to be heard, please come down. Hearing and seeing no one, the public in hearing, hearing is now closed. What is the wish of the body? Moved by Mr. Coffey, seconded by Ms. Johnston. Any discussion? No one is in the queue. I'll, in, I'll ask if there's any opposition to 2008-68, number 14F. Hearing and seeing no opposition, that matter is approved unanimously. That brings us to 14G, number 2008-69, an ordinance authorized Ordinance authorizing a lease for the use and maintenance of advanced wireless network communication. Wave reading. Thank you. Uh, the public hearing in this matter is now open. Anyone wishing to be heard, please come down. Seeing no one, the public hearing is now closed. What is the wish of the body? Move to approve. Moved by Mr. Coffey, seconded by Ms. Johnston. I see no one in the queue. Any discussion? Hearing and seeing none. Uh, is there any opposition to the approval of 2008-69? Hearing and seeing no opposition, that is approved unanimously. That brings us next to item 14L, as in Lama. Uh, number 2008-107, a resolution of the Municipality of Anchorage, Alaska, accepting and appropriating two State of Alaska Clean Water Fund loan offers in the aggregate amount of $433,000. Thank you. The public hearing on this matter is now open. Anyone wishing to be heard? Please come down. Hearing and seeing no one, the public hearing is now closed. What's the wish of the body? Move approved. Move, moved by Ms. Osiander, seconded by Ms. Johnston. I see no one in the queue. Uh, any opposition to 2008-107? Hearing and seeing none, that is approved unanimously. That brings us to number 14M, number 2008-89, a resolution of the municipality of Anchorage appropriating when tendered. $3,325,000 from the Federal Aviation Administration Airport Improvement Program Grant. Wave reading. Yeah, let me get the, yep. there's going to get the rest of the fund. 87500 from State of Alaska Department of Transportation and 87500 from Airport Unrestricted Net Assets for Merrill Field Improvement. The public hearing on this is now open. Anyone wishing to be heard, come on down. Hearing and seeing no one, the public hearing is now closed. What is the wish of the body? Move to approve. Second. Seconded by Dr. Shel Selkraig, moved by Mr. Coffey. Any opposition to approval of 14M? Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Mr. Starr, you're in the queue. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question for finance. I guess Sharon, uh, through the chair. We're talking about an MOA match of 87.5. The fund origin is, uh, is a designated state grant. So wh what... Uh, what are we actually doing there? Can you explain to me where the 87.5 is sitting right now? Through the chair, I, I don't know. I could get back to you later. Well, it's only, I just don't know. I mean, we're doing it in, I'd like to know where the 87.5 is coming to match. Um, through Here. the chair, uh, it, it appears to be that um, it is sitting in basically what I would call net assets, but what a typical person would call fund balance or retained earnings. So in other words, um, accumulated net income from prior years that has grown over time. Well, if that's the case, then I'd, I'd rather have sort of the airport commission weigh uh, in on it. And we've actually, got actually, it looks like the man from the airport can answer that question. So we'll yeah. go ahead, shorten the discussion. If you could come forward, please. Tell us who you are. Uh, Dave Lundeby, Airport Manager at Millfield. And through the chair, Mr. Starr, was the question on the state grant? No, there's two, there's uh, three fund sources that are listed. Um, the uh, statement on I'm referring to talks about a matching fund of, of 87.5, a matching funds from uh, the MOA. Correct. Right. Airport unrestricted net assets. Correct, which is, which, which is our fund. Your fund, as in from user fees put into a checking account, and you can write a check out for that. 
um, basically correct. I mean, that's that's what it is. Through, through the chair, it, it's it, it's effectively just retained earnings that have grown over time because the airport has spent less than it has collected in revenues. Mm -hmm. Well, and it isn't a debate on where where the money's decided, but who's deciding? Just us tonight that says we want to take 87.5 out of his checking account and spend it on this project. That's what we're doing. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes. Dave, go ahead. Uh, typ typically, the way these funds are, are looked at is we do go through our capital budget. This cap, this, these projects have already been addressed in our capital budget in 2008. The uh, Airport Commission does review our budget and recommends approval to the Assembly. So this, this project here was, was included in our capital budget from the well, last false approval. Okay. And I, I'm just looking at the expense of funds through a project upgrade that we would perhaps want at another municipal airport. So are you doing this through the airport commission is also weighing in on this, or where's the approval from, from the body that regulates the airport coming from? Uh, through the we're chair, not it right now. Tonight, through the chair, we? Mr. Starr, that's what I explained. The uh, budget process was went through last fall. The airport commission weighed in on our capital budget, which this project was one of them. And they sent a resolution along with our budget approvals to the assembly, approving that budget. Okay, thanks. I see no one else in the queue. I'll ask if there's any opposition to item 14M. I hear and see none, so that matter is approved unanimously. The next item on the agenda is number 14O. Item 2008-106 AR, a resolution of the Anchorage Municipal Assembly appropriating $1,639,870 contribution approved in the 2008 general operating budget. Thank you. The public hearing on this matter is now open. Anyone wishing to be heard, please come down. Hearing and seeing no one, the public hearing is now closed. What is the wish of the body? Am I supposed to say it? Or uh, Mr. Starr has moved. Is moved and seconded by Ms. Osiander. Any discussion as to 2008-106, item 14-0? No one's in the queue. Is there any opposition to 14-0? No, I urge approval. Hearing and seeing none, that matter is approved unanimously. Now that goes, brings us back to the items in 14 that we have not gotten to yet, which is 14-D Delta. Number 2008-65, an ordinance authorizing a non-exclusive relocatable trail easement to the U.S. Forest Service across Heritage Land Bank parcels. This is Girdwood Land. Thank you for the waiver. Anyone wishing to be heard on this, please come forward. Hearing and seeing no one, the public hearing is closed. What is the wish of the body? Moved by Ms. Johnston, seconded by Mr. Coffey. Any discussion? Mr. Starr. Trying to hurry. I appreciate the uh, the project scope, and I don't know if a lot of us actually do. Is Jamie Schmidt here? I don't believe she is. But uh, Mary Jane, yep. um, you, your office had something to do with this, I think, and I appreciate the effort. Um, this is a tremendous asset for the Girdwood area, if they don't know it. This, uh, this right to use this land to access others is tremendous, and it allows a good link between municipal land uh, rights and the rest of usable lands uh, that exist, whether they be state or even some private in-holdings. And uh, this is a, a good thing to do, and we need to do it more in the municipality with less reservations about accessing state lands and Chugiak State Park issues and just take some leadership in our own resource development. So I didn't want to let this one pass. I don't want to compare it to the project I'm working on in Chugiak Eagle River, but this illustrates good leadership from, from Mary Jane, your department in particular, and the ability to put this together. If you looked at the working map, there's GPS coordinates, there's interface and agreements with the, with the municipality as well as the community out there. And this is no small approval. This is pretty significant in that usable area out there. And it's beautiful territory access. So uh, way to go. Thank you. Thank you. No one else is in the queue. I'll ask if there's any opposition to 14D. Hearing and seeing none, that matter is approved unanimously. Next is 14H, number 2008-70, an ordinance authorizing a lease for the continued use and maintenance of network communications facility. Thank you very much. The public hearing on 14H is now open. Anyone wishing to be heard, please come down. Hearing and seeing no one, the public hearing is now closed. What is the wish of the body? 
Moved by Ms. Johnston, seconded by Mr. Coffey. No one is in the queue. Any opposition to 14H? Hearing and seeing none, that matter is approved unanimously. Brings us to 14I. Number 2008-71, an ordinance authorizing a lease for the continued parking, maintenance, and operations on a portion of Lot 1A. Thank you very much. This is Cruz Industrial, Plat 99-6. The public hearing on this is open. Anyone wishing to be heard, please come down. Hearing and seeing no one, the public hearing is now closed. What is the wish of the body? Move to approve. Moved by Dr. Selkrake, seconded by Ms. Drummond. No one is in the queue. Any opposition to item 14I? Hearing and seeing no opposition, that matter is approved unanimously. Brings us to 14J, number 2008-98, um, a resolution of the municipality of Anchorage confirming and levying assessments for the water special improvements within levy. Way reading. Thank you very much. Uh, the public hearing on this is now open. Anyone wishing to be heard, please come down. Hearing and seeing no one, the public hearing is closed. What is the wish of the body? Move to approve. Moved by Dr. Selkraig, seconded by Ms. Johnston. And see, oh, Mr. Starr. Yeah, I'm sorry to be so pontificating tonight, but I want to Happy illustrate day. several aspects of this type of thing in comparison to what my community sees out in Chugiak Eagle River. In some of these, if you look at the assessment total principle to hook up to these sort of utilities, the numbers are reasonably affordable. They're single family dwellings in a lot of cases, they're smaller lot hookups. The same issue is going to apply to a five-acre lot for a single-family dwelling out there. I had to justify approved hookup fees somewhere in the 70s and 80s and the hundred thousands of dollars for large lots in the Chugiak River area, which will ultimately have the same use uh, on, the, on the lands, if you will, with a single one-inch one copper water line. This is where we're trying to go with the equitability of the user hookup fees. There isn't a drastic amount of money increase difference. In fact, there probably is more interruption. You've got traffic control issues. You've got uh, heavy infrastructure. There's already cables underground. These projects cost more than some of the stuff out in our area with larger lot development. So we do need to work on this. This is affordable hookups. These people can afford this over time. I had to justify communities. Um, we had one that, that cost over $100,000 to hook up a single family dwelling with a one inch copper line. Um, you know, just to illustrate it, there's inequities here, folks, and, and I, I look to you guys to help. I approve this one. This works for me, but the, uh, the luck uh, program doesn't work in all cases of development. So I, I urge you to, to help us along with the rest of the topics to try to equalize that as our infrastructures in our fringe areas develop because we're facing them out in our area. So thank you very much. Urge approval. Thank you, Dr. Selkraig. Um, there's large lots not only in Eagle River but all over the bowl. And many of those large lots are sitting on wells and with septics right next to available um, sewer and water because of the same issue. So it's not just an issue in Eagle River. You're at the front end of it um, in terms of your new area developing. But there's areas in Sound Lake. There's areas in East Anchorage that, are, you know, that I, can, I can take you to. So the, I mean, coming up with a solution, I think we need to not just think of Eagle River. We need to recognize that these issues exist everywhere. And the challenge for this is, is by distributing by distributing the cost to multiple users and reducing the cost, in other words, coming up with an average, when that, that property is um, subdivided, there's no, there's no way for those smaller properties to recoup the costs as, the, as those other areas come in. So I don't think we've got it figured out yet, but it's, it's not just isolated in Eagle River, and I think the issue of equity is pretty important. Thank you. I see no one else in the queue. I ask if there's any opposition to 14J. Hearing and seeing none, that matter is approved unanimously. Uh, the next item I would note, uh, well, I'll announce it, is 2008-99, a resolution of the municipality of Anchorage confirming and levying assessments for the special. Wait, reading. Thank you very much. Move um, to approve. Oh, I'm sorry. The public, actually, actually, before we open the public hearing, uh, there is a, uh, Mr. Richard Block, contacted me and also contacted, I believe, Ms. Johnston with questions about this. And he he asked if we, because he only received notice of this two or three days ago, he asked that we postpone the public hearing for a, at least two meetings so that he has an opportunity to research and talk with the municipality about this. And my question for the administration uh, is whether that creates a problem to, to put this off for two meetings. No, that's fine. OK. Uh, so what I would ask is a motion to, to continue the public hearing until July 15th. So moved. Second. 
Moved by Mr. Covey, seconded by Dr. Selkraig. Any opposition to continuing the public hearing on 14K until July 15? Hearing and seeing none, that is approved. Last item on the agenda, number 14N. AR 2008-103, a resolution of the Municipality of Anchorage appropriating $150,000 from the court. Thank you very much. Uh, the public hearing on this matter is now open. Anyone wishing to be heard on 14N, please come forward. Seeing no movement, the public hearing is closed. What is the wish of the body? Moved by Ms. Johnston. I need a second. Mr. Gutierrez. Uh, I see no one in the queue. Any opposition to 14N? Hearing and seeing none, that matter is approved unanimously. That brings us to the end of the public hearing matters. Um, no special orders. We have no unfinished agenda. This is a time for audience participation. You've been waiting all night for this opportunity. Welcome and please come down. Please let us know who you are. My name is Jed Whitaker, and I'm wondering why anybody in Anchorage would vote for Mayor Mark Baggage for the United States Senate because Mayor Baggage is doing a wonderful job as mayor. Mayor Baggage excels in the art of the deal, and his vision of the future of Anchorage is a reflection of that. Deal number one, the parking garage. Gas is now over $4 a gallon. Peak oil was predicted in the 1970s. Even the National Geographic in this issue published in June 2004 had the headline, The End of Cheap Oil. So what did Mayor Baggage do? He pushed to build a parking garage instead of increasing mass transit. Deal making in action. Deal number two, <coughs> Mayor Baggage made a priority of a new convention center, conveniently ignoring the fact that convention centers nationwide lose money. Mayor Baggage chose to build it on expensive real estate instead of building it on cheaper real estate, like for instance in Mountain View. To sell the convention center, Mayor Baggage deployed former business partners of Senator Ted Stevens, Mr. Rubini and Mr. Hyde, to guarantee that they would pay any cost overruns up to a million dollars apiece. Having accomplished this, Mayor Baggage then went into business with Mr. Rupini. Instead of in, uh, joining the chorus nationwide against the pork of a bridge to nowhere, Mayor Baggage saw the wisdom of building a bridge across geolo geologically unstable blue clay and in his inimical style, did not seek to stop the bridge, but rather to cut a deal with Kabata. Sadly, he was out dealt by a future potential mayor, and now the bridge to nowhere is part of the long-term transportation plan of Anchorage. Two bad belugas don't deal. In closing, Mayor Baggage deserves credit for many, many things, among them a recycling program, which only took five years to come into existence. He's doing a great job for Anchorage. Let's keep him here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Whitaker. I see no one with questions. Uh, this also leaves it for a few minutes for member comments, if anyone in the body wishes to make any. No one is in the queue, and that brings us to adjournment. Thank you very much. Moved and seconded. I